2024 and the European Le Mans series season begins with the four hours of Barcelona here in the small corner of Spain or Catalan if you prefer and uh, this will actually be the fifth time that the European Le Mans series has visited the circuit de Barcelona Catalunya. It's fair to say conditions could not be more perfect. We've not had a cloud in the sky really for the last couple of days. Qualifying taking place yesterday and uh, four doses of it for our four different classes. But it has to be said, if you've never experienced the European Le Mans series before, or maybe you did witness a lot of races last year, then the grid is, well, I was about to say just as good. It's actually far better than last year because we have an absolutely bolstered, bolstering uh, LMP2 field, which we will deal with in a moment. So this is the first round. We then head to France, to the south of France, and Paul Ricard for the second round. Two visits to Imola begin, uh, two visits to Italy, rather, begin with Imola on the 7th of July, and then sandwiched between those two trips to the uh, country of the boot. We head to Spa-Francorchamps with its new August date, but again, ending the season at the Algarve International Circuit on the south coast of Portugal. So, there are a total of 11 LMGT3 cars, and these are brand new machines for this particular championship. 10 LMP3s and uh, the massive LMP2 field as well. But the paddock is in sombre mood this weekend because of the terrible news we heard on Tuesday of the death of Gerhard Freundorfer of Uber Racing. And we must remember Gerhard before we start racing.
a moment of reflection and perhaps some perspective as well after the dreadful news that we all heard here in the European Le Mans series and Michelin Le Mans Cup paddock of the death of Gerhard Freundorfer on Tuesday, the team manager of Uber Motorsport in a horrible incident in the paddock during setup day. So a pause for thought and obviously to think about Gerhard's family. And then the real stirring two national anthems for Spain and for Catalonia ahead of yet another four hours of Barcelona. As I say, the fifth time that's happened in the European Le Mans series era, we did actually have two Le Mans series races here as well when LMP1s were part of the grid. So it's become almost a second home, if you like, and a great place to kick off a brand new season, Graham Goodwin. It has indeed. Good morning, everybody uh, in Europe. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I know there's lots of you watching in. Fantastic crowd here as well, Johnny Palmer, in bright sunshine. And uh, as we were coming across the commentary booth, still a queue of cars arriving at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalunya. But we're ready to go racing. And we're ready to go racing with a brand new era in GT racing for the European Le Mans series. And that's because LMGT3 kicks off here, as it did in Qatar for the FI World Endurance Championship. And it will be the Iron Dames Porsche that starts. Uh, from pole position, packed grid, pretty well packed stands as well. And it was great to hear uh, the reaction from the crowd to the podium in the, the uh, Michelin Mon Cup yesterday. Yes, and there'll be plenty more of that today, I'm sure. Uh, they will be engrossed for almost all of the four hours, I would suggest. They, these longer races naturally have their peaks and troughs, but they have a natural way of crescendoing their way into the final stint, really, for the LMP2s, which will be about 40, 45 minutes. LMP3s can do more like an hour. And LMGT3s, well, it's a brand new category, so they're setting new records from this race onwards. But uh, again, sort of, well, loosely based on a GT3 car. They are not GT3 cars, they are LMGT3 machines with the torque sensors, with the extra bit of body kit as well, and therefore might be able to produce slightly quicker lap times than your more traditional GT3 races around here. But more particularly a different way of measuring and monitoring performance. It's a, it is a new era for GT3 spec machinery, if you like, and it's an experiment that uh, is rolled out now with ACO Rules Racing. I think we're going to see it elsewhere too. We're moving up though, Johnny, into the LMP3 grid. We should, by the way, point out the fact that uh, Sarah Bovey's done it again in her final ELMS race in 2022. It, it was a pole position uh, and then on to a win at Portimao. Uh, and uh, this time they've started the season with a pole. Michelle Gatting, her teammate, not counting any chickens though yet. It's just job one of a long list to do. Team Virage looking to see whether or not they can make it three steps on the ladder in three consecutive seasons. The Ligier European Series win two years ago and indeed last year, the Michelin Le Mans Cup win in 2023. That, that was going. Pedro de la Rosa, by the way, down on the grid. I wondered who was getting all the photographs. I go. thought you were going to mention him and uh, then you didn't. I didn't. I needed, to, I needed to make sure for sure it is, but it's Pedro here to experience uh, probably not his first ACO rules race from a, a great vantage point. Nielsen Racing, John Faub is back in the ELMS paddock, having spent uh, much of 2023 stateside from Dallas, Texas. So getting closer to home last year, but uh, he knows Europe so, so well too. And Las John Vegas. Faub climbing on board. He's Las Vegas. I think John lives in Las Vegas. He might live in Las Vegas. I think he's pretty, I'm pretty sure he's from Dallas. Yeah. But yes, you're right. He does live uh, in a different state these days. But 22. LMP2 cars across LMP2 and LMP2 Pro-Am, that's astonishing. That'll be quite a good grid just by themselves, alone with the other two classes, LMP3. Three-minute board up now, 10 of those cars, and 11 LMGT3s complete a 43-car field. Second in LMP2 Pro-Am, great results uh, for him. First full season in LMP2 for Tony Wells, and he got stuck into it yesterday. Doors open on the left-hand side, being the driver's side of LMP3. I'd forgotten so many, if all, of the LMP3s are actually right hookers uh, in it's, this championship. It's, it's Ligier that tend to be the right-hand right. drive cars. And so the Duquesnes are left. Left-hand drive And how many Duquesnes have we got this year? Two. Which is about the same as we had in the LMS I last year, so. I think. There's been a slight drop-off in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, as far as the Duquesnes are concerned. Fifth overall for Cool Racing. 
Nilsen Jakobsen we're talking about Miata and the Fluxa in this car That's, uh, this is going to be one to conjure with isn't it 37 car it will be Lorenzo Fluxa that starts and it is two cool racing cars alongside each other for the start of this race here is the 47 Alejandro Garcia will start this car shares it with Paul Lipschatan Ste uh, he steps in for the currently injured Ferdi Habsburg, hope you're watching, Ferdi, and I hope you're obeying every single instruction from your doctors after a nasty shunt in testing for Alpine. So Alejandro Garcia to start that, the Mexican driver. Third position on the grid, Matthias Kaiser is the silver within this. Remember the darker blue number panels uh, for the race numbers indicate that the car is in LMP2, the lighter sky blue LMP2 Pro-Am where your driver combination must include a bronze. The silver in number 28 is Paul Lafargue to start the Edex Sport number 28 car and tell us about this new livery for 2024. Well, it's, it's based on the Matra, the, uh, the well, multiple Le Mans winning Matra livery and it looks stunning. More familiar livery perhaps for pole position setters it's United Autosports back where they will say they belong in front of this grid Philippe Ulgran will take the start Marina Sato uh, to climb aboard uh, later in the race but it was Ben Hanley that put in a stellar performance to grab pole position and she's fired up we're about to get underway we had to get off air very quickly yesterday, so Steph Wentworth, who is reporting from the pit lane again today, didn't have chance to catch a word with Ben, but I bumped into him this morning in the paddock, and he said the biggest problem yesterday was actually turning the tyres on before the push lap, the real strong lap, so it was about making sure that uh, principally the right side tyres, because you, you were talking about the middle sector being very tricky, it is very technical, and he said there's a lot of left-hand corners within that, so you've got to make sure the grip is there, both on the left and the right, and I said, well, it's qualifying at the end of the day, it's a four-hour race, he says, no, 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 it's all about track position, you'd far sooner be out front and avoiding an incident, but also you don't want to be following a car in the early part of the stint, because that absolutely kills your front tyres. Green flag from a team member from American Magic. America's Cup being hosted here in Barcelona. The absolute pinnacle of yachting excellence. Clearly enjoying this moment. Packed grandstand. What a delight it is to see people flocking to world-class motorsport. Also crowded on top of the new media centre building. That's the one with the circuit de Catalunya. Barcelona Catalunya logo in the background there next to the iconic timing stand. Huge amount of work going on here, Johnny. Something like 50 million euro being spent here. As By the, the regional government. Indeed. So they're ploughing money into this venue to make sure that it is in a state to retain the Grand Prix because the contract for here runs out in 2026. And uh, there is a plan for a Madrid race, which is happening, but obviously Barcelona would love there to be maybe a Grand Prix here on alternate years, switch back and forth, kind of similar to what happened in the UK in the 80s when we went to Silverstone, to Brands Hatch to Silverstone, uh, and continued for, like that for a number of years. I think there is scope, certainly, uh, for this place. The drivers love it, and it's also a brilliant place to test a car as well with so many different types of corner. Worth watching, by the way, looking down the order here. There is one name that stands out in this 43-car grid, and that is the car starting from 10th place, AO by TF. Did not qualify where they hoped they would. And Robert Kabitza has been put aboard that car for the start of this race. The Formula 1 race winner. Uh, 2024 FIWC. Ferrari hypercar pilots. We should point out that's not as a result of where they qualified because no. they would have had to declare their starting driver before the end of qualifying yesterday. So, so that's. Well, they could be pushing hard because uh, for Robert to deliver, he needs to get to the front of this grid pretty darn quickly. Not going to be the simplest. It's a tricky start to this, this, uh, this race, this lap, isn't it? Hard right hand turn. Oh. Instructions in place as to what each of these drivers must do if they run wide to the outside. Mata Ferrari in the AF Corsa garage. LMP2 and LMGT3 efforts for 
his team here. There's a, a new regulation, by the way, in terms of gridding the cars up this year. They're all moved into their separate batches, regardless of how the times compare to others in class. So if you are in an LMP2 Pro-Am and you're slower than LMP3s, that's not reflected on the grid. So we have a batch of 14 LMP2 cars headed by Philip Ugran for United Order Sports after Ben Handley's time yesterday. Paul Lafargue for EDEC, then Matthias Kaiser and Alejandro Garcia for Algarve Pro Racing and Cool Racing. The second Cool Racing car of Lorenzo Fluxa alongside Sebastian Alvarez for Inter Europol competition. Their second car of Poland uh, is started by Oliver Gray, number 34, with Bijoy Garg alongside for United, their second car, number 23. 65 in a different livery for Panis Racing this year. Manuel Maldonado to start alongside Kubica for AO, as you've said. Nielsen Racing's David Heinemeyer Hansen does the first stint. Jonas Reed joining him for Iron Links Proton on the sixth row. And finally, Niels Kuhlen for Duquesne team is joined by Vector Sports' Ryan Cullen. Then there's not actually a gap on the grid. There might be slightly more than within the LMP2s because it's eight Pro-Am LMP2s next, headed by Giorgio Roda, a stellar lap from the Proton competition driver yesterday. Tony Wells, though, might be impressive for Team Virage starts alongside. Then it's John Faub and Rodrigo Sales for Nielsen and Richard Meal. AF Courses, Francois Perodo, United Order Sports, Daniel Schneider. Brighton Len Dudis for Algarve, joined by DKR Engineering's Andres Latour. LMP3 headed by Miguel Cristoval for Cool Racing, the number 17. The time was done by Manuel Espirito Santo, though. Julien Gerby starts the team Virage number 8 from 24th, but the front row of P3, and immediately behind them, Michael Jensen of RLR, DKR Engineering's Alexander Matchell, Torsten Kratz for WTM by Rinaldi, and into Europol competitions, Alexander Bukantsov. And skipping back to the new LMGT3 category, Sarah Bovi will start that for the Iron Dame. She set the time after all. It's a bronze only session, remember yesterday. So car 85 from the pole alongside Hiroshi Hamaguchi, who had a spin in qualifying, but he'd already set second fastest. Johnny Lawson for Formula Racing, Duncan Cameron for Spirit of Race. Takeshi Kimura in another Ferrari for Kessel and Grid Motorsports not rebuilt, replaced Aston Martin. A big crash for the Grid Motorsport by TF Aston earlier on in the week. And Martin Berry will start that. He was absolutely fine after the big incident. Here we go then. It's been a number of months waiting for a new season. We had a double header to end 2023 at the International Circuit Algarve in Portimao. And now in the neighboring country, it is time to go racing once again in a new season for the 2024 European Le Mans Series with United from pole position. Listen to the noise. Oh, I've missed this. And down into the first corner goes Philippe Ugran with Matthias Kaiser trying to hang on to his coattails, but he may well lose out. No, Kaiser in the sky blue, I think it's just held on. No, moving down to second position now as Lorenzo Fluxa starts to flex his muscles in that second place car for Cool. And Cool wants to be in second and third as there's an early spin for the number five car of RLR, M Sport, and James Dayson. We haven't yet had the carnage that we had though last year through the first sequence of corners. I don't want to speak too soon. Down the hill into turn five we go. Yeah, it did see one of the two Nielsen racing cars run wide at the first turn, has rejoined using that little escape road. Well, but Kubica though has made very good early progress here. Philippe Grant, Lenzo Fluxer, Matthias Kaiser, and Hanto Garcia at the top four. And it was important, I felt, there for Fluxa to gain early progress. He'd obviously been sort of playing that out in his mind, maybe, last night whilst he slept. And uh, a good charge down the inside to be at least level with Kaiser. And uh, the natural swing from right to left to right again in those first sequence of corners here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalunya, uh, really went in his favour. He is a, well, I say local, he's from Spain. He's actually from Mallorca, the 19-year-old Spaniard. And Flux are now wanting to try and pressurise Philippe Ugrand, but the initial suggestion is that he's going to struggle to do that. 1.4 seconds is the gap as they stream across the line. So Flux are running second behind Ugrand for United Order Sports. Third position, Matthias Kaiser. And then it's Alejandro Garcia in the second cool car ahead of Sebastian Alvarez for Inter Europol competition. 
A good clean start from the front of this grid. Didn't see the incident that befell James Dayson, but he is up and running. All 43 cars have completed this lap. Getting down to business now. United Auto Sports and Cool Racing, Algar Pro Racing, the second cool car into Europol competition. Then the AO by TF car, the 14 of Robert Kubica. Just tucked in behind the Interrupt Oh, there it goes, the white and red coloured Orica. Remember, power boost, and a little less weight as well this season for the cars in the European Le Mans series, up to about 580 brake horsepower, up around 40 from last season. And that showed Johnny in the qualifying pace and will show in the race pace as well. Sarah Bovey has done a very good job in defending from the pole position, so has stayed ahead, and there's a new car chasing her now in the form of Johnny Lawson's maroon car for Formula Racing. So it's Porsche from Ferrari and the Lamborghini of Hiroshi Hamaguchi slipping back to third, but he's still well and truly in the mix for Iron Lynx. Takeshi Kimura next in the second of the Ferraris for Swiss outfit Kessel Racing. Plenty of curb being taken by the LMP3 leaders. It's Julian Gerby who's muscled his way to the front in the number eight Team Virage car from Cool Racing's Miguel Cristofar. So he started from pole position. He's only 1.2 seconds away. But uh, Philippe Ugrat making this break, and Ben Handley explaining to me earlier on today that it was important to do that. You've got to take advantage that the pole position delivers and try and stretch your legs in this opening stint. They'll be pitting around about the 40-minute marker, and if they can come in with a decent lead and not be affected by a safety car, they'll be so, so grateful for that. Yeah, a couple of seconds clear now. Philippe Ugrat, it's been a great start from the United Auto Sports car. And if looks... Uh... Hanging on in there and gapping Matthias Kaiser behind. Alessandro Garcia right with him. Sebastian Alvarez right there too. Robert Kubica also in touch. Two laps completed. Ten seconds cover the top ten. That tells its own story. Behind pretty much in class order with the exception of a couple of the LMP3s. We saw James Dayson drop down to the back of the field with a spin in turn between turns one and two also dropping down into the gt3s is the ultimate car another car that's had issues uh, this week and did not seem to be on song johnny in qualifying yesterday the number 35 car but alexander yvonne is up and running if not at the sharp end at least reliably at the moment as has changed there between the number 88 form into europe ball competition and the 11 from your international. Yeah, so that will be a change for third position. As the yeah, Matt Bell up to third, that confirmed now as they go through the next split. Philippe Ugrand, the 21-year-old Romanian driver, though, now on to lap four and with a new fastest lap of the race. So living with this uh, decent pace and obviously finding his rhythm nice and early. It's a 130.589. From the clear, by the way, we've got two Matthew Bells in this uh, this race. One in LMP2, that is the Matt Bell of the Brothers Bell. And yes. one Matthew, Matthew Richard Bell, as is described on the uh, entry list. Well, he used to be, and that was confusing me, because I think he is just Matthew Bell now. So uh, I'll have to keep reminding everybody that, that the Richard is included there as well. Yeah, but, uh, he is uh, up into third place in the deep blue with red trim. Number 11. International car. Philippe Ugrand, though, two and a half seconds clear now and pulling away from Lorenzo Fluxa. No further progress, by the way, from Robert Kabitza at this point. So back across the line for the fourth time will go Ugrand. 2.6 seconds now the advantage after again a very good lap time for the Romanian. They're just starting to pair off a little bit further down the top five. A nice battle between Alejandro Garcia and Sebastian Alvarez for cool and inter-Europol competition. And the second of the inter-Europol cars, which is number 34, driven by Oliver Gray in this opening stint, has now fallen behind Bijoy Garg in the United car. They're battling over 10th position. Gray currently 11th, and then a bit further behind them, David Heinemeyer Hansen. Giorgio Roda, though, establishing himself in a good lead too. Performed so well yesterday in qualifying. 
and Rhoda Jr., if you like, with father watching on. They used to drive together, now in the 77 car that he shares with Ben Fiscal and Rene Binder, and that will be a real threat for, remember, separate championship points for LMP2 Pro-Am. But, as we found out at this event last year, there's nothing to stop if there are safety cars partway through the race, a Pro-Am car winning outright, and therefore those drivers would feature on two podiums. We have a moment to take a look at some of the LMGT3 field, just coming out of shot ahead of the delayed ultimate car was the GR Racing Ferrari, the black with lots of orange. So here comes Philly Bugran though, still edging away, 10th by 10th, crosses the line, it's another 10, 2.7 seconds clear now. An uncommonly large gap to the front of this field, Johnny, at this, this stage of this race. Here comes the second of three. United cars to cross the line with Bijou Garg. That's the second of the LMP2 cars. They also have a car, of course, an LMP2 Pro Am. That car at the moment, hands of Daniel Schneider, sits in 20th place. That's Matthew Bell, head of the cool racing car, the 17 car, the team, the defending champions, but it's, it's a very different looking driver crew this year. The 17 is also made uh, the way by. My apologies, that's a change, isn't it? That's Matthew Bell up into second. He's making his way past Miguel Cristovo. So Julian Kirby leads the race. Matthew Bell, Cristovo, Bikatsov, Torsten Kratz, Alexander Matchell. Fantastically well in the Asian Amons with LMP2 over the winter. Michael Jensen, Jack Wolf are the eight, if you like, in a row. That's the 97. Grid Motorsport by TF Aston Martin. It's a replacement car, as Johnny was saying at the top of the broadcast here after an accident in testing for the team. We will see pink mirror on that car. It's a, a testament to the livery you'll be seeing later in the season. This car arrived as a loaner from Belgian team Come To You Racing on Thursday. It's been converted to an gt 3 to get up and running. Yeah, so don't get used to the colours on no. that 97 car because, uh, I mean, they are striking. And uh, you may well have seen some photographs, some press photos ahead of this weekend of what the livery should look like. That will return Looks for the next round. It really does. And it's disappointing we can't bring that to you this weekend. Four abreast at times. The field did really fan out. And then it has to funnel its way down into an, an awkward first corner. There is a natural racing line there. But of course, if you've started on the right hand side of the grid, you have to, the, the angle of attack is a lot shallower. And it's easy then to run out wide before you get to turn two. Plenty of give and take, understanding from the various LMP2 drivers there. All the, uh, it was all on his own, I reckon, no, James Dyson. There was a clash think? with Ice. I'm just trying to pick out which of the cars that was. Did I think it, it might have been the Racing Spirit Le Mans car, but it was a dark coloured Ligier. Okay. But there was definitely a clash uh, front right of James Dyson's car with the left rear of the other Ligier. And already into traffic here. Where did James rejoin? He's 42nd now of a 43 car field, so that's been very costly. He's fallen off the lead lap of the LMP2s, but that won't be an immediate concern of his. Got to try and uh, stick close to the other, well, principally eight cars. There are nine other LMP3s in his category, but also the other one to have been delayed is Alexandre Yvon of Ultimate, who have had a trying weekend so far. They weren't really anywhere in qualifying, despite Mathieu Le Hay setting the times. And now uh, the opening stint done by Yvon, who is the bronze-rated driver. They have bronze, silver, silver as their combination. Into traffic, and that gap has come down to absolutely nothing. So Philippe Bougran suffered in traffic almost immediately almost four seconds when they started to get to the back of the LMGT3s and the LMP3s mixed within that, but uh, now down to a single second. Lorenzo Fluxa doing well at this point. Just shows how quickly the complexion of a race like this can change because, yes, you have a, a worthy race leader and by a decent margin, but it doesn't even take a safety car to whittle that lead down again. And this is where the skill of slicing through traffic 
very clinically indeed, can be so valuable. Might be where we see the number 14 AO by TF Car Gain Ground because that's side by side now with the 43 of Inter Europol and around the outside to pick it off will go Robert Kubica. Uh, either side of the Aston Martin as well. Kubits are not quite happy with that because the place was taken back again as they exited turn 10. So fair play to the 43 driver who is Sebastian Alvarez for this opening stint. I thought Kubica was going to disappear into the distance, but he's back in front of the Polish driver. I think James Dayton has had another problem. That's uh, looked to me to be the Panis racing car going very, very wide. What happened there? Or was it Virage? That was a clash with James Dayson. So, I thought Panis had a slightly different colour scheme than that. The Virage car, which was started by Tony Wells, haven't got a middle sector tyre. Oh, no, we have. Panis. No, it was definitely Panis. Yeah, right. It is yeah. Manuel Maldonado. So, that car now in um, colours more familiar. It's Mark VDS Racing. Yes. Of old, but James Dayson looks to be beached here. So, the yellow and the orange, which are resplendent on Team Virage, but also. As you say, in an Echo 2, Mark VDS resplendent on the Panis racing car as well. So Maldonado has found his rhythm again, but he's rejoined in 12th position. So James Dayson had that incident at turn 9, has now stopped at turn 12, 13. Looks to be beached. That's where the yellows are. Yeah. Turn 12, stuck on the kerb and he'll be given ample time to try and get free from there. I'm sure the engine is running, so it's not that it's stalled, but that's in a horrible place, oh, right on it? the racing line for everybody else coming through. So count to 10 generally is the rule in race direction, and we may have to go either into a full course yellow or something brand new for this championship and also new for the World Endurance Championship is the potential for a virtual safety car. But virtual safety car periods will only last two laps or so and will be immediately followed by a safety car. It will be and a full I don't course think yellow. it's that bad no. for a, a V, uh, virtual safety, VSC quite yet, yes. but we will have an FCY instead. Yellow. So it's a full course yellow to get the towing done, and of course full course yellow can last we as long as it takes. Full course yellow in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We are under full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. And now the argument can begin between Robert Kubica and Alejandro Garcia as to who exactly was in front as they headed into the full course yellow. There wasn't going to be an inkling of Kubica backing out of that potential overtake on car 47. Round the outside went Alvarez, and this was just before the full course yellow was counted into. Was there a touch? That was a side-by-side -side touch, and that gave Robert Kubica the opportunity. This was the recovery from the earlier incident and a second spin. James Dace, dirty tyres likely as he turned in, and then he's got the car stuck on the kerb. So just a bit unlucky, I think, there from James. They'll pull that car clear, get it onto a flat surface, and he should be able to rejoin. Do we think there was contact between Manuel Maldonado and Dayson at turn nine? I or think did there was. Did one go off in sympathy for the other? I think there was definitely contact. Maldonado is back in the race and having been delayed through that middle sector, as I say, has dropped positions to 12th now in the Panis Racing number 65. So having gone through the gravel, the next key area where he needed grip after turn 10 was turn 12, and that's precisely where the number five car rotated. And it had already been delayed, of course, after the spin early on in the race which Great. began at 11.30 yeah. and uh, a really busy start, but crucially for United, they retained their race lead from the pole. Yeah, neatly done there by Philippe Ugrin, kept his line. The manager, car five, your engine has stalled. We're pulling you to the gap. If the driver later can restart the engine on his own, we will allow him to rejoin. That's, so that's as clear as it can be. Engine has stopped for James Dayson if he can restart, but he needs to do that by the himself. Manager, car five, we are pulling your car into the gap. If later the driver can manage to resume, for us it's fine. Well, they're doing all they can for James Dayson, who was all smiles this morning as we drove into the paddock. I would imagine his mood has changed quite dramatically since then. Lots of things happening and far too early in the race for the RLRM Sport number five car that is shared. Uh, with Daniel Alley 
and Bailey Voisson, who uh, qualified it yesterday. Got another look, by the way, at that uh, incident between turns one and two. And as certain as I can be, there was indeed contact between the 31 of Jack Wolfe and James Dason. So it was Wolfe who, well, didn't look like he was massively delayed. He's the back of the eight-car train that yep. is together on the timing it, it, screen. It was, a, 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 I have to say, a very typical turn one, turn two Barcelona incident. Two or three into one generally doesn't go. And uh, just bad luck. And I think, to be honest, we've not yet seen the genesis of the incident at turn nine. But uh, the incident at turn 12 for James Dyson, I think, again, just bad luck. Yeah. Back onto track after a run through the gravel and turned in, expected there to be a modicum of grip, and there was none. Yeah, and we don't know how old those tyres are. You only get four sets in LMP3 for the whole weekend. So, yes, that's all of free practice, two 90-minute sessions, then in qualifying, and then the whole of the race. So you would imagine with four stints, you want to try and keep a set for each stint, but then two of those, certainly for the pole sitter, number 17, they used two tyres, the best of them, during qualifying yesterday. Uh, just to confirm, by the way, Robert Kubica has ceded that fifth position to Alejandro Garcia, who did lose out to Sebastian Alvarez. So it is Ugram from Fluxa, Kaiser, Alvarez, Garcia, Kubica, the top six, then Paul Lafargue, Ryan Cullen, Bijou Garg, Oliver Gray, the other into report car, David Heimer, Hansen, Manuel Maldonado, Jonas Reed in the Ironlands Proton on number nine, and then Niels Kulen. Uh, completes the 14-car LMP2 order. We wait uh, for race control to determine when we're going to go back to green flag racing. But we can call the LMP2 programs in the order of John Fowle from Nielsen Racing leading the race now. He's got by the Proton competition number 77 for 24 for Nielsen ahead. Richard Beal by TDS is Rodrigo Sales is third. Francois Perodo in there, of course, a car in 83 is fourth. Tony Wells on his full season debut. In LMP2, Team Virage is fifth ahead of United Autosports, Daniel Schneider, Crichton and Tudis, Falkoff Pro Racing, and DQ Engineering's Anders uh, Latore. He sits 22nd. Team Virage, as we said, lead LMP3 from Muir International, Cool Racing's 17, into Europol's 88, and we go back to green flag running. The message takes a while to get to these three cars, including the race leader, Philipp Ugrat. Uh, they've still not got it, have they? It, no, it, it's oh, back to full course yellow, that's oh, why. What happened there? And the pit entry remains closed. My wrong here with the numbers, doing things manually, that's what happens. <laughs> well, at least he fessed up to it. Yeah. That's Eduardo Freitas, Five, by the way. Here we four, go. Three, two, one, green. The track is back to green. The track is back to green. So now we can race, and fortunately, this is the race for the lead. Nobody went too early, and uh, Philippe Ugrand caught napping there because, because Lorenzo Fluxa, thankfully, both wise to the fact that that was a fake green coming through the final corner and done slightly in error. And now, when we finally do go back to green, Ugrand could not react in time, and the Spaniard, the man from Mallorca, Lorenzo Fluxa, is now the new leader of the motor race. Well, there you go. He was ready on the trigger, wasn't he? Uh, just looking behind there, I think there's been another change. Looks to me like uh, Ryan Cullen has got past Robert Kubica. He has the Vector Sport man. Another one quick on the trigger. Sixth place now to Robert Kubica. Not making the progress that he would have hoped for at the start of this race. So Fluxer, Ugran, Matthias Kaiser, Sebastian Alvarez. Alejandro Garcia, now Ryan Cullen complete the top six. Looking further down the order. No other major place changes at that uh, restart, Johnny. Yeah, but it's, it's puzzling about the AO car and why they haven't quite got the pace. They didn't have yesterday either when uh, Louis Delatraz was plugged into it for qualifying. He should have been a lot faster than that, so maybe they are working their way through various problems. It might be quite difficult to attack those now that we are in race as the 43 car goes through shot. That's Sebastian Alvarez with Matthias Kaiser just ahead and Alejandro Garcia behind. Pitting. And in comes the number 14 car, which is very early indeed. We've only had 20 minutes of the race. 
and we'd expect an LMP2 car to go double that distance, even with the two rolling laps at the start of the race. So uh, the puzzle gets more complicated, perhaps, as Robert Kubica comes back down pit lane. And it's way, way early for an LMP2 car. And what is going on at AO by TF? Hopefully we'll find that out pretty soon. So we are, of course, fueling the car first. Are our tyres ready for the car? Well, yeah, I mean, you would treat this as a normal pit stop initially, and then there's scope, I suppose, for the car to go up on the dolly jacks and into the garage. Is there uh, evidence of dive blades being out of position there? No, I don't think so. Well, it's a little bit battered and bruised, actually, the front lap car. Yeah, it is. The front lap car, well, this, uh... It looks like the front right at maybe a similar shape as well, so they're going to take the nose off the car and replace it. That's one of the reasons why it won't have been going as fast as it should be. Kubica staying on board, I fancy, because he's only been in the car for 20 minutes, as now Sebastian Alvarez is catching a bit of slower LMP3 traffic. That was the DKR engineering car of Alexander Matchell with its very blocky livery this year, pixelated, which is quite cool, but uh, I made the point yesterday that from the front, it looks like it's had a bit of racer tape attached as well. That is all part of the colour scheme, and I'm getting more and more used to it as the AO by TF car now rejoins. Does not lose the lap. No, that was crucial to turn it around. No further action, by the way, that incident between the 65 Polish racing car and James Dason's RLR car. James Dyson, by the way, has not restarted. They were given the option to by the organisers, but sounds like the engine just will not fire back into life for James in car number five. Manuel Maldonado, the other car involved for Panis, who remains well, no longer 12th. He's gained a place since we last talked about it to 11th position. Team Virage's Julien Gerbi, who holds dual nationality, both Spanish and Algerian and uh, has both national flags on the belt buckle. He is leading in the colours of Team Virage, the yellow, orange and black, ahead of Euro International's car for Matthew Richard Bell. And side by side between a couple of LMGT3s as well, that's the 97 Aston Martin then, with the 51 Ferrari, yes, of uh, Charles-Henri Samani. Indeed, Charlie Samani goes by Martin Berry. Derek de Burr right now behind the... Aston Martin, we've got Debris down at turn 13 on the right-hand side. Perhaps that might be from the AO by TF car. What if that happened at the restart? Well, certainly very tightly bunched. Remember, they were fighting going into the full-course yellow. Kibitza on the outside, and he was side-by-side side with uh, Garcia's cool racing car. That's the first traffic by way of LMP. That is Andres... Torre cannot. That's a replay here of lead change in P3. Did that happen at turn 10? They were certainly trying, or the 11 Indeed. car was trying to make it happen, oh. and a terrific effort from Matthew Richard Bell to hustle his way all the way to the front of the order. He began in class in, I'll make it eighth place. Right, yes, eighth position to the lead of LMP3. In 25 minutes. Unbelievable. Meantime, leading in LMGT3, leading by four seconds. Sorry, Bovi. LMGT3 R. Rear engine Porsche as opposed to... Oh, there's a clash there between the number 10 and the 47, and both in the gravel. And they're not going to get out of there without assistance. That is the fifth place battle between Alejandro Garcia and Ryan Cullen, yellow at turn one. Cullen driving for Vector Spore in the white, number Watch 10. Again. And it was Cullen making the move on Garcia, and Garcia closed the door. That's tricky to yeah. read precisely. I kind of need another angle of it, but Garcia, I don't think, was aware that Cullen was wanting to attack at that point. It's a tricky corner anyway when you're on your own at turn seven, down in the dip and often blind on the entry, you're so focused on the apex as you head into that corner, but he wasn't fully alongside Ryan Cullen, so that might be taken into account. That, that might be a safety car at this point. Well, 
as I say, the, there is an option of a virtual safety car, but it doesn't seem to be as immediate as that, the, well, the necessity for it, Well, we can go safety car without the VSC bit. The, the reason for it is two cars, therefore multiple interventions required. We've got uh, the DKR number three car on pit lane as well. It's Europol's number 34 also calling it. They know there's going to be an intervention here, and they are going for the strategy call and hoping that that uh, call comes quickly and they're not going to burn these stops on the we full green. We are going virtual safety car in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We are under virtual safety car. We are under virtual safety car. And this, Graham, to 80. this, Graham Goodwin, is a first it for is a ACO first. Rules Racing. It is an absolute world first for ACO ra uh, Rules Racing. We've not seen this in any other championship. Rule set was in place for Qatar, but was not required. We didn't even have a safety car in Qatar from no. memory. There were a couple of full course Watch yellows. This again. He's up alongside, he's not ahead, um, but. <sighs> yeah. I mean, the rule sometimes is if you spin the car on your outside out, then you weren't fully alongside, but uh, it's not our decision to make. And it, it could be called as a racing incident very easily, that one. The difference, I was about to say, between the virtual safety car and the modern-day safety car on the FCY is that the pit lane entry road remains open. Well, the key here for these teams is if they want to pit, pit now, because when yep. the safety car, which will follow this, as soon as that is called, pit lane will close. For three laps. For three laps. And if you do pit under safety car, it can only be for emergency service, and you'd have to pit again as soon as the track goes green or as soon as the pit lane opens again. So these are legal stops. They can be full stops. They could be driver changes, tyre switches, whatever you like to do. And it's almost like a kind of precursor, a warning to the full safety car that we absolutely will have in a moment or two and we'll probably need because now Ryan Cullen's driven right into the middle of the racetrack having been towed to a safer or a, an easier place as in the green concrete to drive away from the scene but it required a three-point turn to do so more difficult to recover the 47 car all the three race leaders are or the leading cars are now in so Lorenzo Fluxer from the lead of the race Philip Ugrand follows suit Sebastian Alvarez in this car, the 43, also pits. I put the, the racer's point here, which was there was a gap there before that all started. Ryan Cullen went for the gap. Whether or not it was the right place to go for, we'll leave for race control to determine, but there definitely was a gap to go for at that point. But if you're going to go for it, you've got to really charge your way up the inside, break later and prevent Alejandro Garcia from turning in. And there is Garcia, 3-2. That car back in the gear, he can, and we're away. No, not quite. Not quite. Well, this, folks, is why there's a virtual safety car out on track. Well, the other point we haven't point we have mentioned is that it's a an 80 kilometer speed limit on the full course yellow. And he doesn't want to find reverse now because he'll reverse into two cars. But 80 kph, just as it is under a slow zone at Le Mans, and exactly the same speed limit down pit road as well. Now Garcia's on the grass and almost tearing the rear bodywork away. That's there's, flapping around. There is uh, the. That's at least easier to fix on a P2 car than it is on a P3 car. It is a rear flip, and they will choose to do that. As I understand from my reading a virtual safety car, they will give everybody an opportunity to pit here. Yeah. Well, it, it won't extend beyond two laps, is what I read. So you get two opportunities to pit, and if you refuse both, you've had your chance, the safety car will be called. Be advised, we have marshals exposed between T12 and T13. You should find double-waved yellow flags there. You should find double-waved yellow flags in the area. So, what's going on? Gravelly mess, rather, at uh, turn two. Marshals, as we've heard from Eduardo Freitas, at turn 12. And uh, meanwhile, our packed grandstand gets to see more or less the entire field on pit lane. That's true. Get to uh, see a lot of the cars up close and at slower speed. And. A little earlier on, Julian Gerby was ahead of Matthew Richard Bell. We know that the 11 car eventually got through. That was them going through that sequence of corners uh, before the place change. And 
feet down the inside. Why we're being shown this, is there a penalty coming somewhere? I wasn't quite. sure which of those cars we were viewing. Was it the 21 down into that corner? But no, uh, puzzling otherwise. Ah, that's was a... that coming into the virtual safety car? Was there a mistake made? It could have been. But they, but LMP3 had switched back around, had it? Because I thought Matthew Richard Bell had taken the lead on Julian Gerby and the eight car was back in front of the 11. They have emerged in that order since the pit stops. And one car that has taken... Uh, one car that hasn't taken a pit stop yet is Alexander Matchell. So the DKR Engineering number four from LMP3 now leads that class. Neither has Paul Lafarge. He'd export and not pitted. He do now. Yeah, so later, but deciding to do that now. I can't imagine that anyone's going to pass up this opportunity to put some fuel in the car at the very least. Still a bit too early to be switching tyres after only a 30-minute run. We have, though, got uh, Sara Bovi, Takeshi Kimura and Duncan Cameron, the leading trio of LMG3 cars. They have not stopped either, and neither has JMW Motorsports' John Hartshaw. Well, we've seen this before from the Iron Dames crew, that they are never or rarely tempted into the pit lane if there's a full-course yellow or a safety car or a virtual safety car. Um, they just enjoy racing too much to come in. Now, obviously, certain amounts of those lock you out of the pits anyway, but uh, a safety car after three laps, you are permitted to come in. But I've seen in the past that they just much prefer to stick to their pre-arranged strategy. And you can understand that because three stops prior to the race on paper should get you to the finish. Why complicate matters? Uh, which would force you into the scenario where you might need a splash at the end. And, of course, Dennis, if there's a late safety car, uh, all things would change. However, they're going to go against that now. <laughs> I've put that forward to the court, and it's completely been thrown out because here is the 85 Porsche of Sarah Bovi. So she will make use of the virtual safety car. Everyone touring their way around the track at 80 kilometres per hour. It's a little bit like a code 60 might be in something like the 24H series as well. The idea behind this is that it's the precursor to a safety car, but it should retain any gaps that have been built up through the first 25, 26 minutes or so, whatever we had before the caution. So it's a different set of tyres. There's no restriction on Goodyear Eagles in the LMGT3 class. You can keep chucking brand new stickered tyres at these cars all the way through to the finish. Uh, that is not, of course, the case in the prototype classes. So uh, next up, very shortly, just uh, on, okay. on the All call of the race director. Standby. We are going to deploy safety car shortly. There we go. And that was how Lorenzo Fluxa took the race, race lead coming out of the full course yellow versus Philip Ugran. Ugran desperately trying to block off the cool racing car, but he couldn't do that too much, otherwise he would have been penalised. Just gently inching the car over to the right, and actually there was the briefest bit of uh, Goodyear rubber on the grass there from Lorenzo Fluxa, but he stood his ground and he took the race lead away from the Romanian. Pit safety entry car. closed, we are under safety car. Currently, there is car 37. So now we've got to look out for anybody who may be coming back into the pit lane. Robert Kubica made all it, I believe. All cars to group up behind car 37. All cars to group up behind car 37. So that is uh, the race leader, number 37, for Cool Racing, car Lorenzo Fuchs. Car 37, please keep the 80. Car 37, please keep the 80. 80 kilometres per hour, that will be, yeah. to make All sure to that car 37 catch car catches 37, up to please. the Nissan All GTR. All cars to pick up the pace to catch car 37, please. Pit entry is closed. So, puzzling as to why Robert Kubica came in again. All top is fuel, not right top for that. Fuel. It's effectively free fuel stop. Yeah. All right, well, th what was that going to be, about three litres? Uh, it could make Pretty, a difference. It may they'll make a difference. They'll have done the count back at this stage without a shadow of a doubt, so it will be fuel only, I'm sure, for Robert Kapitza. They didn't change tyres at the first stop. I don't think they've done so there. But minute Robert's 15 feels lane. like a long time, though, for the amount of fuel that needed to go in. He should no, have that was 1.15, he's still on pit lane. Yeah. All cars. Oh, they, so the 1.15 was the, the red light, that's why. Group up behind car 37, please. Yeah, so make it back out. Pit road was open when he came in, but he's now having to wait 
for the safety car train to go Correct. through and the final car to cross the safety car line. And there are still 18 laps to his name. Or is it or is that car now a lap down? I think he's a lap down. He's a lap down. So that makes the decision to come in again for fuel even more bonkers for me. Again, I'm not quite sure what AO by TF thought they were going the to achieve there. We're going to slow on track. Let's pick up the pace. We don't have any interventions. We are free to go. All cars pick up the pace. So they want to get racing again as quickly as possible. And it's obviously 80 kilometers per hour to catch the safety car. Then the safety car will be doing quite a bit less than that in order to ensure that the field bunches up. So the big change there, Kessel Racing lead LMGT3 by dint of not having stopped. John Hartshorn also stayed out in the GMW Motorsport car. Robert Kubica has now left the pit lane, by the way, yep. and tacks on to the back of, well, whichever car he finds first. Remains to be seen how many of these cars will be waved by as well, because some will be trapped between the safety car in front and their class leader behind. And although it's fairly early on in the race, we've not yet done a stint's worth for LMP2 on fuel. There should be some unravelling of the field to take place, even though the safety car has picked up the race leader, Lorenzo Fluxer, for cool. Just looking for where some of the strategy might be playing out. You can see that John Hartshaw in the middle of the LMP2 is at the, st at the head of this train. He will be looking for the wave-by and therefore to have an advantage in staying on the lead lap in LMGT3 for much of the bronze time here. Yeah. So this is strategic from JMW, I'm certain of that. There is the JMW car, unfamiliarly red at the front, yellow at the, the rear of the car this year. So that car most certainly will get that. Look and see whether we've got any of the LMP2 Pro Amps ahead of the class leader. So remember, the wave by when it comes will be to any car in the class who is ahead in the safety car train of the we class are now leader. We on entering lap two of the safety car. We are now entering lap two of the safety car. And the answer is, I don't believe any wave buys for Pro in and my map, LMP2s I have either. some gaps caused by cars 86 and 97. Let's close the line, please. We want to think about doing pass arounds. Let's close that line. We've been running slow for too long. We need to get those cars going faster. Let's close all the gaps, please. He talked about drive time. In the case of John Hartshorn, I reckon it's 90 minutes that he needs to do. I'm just yeah. double-checking that. But if you'd run with a... Most teams run with either bronze, silver, gold or bronze, silver, platinum. And as the bronze, you have to do one hour and 30 minutes as a minimum of the four hours. The other car to get a wave around, I think you can see the game. Managers, please it's check the 35 if you're eligible for pass arounds. Car there Team managers, in our please shots. check if you're eligible for pass arounds. With the Virage car, the brake car leading LMP3 is behind him uh, in this train. Why, you ask? Well, it's so that the safety car doesn't unduly affect a class battle, doesn't effectively put them at the risk of going a full lap down because the safety car has been deployed. Yeah. There can be winners and losers in this. I think the two big winners are going to be We are preparing the pass around, exiting T7. Ultimate exiting T7, all cars not eligible for the pass around, bear totally left. Exiting T7, cars not eligible for the pass around, bear totally left. Prepare the pass around, prepare the pass around. So this... The untangling of the order to make sure that if the overall leader has got in front Start of you... Start the pass around. Start the pass around. ...and interrupts that line of sight with your class leader, then that's an unfair position for you to be in, especially this early on in the race, because it drives clean air between you and uh, what otherwise was a fairly close Please battle. Please start the pass around. Please start the pass around. So a lot of cars won't be eligible to be passed around here. That's why they're staying well that's over it. to the I left. I think that's it. Um, Two cars. Because, as I say, your class leader has to be behind you in the queue. Um, since they, they Reminder, we are in lap two of the safety car. Pit entry is still closed. Pit entry is still closed. So, with the race leader at the front of that queue... 
Pass around has been concluded. Pass around has been concluded. Cars which did the pass around, please do your best to catch the tail of cars behind the safety car. So with the LMP2 leader at the front of the queue, there are no LMP2 cars, cars, may cars go in back front of weaving. Him. Safety car will be instructed to increase the pace. Safety car will be instructed to increase the pace. And then for 10th place, uh, we've got the LMP2 Pro-Am leader and there are no LMP2 Pro-Am cars in that queue ahead. We're getting there. So just one LMP3, the 35 Ultimate car and JMW 66 Ferrari. They're making their way through the second sector now to try to join the tail of this queue. And very soon, therefore, as, as not necessarily a great deal of time will be given to those GT cars in order to catch up, as long as they've been able to wriggle free from the safety car, which they have now. They are effectively still on the lead lap within category, and that enables us to go racing again. Of course, any lead that Lorenzo Fluxer was trying to build over Philippe Ugran and Sebastian Alvarez and everybody else has now disappeared. That's the nature of a safety car. Indeed. Uh, would say, by the way, uh, in terms of the overall order with the shuffle there, the AO by TF car has dropped back to 20th place. But it's not at the tail of the LMP2 field because Vector Sports' Ryan Cullen is actually down in 29th and behind the lead two LMGT3 cars. The AO car is behind the leader because that car did not pit. Poor old Alejandro Garcia is the final runner at the moment, 42nd place. With the more delay caused by the contact into turn two. So he sits behind all of the LMGT3s and all of the LMP3s, with the exception of James Dyson, who has not rejoined. Yeah. Yeah, very early bass for those associated with RLR, M Sport, and car number five, unfortunately. I do wonder start whether well. that may have been something more than just a stall there, therefore, for James Dyson. Maybe the clutch. Yeah, I mean. He'd already been off at a fair rate of knots with Manuel Maldonado at turn nine, and then clearly something wasn't right at turn 12. If it was a slipping clutch or some sort of drivetrain problem, that might have pitched him into the spin. And then when you're off the road and semi-beached, uh, stresses and strains are far greater on a car when you're trying to get it back onto the racetrack. These are built to be fairly durable, but when all four wheels are on the, the ground, then things can three. break easily. Pit entry is still closed. Pit entry is still closed, and we're waiting for 35 and 66 to catch up with the pack. They're more or less there now. We're up to the end of this queue. We're looking for the cherry red and white LMP3 at the back of the queue, and then the red and red fronted 66 JMW car. The big brains getting working here on how this affects strategy. To the top of the screen, there's Ryan Cullen in the order, just appearing through the final turn. Trying to keep heat in there. Goodyear tyres for the LMP2s, the LMP2 Pro-Ams and the LMGT3s. The Michelin rubber for the LMP3s, of course. It is interesting to me that they're allowing the GT cars to catch up because normally they just wave them in front of the safety car and then we can get racing again within a lap or so. Well, we've, we've got the whole queue now. Safety car at full speed. Safety Here we go. Car at we'll be going back speed. to racing. Pit entry is now open. Pit entry is now open. Yeah, because once the safety car has crossed the start finish line after being deployed three times, that is the three laps of safety car completed. So coming around for the fourth time now, you would be able to access pit lane. Everybody, though, that wanted a pit, I assume, has already done so in the virtual safety car that led into this period. So not expecting any of the key runners in LMP2 to want to dive into fuel. They wouldn't give up such a good piece, uh, piece of track position here, as in the case of Lorenzo Fluxer and Philippe Ugrand. Ugrand may be kicking himself a little bit as, uh, about the restart earlier on, coming out of the full course yellow. So the Romanian well and truly revved up to try and reverse those positions as early as possible into this next green flag stint. The train coming through the second timing sector. Safety car lights off, safety car in this lap. And safety car in this green lap. Green flag racing, Johnny Palmer. I'll just give you some more caffeine at this point. I'm not sure I'll need it. I don't think you do. Just hear those high revving 
Gibson engines, and that'll spark me back into life. It's all the coffee you need. Indeed. Here we go, Lorenzo Fluxer. How much does he weave? How much does he want the tyre temperature? Well, lots of it into turn one, but he can't do that excessively because uh, that's often frowned upon. Here we go. Now really does let loose the number 37 cool racing car, and he's got the jump on Philip Ugran, who wanted to stay with him, but he's missed the boat a little bit there, the Romanian. Unfortunately for him, the Sebastian Alvarez car isn't that close as they head across the line. Matthias Kaiser could well be a threat, though, in the Algarve Pro car, as uh, Alvarez in the yellow and green colours of Inter-Europol competition heads into the first corner. Busier back in the mid-pack. There's a brief glimpse of the DKR Engineering LMP2 car rounding the first couple of corners of this circuit, the Barcelona Catalunya track. 4.6 kilometres, predominantly right-handers, but that middle sector can be awkward, particularly after a, a long run of uh, slower speeds to switch on the right-side tyres. All four classes and very little space through that corner, but uh, dealt with with no problems at all this stage. That is the GT3 leader, of course, Takeshi Kimura, having opted not to stop under the virtual safety car. Neither two did John Hartshaw. He then join, rejoins the queue and is still on the lead lap with what I'm guessing about 15 minutes before we get into his fuel window. 90 minutes, I think you said, was his minimum time. Yeah, there's a bronze in, in the LMGT3s, yeah, you've got to do an hour and a half, which is deliberately an awkward amount of time. You can't do that in one go because a GT3 car, an LMGT3 car can only do about 60, 65 minutes. So it's a stint and a half, pretty much. AO by TF. Robert Kubica is the first car off the lead lap. It, it just doesn't look as if that AO by TF car has got the pace at the moment. Something we, we know the car clearly had some kind of contact, that uh, no section being changed earlier, but it's it wasn't where we expected it to be in qualifying, and it doesn't seem to have the bite here either. Tony Wells with two wheels on the grass there, very dusty grass as well, to try and stay out of this scrap that involves LMP3s and the Kessel Racing car guy, LM GT3 Ferrari. But impressive stuff from Tony Wells there. He didn't let his right foot wane at all from the throttle as the Lamborghini goes incredibly wide and he's out in the dirt. I even saw that in the mirror there of our onboard camera for Sarah Bovi. But Hamaguchi rescued the situation and Bovi in the 85 Porsche has slipped back because of the latest bout of pit stops. She's only slipped back to second, though. And, in fact, no, that's the race lead, isn't it? Getting ahead of Takeshi Kimura in the 57 Ferrari. So, car guy colours back to second as Sarah Bovi muscles her way through. Well, that's great stuff. And, of course, that's Sarah Bovi having got a full tank of fuel as well. So that's a pretty hefty advantage. And Dames, of course, have taken a race win in the European Le Mans Series back in their Ferrari days. Well, it's been a WC race win since then in the Porsche. WC, they're now aboard the Lamborghini and back to a Porsche, but a very different Porsche there. Here, could this be another famous win? Edex Sport working its way through the first couple of corners. Paul Lafargue, sixth position. So behind Bijoy Garg and a recovering Manuel Maldonado tucked in behind. Door mirrors ended up in the gravel trap. Not yeah. exactly sure where that's fr uh, where that is. It might be from a GT car. So that is not causing uh, causing an immediate problem. I don't think that's going to necessitate the need for a full course yellow because it's well off the track and in the gravel trap. But uh, something to keep our eye out for anyway. If it gets bounced out somehow. Here. Yeah, so Vector Sport recovering from being in the gravel and causing the first ever virtual safety car down the inside of the 24, but these are not on the same lap. Ryan Cullen falling a lap down because of that time he spent in the gravel trap at turn seven. So getting a lap back on John Falb in car 24 for Nielsen. Pretty fired up by the look of it, Ryan Cullen as well. 
aggressive style and trying to John foul to cede that position. Eight minutes to go till the end of the first hour here, Johnny. It's had incident. It's had some good racing. Settling in now. Lorenzo Flux are leading the race. Four seconds the good, the cool racing man. I notice on our graphic, the picture for Matthew Richard Bell, I think, is the other Matt Bell. That's is that right? Matt yeah. Bell. So we are we're still saying Matthew Richard Bell drives for Euro International. That's definitely Matt Bell from the northeast of England, from Newcastle. Ooh. It definitely is Matthew Matthew Richard Bell in that car. Fine. So it's Matt Bell's in a P2 car. That's what I thought. The team Verage car. Yeah. But it is confusing for us and others that uh, there are two Matthew Bells this year. Or, well, let's call them Matt Bell and Matthew Bell, uh, with the occasional Richard thrown in for extra certainty. Yep. But Matthew Richard Bell was very impressive with the same team last year. He was indeed. And he raced regularly just as a twosome with Adam Alley. So they are back for a second uh, run at this championship. He's, uh, he's been a fast to be reckoned with in radical racing, which has been a rich seam of talent for junior LMP racing down through the years. Uh, being reminded forcefully, by the way, by... Uh, oh, and that, that's uh, another mirror gone. It was a mirror on the 57 car going awry, the right-hand mirror hitting the scenery after side-by-side -side contact with the... That is the second of the RLR cars, the 15 car. Well, I've worked out where both mirrors have come from now, because that Ferrari hasn't got either of them. <laughs> So they both they mo must both have come off the car guy Kessel Racing Ferrari, which is going to make it rather difficult when you're in amongst traffic. Don't need mirrors. Well, some people say they are there for decoration. I'm not entirely <laughs> convinced, but it's going to have to need, if they're going to replace them, two new doors normally. Well, I'm not sure they would bother with that in the pit stop. Well, I've been testing earlier this, this week. I've just realised it's that car that I saw, a mirror being refitted to after it lost one in testing as well. So whether or not that repair wasn't quite the scratch, that's not the same mirror, but it's probably the one from the other side. Yeah. Not painted yellow, but they aren't in the car guy nope. livery. And uh, that was definitely the second mirror going for a Burton on Tageshi Kimura's car. So he's now entirely reliant on the central mirror in that Ferrari. And unlike the old 488, you can actually see through the back window on a 296, you I've can. just noticed. The firewall in a 488 prevented you from doing that. It was like driving a transit. Well, it's actually also got a cutout that reads 296 in it. Oh, in the rear window? In the rear window. Nice. Uh, there you go. They are quite vulnerable to, for that happening, though, aren't they, in yeah, the they new are. design? So I don't think that's the first or first two door mirrors that we're going to lose from a 296 this year in the ELMS. Low slung LMP3 can even pluck one out of the side of the door. Meanwhile, the number 88 into Europol competition car of Alexander Bukantsov is just ahead of Torsten Kratz. Must surely be one of the quickest bronze rated drivers in the field. And Kratz dive into the inside in the Duquesne. There is no way through though there at turn number nine, but definitely a little quicker than Bukantsov is the German. And needing to really identify where the best place to be is to uh, mount a full-blooded attempt on an overtake. Penalty being noted, car 24, that is the LMP2 Pro-Am car from Nielsen Racing, John Falb at the wheel of that car, 10 seconds added to the next pit stop. That could be, now we were told that they were under investigation, I'm trying to recall for what, Johnny? I'll, I'll re-interrogate the race control messages in a moment to have a look for that. Closing in on the end of the first hour. Duncan Cameron aboard his number 55 car. The era of the 296 GT3 in the European Le Mans series is firmly with us. Ferrari battling with the old adversary there, Lamborghini. So Russia Hanaguchi, I think, indeed, is aboard that car. General Larson getting involved, and there are indeed two doors ready for the number 57. Oh, right. OK, so they are thinking about it, but see that you said mirrors weren't important. But, it but may well be that they have to. They have to be part of the car. What they don't want to be is called for it. Yes, when it's too late. 
Uh, the 24 car of John Fowler was under investigation for possible advantage at the second corner That's on the... It wasn't the second lap, I don't think. It might have been the, the... It was quite early. It was early on. The problem is the time reads as 11 colon 3. So we start at 11.30, so you've got about okay. nine minutes to choose from there. But actually the message was issued at 11.36, so it probably can only concern the first two laps. Takeshi Kimura fending off a string of cars behind one Lamborghini, the wailing 5.2-litre V10, and then three other Ferraris, all equipped with mirrors, by the way. They are, so already having an advantage over Kimura, who sits in second, but may well be a sitting duck right now because of his restricted rear visibility. So here's the other point, which is, of course, minimum weight. Yes. Although they're surely made of carbon fibre, so they won't weigh a great deal. A couple of kilos, maybe. I honestly do think that they're used... Yes, they're a gauge. Often, you know, um, supercar drivers in Australia will say that really the mirror's there to just work out how far you are from the concrete blocks at the edge of the street circuit. And as soon as you whip one off, then you've gone too close. The Ferrari will now pit, but I do think in GT racing, they're pretty crucial. If someone's going to stab a move up the inside, you need to be able to see them coming. Well, Kessel Racing will be ready for Takeshi Kimura. The camera down there. We'll soon see. Tyres are ready for the 57 as well, I can tell you. And Swiss team, one of the big teams of Ferrari customer racing down through the years. And fuel is going to go in that car. Wash the windscreen. Are oh, they going to go for doors here? No doors ready at the garage opening. You can see very clearly the mirror has been plucked off. You may well choose to do this, Johnny, at a driver change. Yes. It is a drive-through penalty, by the way, for Ryan Cullen causing a collision. So that's been called against the Vector Sport man. So whilst he did lose less than the car that uh, there was contact with, the cool racing car, he is going to be punished for it. It's tyres as well for the 57. But uh, Takeshi Kimura is going to stay aboard, and that's all she wrote there. No change of doors. Touch engaged, and away he goes. Oh, well, sort of. Uh, it was quite there, is it? proving yeah. pretty cr uh, troublesome to drive away from the scene. So a reminder that the drive-through penalty for car 10 was Ryan Cullen attempting to overtake Alejandro Garcia in the 47 cool racing car at turn seven. It resulted in both of them spinning and ending up in the gravel track and causing the first ever virtual safety car initially, which then, as it should systematically do, get, went into a full safety car. If they're going to change doors on the 57 Ferrari, I would think they'd do one side during one pit stop and maybe finish it off on the other, the other pit stop. Maybe the driver's side is the priority. Um, but if Takeshi Kimura is comfortable in there, remember, he's the bronze, and then the other drivers that are due to get in, Esteban Masson and Daniel Serra, will probably be fine without them. I mean, they'd like them, ideally, but they could probably drive around the problem. There is one thing, by the way. I don't know whether or not those mirrors have been adjusted. <laughs> no, they have now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the removed from the car. Well. But, yes, removed, on, it's adjusted on the new doors, you mean? Uh, as in, will there be any use whatsoever? Yeah because a lot of uh, the, the prep time uh, involved in getting the driver in and getting their seat fitting correctly, but also then you need somebody on the doors making sure the mirrors are serving their purpose. Then you have drivers of different heights, and that would be quite complicated as well to have to adjust mirrors for new drivers going in, but they've uh, decided not to burn too much time. The thing is, they're toying with a race lead here, so bring the car in for uh, an early-ish pit stop you can work that into normal strategy and as the 57 car has now rejoined it's dropped to 10th position in class but that's because everybody else in front is yet to do the corresponding pit stop unlike of course Sarah Bovey who did come in at about the 40 minute marker and they took full fuel at that point so she can go a lot lot further in to this particular stint We've had just over an hour's worth of the four hours of Barcelona, and Lorenzo Fluxer put in for the opening stint then of Cool Racing number 37. 
leading by 6.8 seconds over Philip Ugrant in the United Order Sports car. Here he comes with the red visor on the car. Ryan Cullen, by the way, has taken that drive-through penalty. Drops back behind Robert Kubica as a result. He's now on the 20th. We'll wait to see exactly where he ends up at the end of this lap. Alejandro Garcia, by the way, still has not cleared the other two to three cars. So that was a substantial delay for him. He's not far away from doing it. Maybe we'll do so on the next lap. So that was a big delay for him. Fresh drivers getting ready. The minimum drive time in LMP2 across the board is one hour. So this is the magic point now to be able to get opening drivers out of their cars. Many teams starting with the silver. So keep the silver drive time to a minimum and switch things over after 60, 65 minutes. Even though we had that safety car, it's interesting to me that a lot of teams are sticking with that pre-race plan. And we're on to lap number 33 now, with uh, a message about car 83 being un mm -hmm. under investigation with a possible overtake under yellow. So that's the AF Corsa Pro-Am P2. Yep, that's Francois Perodo aboard that car. Let's cool racing lead this race as we're now into the second hour. Lorenzo Fluxer having taken advantage on the restart over Filippo Granit led from the start. Oliver Gray pits in the 34 Interiopol competition car as I speak. Sebastian Alvarez third in the other Interiopol car, the 43 car. Algar Pro Racing in their championship defending run, being upheld at the moment in fourth place with Matthias Kaiser. Fine fourth place for him at the moment. Paul Lafargue and recovered back up now to fifth place. Bijou Garg in the second United car in sixth. It's a driver change for the 34. Another great out of the car. Whole lot of new here in terms of the drivers, the driver squads, Johnny. In terms of the cars at the moment, the newness is all about LMGT3, but the cast list here has taken a, a, a real, really different direction this season. Lots of names that will be familiar from F2, F3. There's the sports car marketplace, particularly in hypercar booms. But all of a sudden, we've got talented young drivers realising this could be a really good direction yeah. for their careers, and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, and I also think the careful planning with the calendar to allow the availability for a lot of those drivers to dovetail a season within ELMS, which has always aimed to be, well, initially, I think we only had four races for a while, then five and now six, but uh, deliberately no more than that, so people can plan around the calendar, they're long races, remember, and uh, perhaps deliberately when you total up the amount of hours we're racing, it is 24, so crucial to this type of sports car racing. And it's one a month with the exception of June because everyone's rather busy with their visit to Circuit de la Sarte. But otherwise, April, May, July, August, September and October all covered with individual events. Wonderful to be going to the country of Italy twice. Uh, because the first ever visit to Mugello later on in the year in September is really looked forward to by a lot of the teams. There's a lot of Italian drivers and teams in the entry, of course. There's the four car. Uh, we can see on pit lane, Jean Fallon finishes his first stint, but there's still lots of action underway out on circuit. 65 car that had its off track moment earlier in the race. Very much in the fray. It's a car running seventh place in the hands of Memo Maldonado. Here comes the 25 car. He was in fourth place, drops back as the pack roar by. But an impressive run here, Johnny, from Lorenzo Fluxa. He's put nine seconds on Philippe Grant since we went back to Green Flag Racing. 
Yeah, Lorenzo again, another one to have come from a single-seater background with Formula Renault in Europe, but also the Middle East. He's only 19 from Mallorca, and uh, as you would expect, someone who got into F4 three or four years ago, coming from a karting background, having raced in the FIA Karting World Championships and also Europeans as well, with the outfit known as KR Motorsport, but Van Amersfoort, RACE GP, who made their ACO rules debut yesterday with the Michelin Le Mans Cup, and then uh, raced in Asian Le Mans. Fluxa with Cool Racing did. back in the last year in the start of this. He did, and uh, we saw the driver change, by the way, for uh, into Europol. It was Clement Movelac kicking the board that. The another ex F2 driver, F2 race winner, in fact, uh, last year with Trident. Plenty of that, plenty of talent coming from the upper echelons of single seaters. It is a drive through penalty, by the way, overtaking under a yellow flag that's going the way of. Francois Perodo, that will drop him out of third place. Like did the catcher at cost, sorry, excuse me, a place to Tony Wells, who's what, 20 seconds back from the multiple title winner, Francois Perodo. 77 leads that race at the moment in LMP2 Pro Am with Giorgio Roda, head of Rodrigo Sales in the Richard Meal by TDS, number 29, then Peroga, then Wells. And then we get into the LMP2 cars. They're either delayed or have chosen to take a second stop at this point. Good chance to compare the inter europol competition liveries this year between the 34 and the 43. It's sort of an inverted version. The principally yellow-nosed car is the 43 with the green dorsal fin, and it's the reverse on the 34. Earl from the team who looks after their PR was saying, well, yeah, it's green and yellow to represent the green fields where the yeast of the yellow is grown because they're bakers. Green, become, green comes first before yellow in the alphabet, so green 34 as the lower number, yellow 43 as the higher number. And you've remembered that, so he's won. That's well, the... it's good marketing, if nothing else, because it's influenced the commentator, <laughs> and I've talked at least for 30 seconds about the team there, so there see you, Earl. You've done your hard work. I hope you get that rise. I can put that invoice in now. Yeah. Second and third. And it is uh, Alvarez chasing down Philippe Ugran. Lorenzo Fluxer is hauling away from here. He's now 13 seconds up the road. The 37 car going very well indeed. Uh, this is a bit of a battle on the way for second place. Jim McGuire, now part owner of United Autosports, ex contender here, of course, the MP2 Pro Am. And uh, absolutely ecstatic when Ben Hanley went across the line yesterday to take pole position by a convincing margin in the end. We'd been staring at uh, very, very small gaps between the cars, and Ben Hanley eventually getting pole position by a massive one and a half tenths, which was significant. It was about the same margin then back from Richard de Geras in second and Alex Lynn in third. Didn't manage to catch up with Alex this morning to see how disappointed he was to have missed out on a front row start, but uh, the Algarve Pro Racing car has uh, faded a little bit since then. We won't see Alex, of course, until later on in the race. That uh, particular car, number 25, is running in ninth position, 13th overall. Has just had a routine pit stop, though, so that'll be strategic and... If there's one team in this paddock, you should not second-guess on strategy. It's Algar Pro Racing. Certainly not. Last year's championship-winning team. Yeah. And uh, they took some convincing results during 2023. So keeping their powder dry at this stage. Speaking of which, down the inside goes the 25 car. So that's an indication of how hard Caldwell's well, going to be pushing. The that's yes, the leader. Yes, to unlap himself there. Yes, indeed. So Lorenzo Fluxa had become used, perhaps, to the 25 gar car going at a certain speed, and uh, things have changed a little now. Kaiser out, Oli Caldwell meaning business as the gold getting in. And crucially, if we know we have another safety car now, that 25 car is back on the lead lap. Oh, there you go. That would have been a critical moment 
And we'll have a look at that beat as one of the Aston Martins runs off. That is the 59 car. That's the most experienced of them on machine. In the hands of Derek De Burr, American driver. Coming into warning flag territory. Two or three now I've seen getting the final warning on track limits. Touch and Kratz in the WTM by Rinaldi efforts, the latest of them. Rounding the turn, the third place car of Philippe Ugran. How long are they going to leave him in that car? Surely until the fuel runs out. Remember, a lot of these cars getting off their typical strategy, but in now comes the race leader, Lorenzo Fluxa, for Cool Racing. Car 37, stopping on his marks perfectly. And a driver Drake. insert coming through, so yeah, they're going to be switching drivers. We've got quite the crew here. Atoma Miata, I think it is, getting aboard the car. But we've got Melty Jakobsen still to come in the 37. What a trio that is. We've seen what Renzo Fluxa can do. Miata, Toyota Gazoo Racing's reserve driver. Melty Jakobsen, it's the same position for the Peugeot Total Energies squad in hypercar. Noted, by the way, is um, by none other than Mark Hughes at Motorsport Magazine. Mark reckons the current situation in Formula One needed a spare um, wheel up there. 37, minor delay is going to go in the way and now goes. Uh, but perhaps one or two of the Formula One teams, the, yeah, the wheel not got away from them. Uh, might want to take a look at the likes of Melty Jakobsen to see whether or not their skill set matches up. Who am I to disagree? Nobody, and uh, I can only agree with uh, that latter statement. Um, loose wheel nut is potentially a bit of equipment that's not under the control of a mechanic, so that might have been clocked by some of the officials in pit road. S certainly nowhere near as bad as a wheel starting to roll across the fast lane, but nevertheless it may have led to that, so we'll wait and see whether that's been spotted. This is dangerous, doesn't it? There was the yeah. extraordinary incident was it a couple of seasons ago in IMSA, flying wheel nut flew up in the air over the car in front of pit lane and damaged the radiator, flying in through one of the ventilation gaps in the front bodywork. Can certainly happen. Um, so, that, yeah, that, that uh, needs to be prevented where possible. We'll wait to see, but the pit stop in isolation took longer than it should have done. Here's Edex Sport, car 28, making a stop. If you noted the change in lead, it is uh, the 43 of Inter Europol to the lead. Uh, Sebastian Alvarez goes ahead of Philippe Ugram. Well, Ugram was third anyway before the pit stop for Fluxer, so that place oh, change had happened already. Side, side contact between the number nine Iron Lynx Proton car. Here is United Order Sports. Who was that? Which LMP3 was on the inside that made contact? It was P3 on P2, which was slightly weird, but uh, with a P2 lapping to work out which car that was. But it was none of the key players at the front because Julian Jerby continues to lead Matthew Richard Bell. And Alexander Bukansov. So Ugran, who'd slipped behind Alvarez, I reckon, before these stops happened anyway, uh, is now back up to second place. This is the sister car for Bijoy Garg. Did they do a driver change there? They could have done, so I, I would did. imagine they probably did, because Garg will have done his hour. In fact, one hour 15 we're now up to. I think they did with the change of tyres as well. So 23 rejoining in 12th position. It's topsy-turvy, isn't it, as uh, in comes Philippe Bougran from now second place. The race leader in LMP2 Pro-Am remains Giorgio Roda, but Rodrigo Sales is right on his boot lid now for Richard Mille by TDS. And there is a, a risk, I suppose, that these two will need to come in at exactly the same time. Here comes Giorgio Roda in the 77 from the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am, and Sales in as well, I think. He is. Yeah. That is the TDS car behind the, the vibrant shade of yellow. You should see those cars power by now. There's one, there's the second. As now comes the United Auto Sports team to attend to their charge. The 22 car, Philippe Ugram, led the race, of course, from the start. Lost that lead as we went back to green from a full course yellow. Away goes the car. 
it's sort of yet to find its rhythm, this race, you know, Johnny. It's pretty fast and furious stuff, but with a couple of interruptions, there's several strategic cards already played here. It's a 77 car came in from the lead of LMP2 Pro Am, which means despite having had that drive through, Francois Perodo is now up into third place overall. Willow is a pit stop shortly and leads LMP2 Pro Am. Here is uh, our first close up look of TDS Racing back into the European Le Mans series. It's champions, of course, here. GT3, Sarah Bovey. So Sarah is now, what is that, 12, 13 minutes away from having, there he goes, there's another side-by-side -side contact. Now, was that caused by a lack of mirror? Sarah certainly wasn't messing about. She's got about 12 minutes before her bronze time is done. It's a familiar trio in the European Le Mans series with Michel Gatting and Rahel Fry. Rahel not racing with the, the group in the FI World Endurance Championship this year. And Pam will replace her, or has replaced her for that, but is very much involved in the direction of this Iron Dames programme, not just here in the LMS and the WC, the Michelin Le Mans Cup and the two new drivers we have there in karting and rallying. I'm not sure whether or not she's got any involvement with the equestrian programme, but she's certainly a very trusted lieutenant mm. of the Iron Dames programme. In comes uh, Francois Perodo. He'd already visited the pit lane because of a penalty needed to serve. But uh, back in again now in the leading LMP2 Pro-Am car, but that will drop it back down towards Gregoire Sosse. Colin Noble, who's taken charge of the Nielsen Racing number 24 car, which is currently third in class, but may well be bumped up to second because of Perodo's pit stop. And we're fo focusing on Clement Novelak now, chasing down Marino Sato for fourth position in LMP2. So it's the dark blue and red of United Order Sports versus the green and yellow of Inter Europol competition. And also in pit lane, from the race lead, Manuel Maldonado. Now, only because he's one of the late uh, LMP2 cars to pit, and remember, he's had a really lively first couple of stints, including that big off at Turn 9, which unfortunately accounted for James Dayson and the RLR M Sport car that would retire a few corners after that. So Maldonado, just as soon as he's pitted, that should leave Ritomo Miata as the new race leader. So 37 back to the front after Lorenzo Fluxer was there. Tremendous stint from him. Let's see what the Japanese can do in terms of gaining some rhythm. Miata over the line for the 42nd time and back to the front, go cool racing. We'll play with change between United Order Sports squeezing the Vector Sport car there to the right-hand side. And that was the 23. Uh, 21 car, I reckon, from United. It was the Pro Am version with the Merrick. Sky Blue car, uh, Sky Blue number. So Andy Merrick took charge of the 21 in the previous pit stop to take over from Daniel Schneider. And Merrick running now third. So the new order of Pro Am after that latest pit stop is so safe for Richard Meal by TDS Racing ahead of Colin Noble in the 24 and United Order Sports' Andy Merrick. So well, what's happened to the 77? Because that came in as the race leader, and René Binder has dropped Long back to stop. fourth position. Long pit stop, 1.38 for them on pit lane. That's so much longer than it needed to be, Lost surely. about 25 seconds there to most of the cars around him. Yeah, because everybody it. else did driver changes and did them in a minute and 24, 25. Yep. So something's gone awry at uh, Proton Competition. Big disaster for 77, otherwise their weekend had been going completely to plan. Let's try and find out what's going on with AO by TF, because Robert Kubica is bogged down in the lower portions of the top ten. Still no immediate answer to the, the lack of speed of this car. They obviously had damage 
which forced him in for a, an early pit stop after only 20 minutes to replace the nose of that car. But now that it's had fresh bodywork, it's still 10th place and just ahead of Jean-Baptiste Simenauer for Duquesne. Well, the revised order at this stage, Ritomo Miata now leads for Cool Racing in the 37 car, but uh, by under two seconds from Ollie Caldwell. So that uh, forceful move by Ollie on his way out the pits paid dividends, didn't it? On, uh, Nino Sato, meanwhile, 11 seconds back, and with his mirrors full of Clement Rouvelac, the Chardin de Juris, the thick of things in qualifying for the five seconds back, three deck sport into Europol's second car. And so Vlad Lomko is running sixth at the moment. United Autosports, Fabio Scherer, uh, Arturo Capietto for Ironlink's Proton and a nine car. Prize Racing's Arthur Leclerc and Robert Kabitzer for AOP ITF complete the top ten. That is the top three. Talent all the way down. Jules Decane there. They're looking after the Decane team car. You can see there in the shot, number 30. And chase down and so jump up to Simonau, Robert Kabitzer. So also involved, of course, Decane team with the Asota Fraschini hypercar program in the FR World Endurance Championship and it's their home race next weekend, Johnny. Yes. At Imola. Yes, uh, the World Endurance Championship reaches Imola a few weeks before we do as the European Le Mans series. In fact, we have to wait until after Le Mans before our first visit to it, Emilia Romagna. It's the hors d'oeuvre to the... To the big the, show. To the European Le Mans series main course. I think that's right. That's fair to say. Someone out, by the way, is side by side and was uh, given a little bit of, uh, can we put it as coaching there yeah, by... Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting term, Robert but yes. Kibitza, and trouble there for the number 88 into Europol car. That car's been around, gathers it back up, and that is Alexander Bikantsov. Let's see the incident that started that. About two, and it's three wide here. Torsten Kratz it was, and... That was just trying to deal with the W10 by Rian Minaldi. I don't think there was any contact. I don't I think, think there was either, because the, the dive planes were still intact. Yeah, I think, I think just got in the dirt. It was Kratz going very uh, uh, to the right on the edge of the corner. He couldn't then get the ideal exit speed out, and that rather compromised Bukansov, resulting him in a spin on the dirt. Lorenzo Fluxer, what a stint from him. Now chatting to Steph. I'm joined by Lorenzo Fluxer, driver of the number 37, Cool Racing, and it's time to cool down, really, because you've just got off the first stint of the car, started in fifth, all the way up to first, perfect start to the race. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty good start, clean, which was the main thing, you know, to, to get that first in clean, get through a bit through the field, do as well as you can, but also to control the tyre management and feel and everything. So now, yeah, overall really good, we achieved what we wanted in the first team, in the first team. and now, yeah, the team did an amazing job, the car was amazing, and yeah, yeah, really positive start. How does the pace look for the rest of the race? Do you think you'll be able to maintain this first position? For sure, we'll try our hardest too. I mean, the, the goal is to, is to win the race, especially with that start. If we can keep it uh, the best, to be honest, yeah, as I said, the team did an amazing job. The car is amazing. So I don't see why we wouldn't be able to, but for sure, the competition is also really strong. So we need to keep pushing, keep uh, doing our job as best as we can, as we've done. And, and then the result will be whatever it can, but we'll do our best. And just a word for you, because this is a home race for you. It's great to see so many fans coming out and enjoying the European Le Mans series. Yeah, yeah, to be honest, it's been amazing. The amount of people that have come, the amount of support, uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I've, I've never experienced something like this. So many people coming, supporting, asking for photos, saying good luck. So I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all of them for coming. And yeah, we, I tried to put on the best, deck, the best show I could for them. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Lorenzo Flukes uh, chatting to Steph Wentworth and uh, now out of the car. It's a bit of a shame, actually. I was loving his couple of stints. He was very impressive indeed. It's uh, another of our young stars and uh, cracking to see such a great start. If you are following us uh, online, of course, on the TV channels, I know an awful lot of you uh, also use online timing. My apologies and our apologies for the fact that appears to have frozen at some point. I'm sure there is a massive technical team working that problem as I speak, so apologies that that has, and there's trouble there, and that was touch from the 23 car on the rear of the 12 that has sent the WTM Baranaldi racing car of Torsten and Kratz around. Now, 
I suspect that might be called against the United car there, you know. Well, Torsten Kratz has been charging hard, but uh, he did give... Well, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say he gave the United car ample room. He didn't actually need to because that's his that's his, his corner. corner. Yeah. And the 23 misjudging its breaking point. It very nearly got a slap in the face after as it left the scene as well. Did the 23 car? It's Fabio Scherer, I'm afraid of the wheel of that one. So that will be we'll see it again from this angle. Ran out wide. He's that got, delivers him into the apex at 12. Well, but got, there wasn't a gap with, there. He's got to deal with the car that's alongside him as well. The number nine car that was coming through. So can't see that that was anything other than something to call against the 23. Meantime, the 10 car is in and out, and Ryan Cullen brought the car in. Stefan Raquelmi, welcome to the European Le Mans series. I gather from my colleague Stephen Kilby, this is Stefan's first race in the European Le Mans series, which I found very difficult to believe. And great to have him back. He's been doing a lot of work on the H24 project, We'll see that car again later this season, the hydrogen fuel cell technology demonstrator. But great to have him back in racing. Was here with him some years ago um, as part of the test programme for the Ginetta LMP1 effort for which he was considered. There you go, that's the number nine car um, up the inside, very much up the inside, going by two of the LMP3s. 47 core racing car. That car in and out. It's the delayed car, of course, Alejandro Garcia. It was to bring the car in. I'll tell you who's aboard the car as she clears it out. And it is Frederick Vesti aboard the car, another of our newbies. Uh, Killers right, quite right about Raquel Me. Um, not even in the Le Mans series did we see him previous to 2012. Uh, a regular in the Le Mans Cup more recently. Duquesne up against the 27. Nielsen Racing. Nielsen Racing for all Nico Pino. That's all getting a bit. That was, I'm afraid, that was self inflicted. It was uh, Jean Baptiste Simonauer trying to get stuck into the 27 car of Nico Pino. Pino would not have known that Simonauer was there, and uh, it's a concerning place to put your nose. You need to make sure that the car alongside is fully aware and now a very dusty looking livery which is always uh, so stealth like the black with the green uh, roof and v-shape on the nose as well certainly looks like it means business but unfortunately now looking somewhat dustier and the tattered rear end of uh, torsten kratz's uh, duquesne has made its way into pit lane now so might need a bit of work but remember you can't remove the rear deck of these cars they're going to just send it out again. The bullet's still intact behind the rear wheels. Uh, just, uh, I was just double checking my recollection. That was, of course, Nick Opinion's car from last year. He was part of the King team effort last year. Uh, a quick message, by the way, from the media room from Stephen Kilby. Not just uh, the first LMS race for Stefan McKelmy. Astonishingly, the Monagas drivers' first endurance race in five years. Okay. That is an amazing stat. Well, he used to run with Jackie Chan DC Racing. Has run as well with Alpine. In the back FIA the World Endurance Championship. I think that was probably the most recent appearance. Tested for LNT a couple of years ago. But yes, uh, has been off. Well, did a single round in the World Rally Championship, I noticed. That presumably was. Did he? Apparently, yeah. In a Volkswagen oh. Polo at Monza. Uh, is that the Monza Rally Show? Well, uh, yes. WRC, that was the World Rally Championship, is it not? Yeah. So that, yeah, they, that was uh, when the WRC was a little up in the air, as so many things were in 2020. So they probably had a single venue rally held at Monza. I know a lot of it on the old banking. Yeah. Uh, so Raquelme did that, probably to keep uh, some kind of rhythm in motor racing, and then came back in 2021 within the ACO rule set, driving the H24 project, as you say, in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Very wide entry or exit, first of all, from 12, or 11, and then into turn 12, I noticed, from the LMP2 cars. Clearly finding grip way out there. That's now become the natural racing line. First of the bronze drivers to finish their stint at the end of 90 minutes. It's going to be John Hartshorn. He's on pit lane at the moment in the number 66 GMW Ferrari. 
We'll wait to see which of the other drivers, as, as the camera pans there, we can see the red Ferrari on pit lane. But we're now in the realms which will allow the bronze drivers to finish their stint. Hiroshi Hamaguchi hears what I'm saying and pits immediately, realizes he can get out. And uh, looks to me that we're going to be seeing Rahel Fry in the leading car when Sarah Bovi is called to the pits. Every time I look at this screen, there's at least two P2 cars side by side. Yeah. And after, by the way, after that. all of that, Intervention, a little bit of carnage, great racing. The top 22 cars are still LMP2 cars. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, they are so much quicker in single lap speed than the P3s and the LMGT3s. However, they've had uh, various difficulties to this point, so uh, take some doing. Fabio Schirer versus Artur Leclerc for oh. Panis Racing. So Artur's first stint in race format for the European Le Mans series. Younger brother, brother of Charles, of course. And uh, they head through turn 12 together. That uh, was the fastest man at the prologue test. That took place here with a lot of track running on Monday and Tuesday for the European Le Mans series runners. Four long sessions. And all of a sudden, here come the um, GT3s. Iron Link 63, uh, Roshi Hamaguchi, we called Mike Wainwright, we just saw stalking away from his car. So it's Axel Jeffries rejoins in the 63 Lamborghini. Martin Berry has brought in the 97 grid motorbot by TF Aston Martin. Charlie Summoney in the 51A, of course, a car he's in. We've just seen Claudio Schiavone's orange and black proton competition. Uh, Porsche. Phil Keane it is, by the way, that's rejoined in the JMW Ferrari. And Phil. Uh, I think his last start in the European Le Mans series some years ago, he was with uh, Mike Wainwright's golf racing team. But way back when, well over a decade ago, I was checking my memory with him this morning and he agreed he did indeed drive one of the Orica FLM09, the, the oh, yeah. LMPC cars, with John Hartshaw back in 2011. Wow. Brilliant. It's a championship that Paul Luc Chatter has won in the past, been a champion, oh. late on the brakes, and uh, is Artur done. Leclerc to pull off a move there on the 23 of United Autosports and Fabio Shearer. They were going door handle to door handle. And the other thing I noted was Alessio Rivera muscling his way by Andy Merrick. That was a fairly forceful maneuver. Here it is again. So Rivera to the inside of the Welshman, down the hill between turns 13 yep. and 14, and right at the inside to take third position. Cleanly done. Another three of the LMGT3s pitting now. And here's the Formula Racing Ferrari of Johnny Larson. Also in now is Sarah Bovey from the lead. Spirit of races, Duncan Cameron and Derek De Boer in the number 59 rating Spirit of Amon, Aston Martin. So that leaves just Takeshi Kimura. And it is indeed going to be Rahoff Wright. The more vertically challenged of the two. Getting bolted in, silver rated. Got Michelle Gatting of the gold variety still to come. Well, there's a reverse, of course, from previous years, with uh, Michelle going up the rankings greasy pole. And Rahel Fry slipping back to silver. Yeah, I didn't think I was imagining that. I, I was, for some reason, looking at the entry list earlier on in the week, thinking, I'm sure they used no. to be the other way around. That was the case last year. Completely correct. Side by side for the scrap then between uh, we've got uh, Ollie Caldwell still working his way through the order, and... Now, Ollie Caldwell has been working second place for a while, this is just traffic. Yeah, He's but just the gap's coming down, isn't it, Miata. to Miata? Yeah, I mean, it was 0.6 through that graphic, I noticed, it's in reality 1.3. But Caldwell, who began his stint a lap away from the race leader, because we saw him overtaking the 37 we did. at the time. And so he's, he's now basically to... grabbed, grabbed that lap back as, yeah. the, as the 37 car made its pit stop. So it was a crucial move there. So there has been no intervention from race control no. since then. That is pure pace, but as you say, also a pit stop for Cool Racing to bring that back into the clutches of Algarve Pro Racing. 
This is looking like it's going to be one of those battles over the season, isn't it? So it's cool racing. Marco Pro Racing, last year's champions, United Autosports, finished second last year to Marco Pro Racing there. They're looming in third place. Then into Europol, the 34 car, Edex Sports. Russia Dejeris now aboard the 28 car. They're your top six aboard the GR Racing car, the new. Ferrari 296 with the familiar colours but a different uh, blend of those colours this year for GR Racing. And We've matching wheels on that Ferrari which looked very, very smart, I'd noticed, as they were doing the tyre change. And reflective, by the way, too. What the wheels are? Yes. <laughs> so, wow. uh, like hot wheels. You know, the, the photographers and videographers at Le Mans this year, I can, I can, I can almost see the drool. Yeah. Well, That's going to look spectacular at night. It looks incredibly impressive, this new 296, with a reworking of the livery that used to be on the GR Racing Porsche. And as we speak about LM GT3, let's catch up with the driver that led it for a long time in the early stages, now with Steph. As you can see, alongside me, we have Sarah Govey, driver of the number 85 Iron Dames. You've just jumped out of the car literally two minutes ago. The last time you were racing in European Le Mans series was Portimao 2022. You put it on pole and then you converted it to a win as well. Is that what's going to happen again today? Well, I mean, uh, at the moment, everything is going well. I mean, I was super happy with the car I had. You know, we knew, we knew that heat would all be about managing the tyres, keeping a consistent pace through the stint. We were also a bit... Uh, I think in terms of strategy, we, we did some good choice. Uh, it's not easy when you're leading, but uh, the guys uh, back there, they did some, uh, some good decisions. So, yeah, no, uh, Al is driving, and I hope we can keep that advantage. Obviously, uh, it's not going to be easy, but we'll do our best. And as you know, we've got a brand new category, the LMG T3s. How are they to drive and how are you feeling with the car? Well, you know, GT3 is not completely a new category for us. It's true that LM GT3 is a bit different. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we got uh, familiar with that Porsche quite quickly. Uh, it's really cool to drive. Um, and, you know, as I said, I, the cars that you are doing good results with are always nice cars. So let's hope that uh, we can keep that uh, idea of this uh, Porsche GT3 and um, GT3. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sarah Bovey from Brussels in Belgium and uh, spending a, a season away from the ELMS in 2023 to concentrate solely on the World Endurance Championship. But they're doing both campaigns this year. Now. It's going to be a busy year. Cars. Yes. of course, in the WC. Porsche here in the European Le Mans series alongside uh, with uh, the uh, friends at Proton Competition. So it's a kind of merging, if you like, or a mer it's, it's a merged program between two big teams, the Ein Dames, Ein Links, Prima efforts and Proton Competition, as it was in GTE. So it's a big adjustment for pro level race drivers from GTE to LMGT3, principally with the, the difference in performance characteristics. Not a massive difference in lap time, Johnny, no. but the way in which that performance is delivered, particularly under braking, very different indeed. Well, also, and I'll be interested to catch up with Sarah later on in the season to see how the behaviours of the old Porsche from last year, which was a GTE car. And a mid-engine car. Well, precisely, that's what I was going to make the point. They switched it around. They rotated the engine and transmission so it's gone from a mid-engine Porsche to uh, the more traditional flat six hanging over the rear wheels. Colin Noble here with Alessio Rivera now having to give best there. That's second place in LMP2 Pro-Am. Good to see Colin Noble getting his chance in an LMP2 full season effort here. The 22 and that I think is the 20. So that is the Pro-Am. Algar Pro Car, and hands now Richard Bradley. Great to see Richard back in full time racing here in Europe. And meantime, nose to tail Oof. contact and then into the side of the Lamborghini for the 21 United Auto Sports cars. That was a fair old shove as well. Yes, that's Axel Jeffries, the silver rank driver in the 63. So that's about 1,300 kilos of Lamborghini that you're bouncing off. Yeah, he just uh, didn't cost him a place. He stays second, so it's Iron Dames, Ryan Lynx and Kessel Racing. Takeshi Kamura is still aboard that car. So he's done way over 
his minimum time. So yeah. this will be about just setting him in, getting in the drive time, getting to the point where strategically it works for the team. I think that's the big problem. They pitted earlier than anybody else because of the, the door mirror problems and we're assessing that. So he will have come in at the just short of an hour, I seem to remember, when the car didn't necessarily need a full tank at that point, topped it up. And that's rather boxed them in there to the next step in the race as the United Order Sports car wanted the pit lane entry road there and almost didn't get it, but does at the last minute dart across to the right-hand side without contact and into the pit lane entry road, which is just before turn 14. Meanwhile, the number 43 car is right over the grass. There is the 21 involved in that tussle we saw a little earlier and the Merrick aboard the car. He will stay aboard the car at this stop. So Matoma Maiata leads the race two seconds. Oli Colbert hanging on in there. Marino Sato broadly the same kind of gap being maintained as well. Car 86 is under investigation for not following the race director's instructions here. Well, that's not car 86, that's car 63. No. 86 is the GR racing car. What caused that for Andy Merrick into the side of um, Axel Jeffries was the nerf he got from the APR car behind. So it was real pinball action, I think. Nose to tail contact from was that the, was that the Bradley car then, the number 20? I think that's right. Yes. So Richard Bradley into 21 of Andy Merrick, who's now pitted, and then Merrick into the side of the bright green Lamborghini from LMGT3. And here is Andy Merrick getting new tyres. While we're watching the end of that pit stop, leading LMP2 Pro-Am is the Richard Mille by TDS car. 20 seconds or so ahead of the F Corsa car. It's Gregoire Saussi aboard that car. It's a rear clip change for the 21. So whether or not uh, that's a result of that nerf. Almost certainly, I would think. Yeah. Because the front, the, uh, the nose, the front section of Richard Bradley's car will look rather second-hand as well, I would imagine. So, LMP3, meanwhile, in the hands still of Julian Gerby. And the number eight Team Virage car, 17 core cool racing team, Miguel Cristavo. Second, DKR Engineering's Duquesne. The number four car of Alexander Machel is third. And Alexander Pakantov in the 88 into Europol car sits fourth. It is still there on Dames uh, that uh, is leading LMGT3 from Iron Lynx is. Now, Axel Jeffries pedalled Lamborghini. Just as I speak, a change for third. Conrad Lawson, another dad and lad effort. Johnny Lawson handing the car over, the 50 car over to his son, Conrad. Goes by Takeshi Kimura. And uh, I think you're right, that strategy is not playing out the way they'd hoped. This is the change in position. Putting the Formula Racing car. This team, by the way, from Denmark, obviously serviced by they, of course, are previous champions in the GT class here in the European Le Mans series back in GTA days. I think about 2015. I think it was exactly 2015. Uh, was uh, Mikkel Mack as part of the Mikkel driving Mack. lineup as well? Yes. Yeah. So here's the work taking place on Andy Merrick's car. So, as I said, a thump from the rear, but also then it clattered into the side of Axel Jeffrey's Lamborghini. And I think that's the, you know, it's the front left yes. that's receiving the most attention. It possibly bent the steering arm because it was a big old whack. And he would have been turning as well, which is never a good place to have that side-by-side -side contact, is it? Yeah. The wheel exposed. So it's a track rod or, or steering rod that uh, has been buckled, and that's always quite tricky to actually get to as well. Thumbs up, generally speaking, though, from the mechanics looking at it at United. Andy Merrick still in the cockpit, turning the wheel in one direction and the next to make sure that it is responding accordingly. The 27 Nielsen racing car heading towards the end of its lap. This is the ninth placed LMP2 in the hands of Nico Pino. Fabio Shearer is about 1.7 seconds further back. Extended period of green flag running here, Johnny. And Miata is pulling away a little from Ollie Caldwell. It's been down to 1.3 seconds. And hovered around the kind of 1.7, 1.8, now 2.7 seconds. Wally Colwell is hanging on there, is still edging away from Marino Sato in third. Is the Duquesne car all just to touch the rear of Alessio Rivera's 83 as he goes through? Is that four position? It is. Jean Baptiste Simonat 
who's already been or already ended up spinning on that section of the track he before has. so he was slightly more tentative this time approaching the rear of Alessio Rivera it wouldn't be a change in LMP2 pro am but it would put uh, it would be a change in the overall positions the 77's carrying a bit of damage now as well front left dive plane slightly skew if i notice for proton competition rene binder running around in fourth position in pro-am as the frantic work in the united autosports garage continues on car 21 which has now slipped way back on the timing screen in amongst the lmp3s so severe lack of progress there 86 Ferrari for GR Racing. And uh, the relatively low pitch compared to previous screaming V8s that we've had in Ferraris of old. Down the inside of the door, mirrorless 57 car guy car. So that is Takeshi Kimura losing another position. And he's lost another two to Matt Griffin this time around. So Takeshi Kimura heading to the wrong end of the timing and scoring page now. Ricardo Perra initially getting by in the jet black with the orange piping 296 and as you say the green and white livery for spirit of race puts Matt Griffin now ahead of the Japanese overtaken by a couple of LMP2s at the same time there's a P3 in there as well in fact but there's the 23 United Auto Sports car running in 10th place for Fabio Scherer but it's the cool racing car of Ritoma Miata who is not exactly dominating this but establishing a, a decent lead of 2.3 seconds well, here's the, the key thing is we've got two uh, uh, into Europol cars on pit lane now they're on a P3 car and the 34 car coming in from what was fifth position we're now into the position where we're waiting to see just how well these new additions to sports car racing LMP2 racing can manage the other part of this, which is consistency, looking after the car, looking after the brakes, looking after the tyres. Matoma Miata, very experienced young man, but this is a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, the longevity of sports car racing is uh, some of, sometimes its oh, biggest attraction. Trouble, trouble for the number 12 car, as uh, we just had a quick look of the number 34 car going to be repositioned in its pit stop. So uh, the number 12 car was stationary there. There's still Torsten Kratz aboard that car. Closing in on two hours at the wheel of this car. Aboard now our race leader, the 37 car in the hands of Ritoma Miata. Highly rated young man. Not least, of course, by Toyota Gazoo Racing. Sweeps by the racing spirit of the mom, Aston Martin, on the start-finish straight. And Ollie Caldwell is closing again now, you know. That gap is coming down a little. In Britain, who spent a year with what was a quite troubled LMP2 effort by Alpine, not just for Ollie, but for the whole two car teams. Just not the bike we expected to see from the Signatech pedals pairing as they prepared to come back to Hypercar, as they did in convincing form at Qatar with the new 424. So Nicole, well hoping that this effort will remind people of his pace and he's showing at the moment with that little bit of traffic he's closed the gap to under two seconds again top two runners in lmp3 are now in i'm expecting these to be longer stops now so you may catch a glimpse of the team virage number eight and the cool racing car number 17 with very little work being done on them that's because they're allowing one minute and 45 seconds to tick by sending the car just before it's completed to make sure that as the car re-emerges it's spent a minute and 45 in pit lane yeah, this racing Colin Noble on the way out so this is an interesting little battle this is the number 23 United Autosports LMP2 class car of Fabio Scherer but in his mirrors he's got the LMP2 program leader and that is Gregoire Saussi The Richard Mille by TDS car. Oli Coldwell pits now. So Euro International, just going back to the subject of LMP3, Euro International have made two stops, but that latest one was a quick one. So they still owe us the 
their second one minute and 45 second stop, which is mandated in the regulations for this weekend. So that'll put the Euro International car with a little advantage over Team Virage's Bernardo Pinheiro now. That definitely was a long stop from Virage. Cool racing for Cedric Ultramar. Did a minute and 27 last time in, so that's not a long one either. It's kind of no, neither fish nor foul. So Team Virage, although they've lost track position, are in a good spot now yep. because they've got their long stops, both of them, out of the way. That is one to watch later in this race. Interesting part of that battle, by the way, between Fabio Scherer and Gregoire Saussi. Gregoire's chasing United Order Sports. That, of course, is Saussi's WC team. He's part of United's effort in LM GT3 with McLaren. Yep. Now, just watching the 57 car is on pit road. They are not replacing the doors in that car. Or are they? Now they do. You can't see it on the pictures you're getting. Now you can. And interestingly, it is the passenger side that has been done now as well. So clearly they feel that uh, enough lap time's being lost with the lack of visibility. I think they've only done that side. I don't think they did the other door. All right. Well, I would imagine that driver's side would have been a priority, unless, as I said earlier on, they want to do one during one pit stop and one on the other. But... Well, OK, I can sort of understand why actually the driver's side isn't necessary if you can kind of peer out to the left. But I do know they're buckled into these cars so tightly that they yeah. wouldn't allow you to look fully over your shoulder to your left. That's Esteban Masson is aboard that car for the first time. So Takeshi Kimura did, well, all bar seven minutes of half the race. So now and something like 54 minutes, one of the United cars running wide there as it tries to get around the 35 ultimate car, that is again the 23. And Gregoire Saussi has passed that car, so the LMP2 Pro-Am leader, and the 29 car from Richard Mille by TDS up into eighth place overall now. So through the final corner will go the 23 of Fabio Scherer. It's Ritoma Miata who leads in LMP2, but all change in LMP3. Virage have just done their two long stops. Let's catch up with one of their drivers now. I am alongside Julian Gerby, driver of the number eight team, Virage. You've just jumped out of the car. That was a, a really long stint from you. Uh, how was it feeling? Uh, yes, it was, it was hot in the car. Um, I had to do at least uh, one hour 45, and uh, we did our first stop quite short, so Normally we shouldn't be able to make it with the fuel, but luckily I just had to save fuel during my whole stint, so uh, I did not have to be at the limit, but yes, it was hot. And you guys actually won the championship in Michelin Le Mans Cup last year. You and Gillian are back together as teammates. Are you hoping to replicate the same and win the championship again this year? It, it wouldn't be a bad thing, huh? <laughs> uh, no, we, we really... That's our objective, of course. We have Bernardo with us, who is a very young, talented man as well. I think we are a, a, a trio which get along pretty well. So, so yes, we, I think we have our chances, but you know, the season is long, anything can happen. Uh, let's see first how is it go, how it's going in the next two hours. Best of luck, thank you. thank you. Yeah, the end of the season feels a long way off, but it's important to get points on the board as early as possible. Only six races, remember and with great consistency from so many other of your competitors within the championship you can really only afford one duff result through the year otherwise you have to be performing well and ideally on the podium at all the other five races yellows briefly at turn one so someone's had a bit of a drama julian joby by the way super bloke and uh, team virage with cards on the table on each of the rungs of the ladder in this uh, package european amon series the Michelin Le Mans Cup, and of course, with huge success in the Ligier European Series. Champions last year with Mouner Stefan. And before that, with Gillian Andrion. And uh, as Steph absolutely correctly notes, reigning champions in the Michelin Le Mans Cup with Gillian Andrion, who's now on a treble, basically. Up the inside there, neatly done from Conor and Larson. And he grabs second place from Axel Jeffries, so it's now. Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini. Yeah, so switching around a reasonable amount, although the Iron Dames crew still 
very pleased with where they're sitting at this stage. Conrad, Conrad Lawson will represent a different kind of threat, though, from Formula Racing. And now that he has squirmed free of Axel Jeffries, he'll have 0.8 of a second to try and find to catch the bright pink Porsche. This is now the battle for second place with that uh, pit stop from Oli Caldwell. Marino Sato sits in second place, 28 seconds back now, by the way, from Rituma Miata, who has been caught by Russia De Giris. 23 car. Another front clip we're hearing changed there. It's going to be a stop-and-go penalty as well for that car, so they'll be coming in again for causing a collision, one would guess. Which was that? That was the uh, P3 car, wasn't it? Uh, you have to remind me even more than that. I'm going to read through the... Uh, it was contact with car 12, so the yep. WTM machine. And, yes, there was a spin at turn 12, wasn't it? That was, yeah, it was where it absolutely 12. was. The 12 cars uh, corner. So it was mm -hmm. Torsten Kratz. And who was driving the 23 at the time? Scherer. It was Scherer. Yeah. In comes the leader. Ritomo Miata, he will stay aboard the car. He's going to be 10 seconds added as well to car 24. For not obeying the race director's instructions. May well be another one at turn one that's had a wide moment. That's the, the Nielsen Racing car, isn't it? The 24. The Matra imitation livery, new for Edex Sports. That car coming into pit lane in the hands of Richard de Geras, who was a real star in qualifying yesterday, although still a tenth and a half away from Ben Hanley's superb pole position time. And now just starting to inch its way through these batches of LMP3 cars, if not for position, but to, to try and just clear some more traffic, is the number 25 car of Ollie Caldwell. There's uh, more penalties coming. Latest is uh, five seconds added, again for race director's instructions. And that is car 86, the GR racing car, currently now to Ricardo Perra in a fine fourth place right now. Something pretty. But, uh, that's going to hurt their push without a shadow of a doubt. 28 car is just about ready to go. Meantime, on board with the number 40 car engineering car. Car well, six six with uh, Belen Garcia, local driver. The one female driver we have in LMP3 this year. At the moment, therefore, the best placed female driver in the overall field. So what's uh, happening here is that is the DKR car number four very nearly piling into the back of the car immediately in front, which was the other RLRM Sport car. We've lost one. Nick Adcock drives the other in fifth position. Damage Evidence the of the damage on the 77 Proton competition car. Yeah. And I don't remember when that happened for Rene Binder, but it had already slipped down the order a little bit after a good opening couple of stints from Giorgio Roda. So, Inosato. Pits from what was second place, clattering across the curbs there as the AF Corsa car makes its way by the Euro International Ligier. Still on board with Belen Garcia here as up the inside goes. That's the 24 from Nielsen Racing. The mirrored livery effort there. We talked a little bit about the new liveries for the. Uh, Durable cars, but it's a similar mirrored livery effort for Nielsen Racing. The 24 with the white front and the what do you call it kind of burgundy, orange, peach rear end. And the other car, the 27 car, is the opposite. 27 car, just the LMP2 effort. Anthony Capino is currently on pit lane. Ellen Garcia, who will know this place like the back of her hand, I think she's originally from Vic, which is just up the road. We passed signs for Vic on the way into the circuit. So, Catalan driver and well used to single-seaters, getting more and more used to sports car racing after a couple of seasons in the ACO rule set. 
running currently in sixth position, Garthia, with Nick Adcock just ahead. They're all trying to catch Matthew Richard Bell, although the Euro International car has a really big lead of... It was 41 seconds a moment or two ago, and it's actually been sliced to back to 36, but that is because Euro International still need to do a third and the second of their long pit stops to come in, whereas others' cars around them, a bit further back on the timing screen, can make it should close. be able to get make that time back up again. Again, this is one of the great things about uh, LMP3 racing, is that you're not really sure, are you? The seventh car pushes on, and with the other cars around him now pitting, Lieutenant Meata is back to lead, and Ollie Caldwell is right there still, just three seconds back, so we're game on again. Vlad Lomko, Arthur Leclerc, and... Alessio Rivera, all three of those cars that uh, currently set third, fourth and fifth on pit lane. Monco just emerging now, about 30 seconds back from the lead battle. There is Nick Adcock then, away in the distance. Also, Belling Garcia needing to be wary, though, that a quicker 77 car, still driven by René Binder, will want to get by. So she'll probably just open the steering up, there we go, on the lead into Turn 5 and allow Binder through in the braking area. But carrying damage on the front left corner, I don't think they replaced that at Proton, probably thought they that uh, Binder can drive around. I can yeah, still, still lose, isn't it, on the front left it, corner? Uh, yeah, showing in shot there, there's Baron Gracia. Yeah. have got closed here. It's ahead, Jean-Luc Luc Foubert. Pits, the number 31 racing spirit of the one car. So that's these other two P3 cars here, pit two. This will be effectively the battle for fourth place next time around. Looks to me as if Thea is catching, catching, catching. Just ticked over the halfway point, by the way, inside the final two hours. And Ritoma Miata uh, will be completing his drive time in the not-too-distant future, but they've got to make it fit within the stint lengths as well. Everyone has to do a minimum of one hour, but now that we've got to, in some cases, gold and platinum drivers, you can kind of keep them in for as long as necessary. Just make sure that your third and final driver gets their full 60 minutes as well. Brief glimpse there of the 60 Proton Porsche of Matteo Cressoni. Will Amp, by the way, the 21 from United Autosports we saw with what we think was damage to the front left. That car is still in the garage. Getting to the point now where rejoining may well be futile, unfortunately, because uh, so much time has been lost. Uh, we saw Matteo Cressoni behind the wheel of a Porsche last year did we or is this the first time that he's moved he right? was in the uh, G the uh, GTE car wasn't he but that was with Iron Lynx rather than with Correct. Proton it's uh, a name that you would normally associate with Ferraris back with the German mark for this year GT LM GT3 still led by the Iron Dames and their Porsche number 85 but at 11.30 this morning we unleashed these 43 cars onto the Barcelona asphalt for the first race of the season, the four hours of Barcelona. It's become a regular fixture at this venue and traditionally towards the start of the season as well. And a good getaway from the pole-sitting car of Philippe Ugrand in the United Order Sports 22. Paul Lafargue trying to cut across the bows, but Matthias Kaiser uh, was able to hustle his way into those top positions as well. One or two running wide down the escape road, having been put there and also ending up in the dirt. And there was an early spin for James Dason in the number five RLR M Sport LMP3 car. Hint of contact there just at the edge of frame. And James Dason was able to rejoin, but actually not for long. More on that in just a second. Robert Kubica installed into the AO car from TF, but uh, they have really struggled to get into the mixture of the top few cars in the first couple of hours. Side-by-side -side action between inter-Europol competition and cool racing, the 47 car on the inside line ending up in the dirt, and a terrific restart 
for the beginning driver Lorenzo Fluxa in car 37 on Philippe Ugran coming out of a full course yellow and it might well have been a couple of tyres on the grass there from the Spaniard but he forced his way through without any contact and Lorenzo Fluxa would lead all the way into the opening pit stops. Plenty of action as well in LMGT3 in the early stages. This was an awkward moment between Cool and Vector Sport, which saw Ryan Cullen into the gravel trap along with the Cool Racing driver Alejandro Garcia, and eventually Ryan Cullen would be pinged uh, for a penalty for that. The 50 Formula Racing Ferrari in the its burgundy colours jostling nicely with Mike Wainwright in the number uh, in the GR Racing uh, Ferrari. Number 86, that's since been taken over by Ricardo Perra. And the car guy Ferrari had already lost one of its door mirrors while that was the right side one going bang as well after a side-by-side -side glancing blow with a 15 RLR P3 car. Rather left Takeshi Kimura uh, blindsided, you might say. Couldn't see then the attack from Sarah Bovey and there was side-by-side -side contact as Bovey forced her way through into the first corner. A spin for Jean-Baptiste Simonauer, disappearing into a cloud of dust, and uh, that would scatter the field immediately behind. One door, and more importantly, mirror, has since been replaced on the number 57 Kessel Racing Ferrari for Car Guy, and that will help massively the new driver, Esteban Masson, as uh, Belin Garcia has been enjoying herself in the number four DKR engineering car, but it's the 11 Euro International of Matthew Richard Bell that leads LMP3. Sarah Bovey, now Rahel Fry, taking over the Iron Dames car. That is your leader in LMGT3. In LMP2 Pro Am, it's Gregoire Sosi in the Richard Mille by TDS Racing car leading number 29. And Ritoma Miata having taken over the 37 Cool Racing car leading the race outright. So this is the order after 72 laps. I know that some online timing is a little bit behind this, but we have completed 72 now, and the gap three seconds between Ritoma Miata and Oli Caldwell. Vlad Lomko in third in the number 43 into Europol competition car ahead of Richard de Guerres, who started on the front row, and Marino Sato. LMP2 Pro-Am is led by number 29, Gregoire Sose for Richard Mille by TDS, ahead of AF Corsa's Alicia Rivera. And Colin Noble for Nielsen in the 24 is third. LMP3 now pitting, in fact, but Matthew Richard Bell in the pits, but leading by 25 seconds as he does so for Euro International Car 11, ahead of Bernardo Pinheiro for Team Virage number eight, and Cedric Ultramar for Cool Racing number 17. And there are the Iron Dames, 27th overall in the Porsche for Rahel Fry now, the Swiss driver taking over for the middle stints. Conrad Lawson is a further 26 seconds back, but remember they're on different strategies for Formula Racing. Axel Jeffries, Ricardo Perra complete the top four in LMGT3 for Iron Lynx and GR Racing, so that's Lamborghini leading Ferrari. And the massive scoring tower tells us we're still under green flag conditions here at Circuit de Barcelona, Catalunya. Into the second half of the race we go, Graham Goodwin. Uh, yeah, fabulous stuff so far. Plenty of wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. A little incident. So crowded track out there, but uh, still plenty of our top runners in contention for worthwhile finishes and points here. Not particularly, not not to at least, of course, the overall leaders. Otto Miata here, not managing to drop Ollie Coldwell. Still 2.6 seconds is the gap. It's not going to take much for that to come down to nothing. That is the visual gap. And as Caldwell clears the Cool Racing number 17 car, gets back onto the tail of Ritama Miata. The 37 car, we still have Melty Jacobs to come yep. in the final two hours for the 25 Alex Lynn. So Peugeot test driver and reserve driver versus Cadillac factory driver to come for those two cars. And frankly, we could carry on all the way down through the top 15 and there would be much the same story, Johnny. There's an absolute galaxy of talent once again here. Yeah, some phenomenal CVs, either in their past or potentially where they're going to go to next as well. And uh, the European Le Mans series provides this uh, fabulous uh, 
place to race if you've had great success elsewhere in motor racing disciplines or you might be a star of the future and somehow we managed to crowbar all of those uh, different types of driver into the same championship across four different classes there's the 43 car turning left which is running in third position with Vlad Lomko at the wheel and Richard de Guerres very much there in fourth position and just to note your international just clearing pit lane Matthew Bell still at the wheel of that car but uh, they have just posted one of their long pit stops yeah so I think is that both of them that done should now? be both indeed yep. whereas uh, Virage well it was interesting to me that Julian Gerby, as the Astons are absolutely side by side, Julian Gerby suggested they did a quick stop initially. I think I had that down as one of the long ones as well. I'll double check on that to see precisely where the position is of the number eight car. There's now the 59 racing of Spirit of Le Mans. Aston tries to get up the inside of the TF prepared one, the grid motorsport example in the green for this weekend, the dark green versus well, the lime green for racing Spirit of Le Mans. It's Johnny Adam, factory driver, against Casper Stevenson, who of course drove GT versions of this car in the FI Rolling Jones Championship with D Station Racing. So Casper back in on Aston Martin for the 2024 season. Quite right, it's the two big beasts, great looking cars. 47 car on pit road now. This is the delayed cool racing car. Fred Vesti brings the car down pit lane. This after the clash with the uh, Vector Sport car, wasn't it, early in the race? It's still together on time in the scoring, running 19th and 20th, 13th and 14th in class. This there is the battle between. Grid Motorsport by TF, Johnny Adam, Casper Stevenson, Manu Collard, the Peter Pan of sports car racing is right there. Doesn't look any older, damn him. Since you first met him 25 years ago. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe longer. Uh, there's a 77 car with still visible damage. Front dive plane nowhere near where it should be, and that will be affecting the performance of the car for Rene Binder, but he's keeping it in third position by a nose because Colin Noble now right with him for Nielsen Racing car 24 for the Edinburgh man. Just a note by the way, the 21 United Autosports car has rejoined the race. So we're back up to 42 runners at this point. The only retiree is the early exit of the RRM Sport number five after James Dason had a torrid time in the first 15 minutes. Yeah, unfortunately for Andy Merrick, he's 17 laps down now, but this can be useful as just track time and creating uh, some data perhaps for future races. The next round is uh, just at the beginning of the next month, less than a month's time, in fact, 5th of May, for the four hours of Le Castellet. GR Racing's... GT car allowing some of these uh, these battling LMP2 Pro-Am traffic to head through. So Ricardo Perez still at the wheel of the all-black Ferrari. And Axel Jeffries is about nine seconds further up the road. So we're, I doubt we're going to see him from this on-board footage. But Perez's major concern is fending off Matt Griffin, who's a further four and a half seconds adrift. Really deep, throaty sound from these Ferrari 296s now. Uh, right over the ripple strips goes Ricardo Perra into and out of turn 13. So this new look for the European Le Mans series with the LMGT3 cars joining the fray. Thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, that's very wide indeed. That was three cars wide and four wouldn't quite go. I don't think they saw him coming there. Well, that was the Panis car all over the grass. So it was, it was three LMP2s, wasn't it? It was. It's the Iron Lynx Proton car that made it through the number nine car in the hands of Pacero Capietto. And that car is fifth place. The Panis car was trying to go to terms, and it's the Duquesne car that is the lapped car of Jean Baptiste Simonard. Got a pretty torrid time. Up the inside this time goes the Panis car to take that. There we go. We can see that from a slightly better angle. That was the police car trying to get onto terms with the 
number 30 car. Came to it a little late, didn't we? Yeah, but, uh, all the shots. dirt in the background, though, is uh, indicative of uh, Artur Leclerc having two wheels right in the in the weeds and very close to the concrete pit wall as well. Anyone hanging a pit board out there would have had to have uh, desperately brought it back in again, break, breathe in, and hope that uh, when the dust clears that all of those P2s are still pointing in the right direction, which thankfully they were. And Artur Leclerc continuing in the number 65. Aston Martin's almost tripping over one another again, and Matthew Richard Bell wanting to get by to not lose any time. That's this Adam Alley now, in fact. This is the change, Casper Stevenson up the inside there of Johnny Adam, and that is a change of position between the two Aston Martins. And as that happened, Adam Alley was able to squirm free in fifth position in LMP3. Johnny Adam, by the way, has pitted immediately after that. Uh, looking further down the timing and scoring, 66 of JMW Motorsport. I think that car is in trouble. That feels like a long pit stop to me. Okay. Yeah, we're not getting a counter on it at this point. It was a minute and 33, which was absolutely fine the last time that car came into pit lane. I'll see if I can find out when the 66 of Phil Keane actually began this latest stop. But uh, probably not going to plan for the JMW Motorsport crew. Still very much a battle at the front of this race. This is the battle for fifth between the nine, the 65, the 43, Capietto, Leclerc and Monco. But uh, the front of this race, the gap is coming down again. It's down to a single second again between Matoma Miata and Oli Caldwell. But that battle is not slowing things up for this pair because they are romping away from Rechard de Geras, the lead export car in third. Yeah, De Geras is no slouch, but, but absolutely not. But I don't know. Sometimes I find that the, the qualifying pace that the Frenchman can offer is not necessarily replicated in the race for whatever reason. And Edex Sport will be frustrated that they can't stick with the top two runners that are only separated by half a second. I mean, here you have it. Cool racing, the dark grey or silver compared to the sky blue and uh, with the black nose of. Algarve Pro Racing and Ollie Caldwell, who has just been on an absolute tear since taking this car over in the pit stop. Yeah, and uh, by comparison, by the way, LMP2 Pro Am, the lead battle there between Craig Marsossi and Alessia Rivera, is a gaping two seconds. Absolutely massive compared <laughs> to point four. Aston Martin back in the race, still being driven by Johnny Adam. No, there's been a change there as well. Lorcan Hannafin taking over the grid motorsport by TF Aston now. Was with JMW last season, was he not? So, and it's Matuna Miata has got that air of a driver looking to put cars between him and his nearest competitor. Holly Caldwell has stuck with this task beautifully. So, a little look down the inside from Caldwell. He wasn't close enough, but the confusion, slight confusion provided by the 88 into Europol competition. P3 of Kai Aski might present the opportunity because Caldwell's going to go tight through the corner and they're absolutely side by side but Caldwell's already got the lead wow. unless late on the brakes can Miata can go down into turn four but no Cracker. no opportunity whatsoever I did wonder whether the mere presence of the 88 might provide that opportunity and Stuart Cox very happy with that indeed yes not indeed. wanting to face the camera because he's laughing so hard that, that was a cracker Ollie Caldwell will have been pleased with that one. See it again. It was just slightly balked, wasn't it? By the P3 car, but uh, move done. Clean as a whistle. And uh, cool racing. Well, we can see there in the foreground with the Danish flag on the side of his helmet, Milton Jakobsen ready to go. Well, this has got some twists and turns to come, hasn't it? Hour and 40 minutes to go, so 100 minutes remaining. And it is going to be Melthy Jakobsen versus Alex Lynn. Also, side by side between these two cars to the outside line will go Richard de Geras and get third position away from United Autosports. So Marino Sato appears to have no answer to that either. And the switch around for third position. You mentioned they were similarly close. Well, 
what can uh, now that Gagiris has been put in front or has got himself in front of Marino Sato, can he attempt to just chisel away at that 40 odd seconds? The problem is they're not far away any of these cars from needing their next pit stop. Yeah, a couple of match pairs then behind that, it's one, two, three, four, five cars separated by I think it's four or five seconds for fifth place, sixth place rather. As always, just a tiny error from drama and things being turned on its head. This pair trying to negotiate the number 17 cool racing car. That car sits, by the way, second in on MP3, 21 seconds back from the charging team Virage. And it's got a handy minutes gap on the third placed into Europol competition car, Kayaski. Got Pro Racing lead the race, Cool Racing, Edex Sport, United Autosports, Iron Links Proton, Panis Racing, the top six. Then it's the two into Europol cars with Vlad Lomko, who's dropped back into seventh from being in that top three battle. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, pretty close to Clement Novalak, his uh, fellow into Europol competition teammate, if you like, they're in different cars, different initiatives, different projects, but. Uh, they will certainly race with each other where possible. 0.8 of a second separate the 43 from the 34. And then it's Nico Pino a further second and a half back to the high line. They have to go around the LMGT3 Ferrari, this scrap for third and fourth positions. But in fact, Richard de Geras chose the left-hand side, the correct side to lose as little time as possible. And Marino Sato not quite close enough to take advantage of that. Caldwell now with 81 laps in the book, 1.8 seconds the margin over Ritoma Miata. So not only has he caught and passed the Japanese, but he's now opening up a decent margin as well. Alex Lynn looked like he was sort of starting to get the race suit on in the near future. And uh, Mitoma, or rather Caldwell, can't be that far away from completing an hour long stint. So depending on when that car next needs fuel, they may be looking to get Alex Lean in as early, uh, early as possible, despite Oli Caldwell's uh, supreme pace at this point. Can't really judge the readiness or otherwise of Cool Racing with Melty Jakobsen. Melter wears his race suit and his helmet all the time, just in case he gets the call for Peugeot. Who it's really everywhere. the 23 United Auto Sports car at turn seven. Car 23 has suffered uh, the odd bit of delay here and there, including a clash with the Wachenspiegel team Monschau LMP3 car, for which Fabian Schirer was penalised. Fabio having to serve that penalty as well, so that's dropped the 23 further down to 15th position. Behind Johnny Edgar, who is new to the championship as well, having come out of FIA Formula 3 racing. He was a race winner last year. So you've got uh, this program alongside his IMSA WeatherTech Sports Cup program, and Ligier P2, scoring a fine fourth place at the Sebring 12 Hours for Sean Creech Motorsports. Chat with him at the beginning of the week and uh, looking forward to quite the season. A man from Cumbria, in the north-west of England. Yeah, lives uh, very, very close to the karting track at Raura, if you know your karting, and uh, that's where he began his motorsport interest, but has since then uh, spread his wings significantly from that. Here is the Porsche that leads LMGT3 for Rahel Fry. Windscreen clean, but uh, no driver, so no Michel Gatting. Yet. Um, we'll have to drive. Think, well, yeah. Um, and I'm thinking there's only an hour and a half left. But they're sort of out of sequence here, aren't they? They are. So it might, be a, it might be a short stint here for Rahel. And their combination is bronze, silver, gold. So with that, Michelle's going to have to do... Well, it's actually only a maximum that they have to worry about for the yeah. gold. So Rahel, minimum of 45 minutes, but she can happily do longer. And 
I mean, Michel could just get in for five minutes if necessary. They well, won't the good, obviously the good news leave it till that. James is that they're on exactly the same strategy as the two cars following them because they're on pit lane as well. Formula race against Peter Race. Matt Griffin has made his way up into third. Fine run, by the way, up to fourth at the moment from Casper Stevenson. He's past the 63 Iron Lynx car. And Mike Wainwright back in the GR Racing car to complete his driver time. So that was dropping the GR Racing car out of that lead battle. If we don't get any more intervention, though, that could very easily see the uh, 85 Porsche run till about half an hour still to go, 35 minutes. So Michelle Gatting could have a very quiet afternoon. That was a change. That was uh, Nick Opinio going ahead of Vlad Lomko, who looks out of sorts at the moment. I wonder whether or not that's a tyre issue for them, whether or not they've just burned up the best of it. Yeah, tyres. Nick Opinio, it is, but... Uh, has moved up there. Meantime, the international moving up in LMP3. Adam Ali ahead of Kayaski. Back into podium contention for the first time in a wee while for the Italian team. Well, 76 laps done in the LMGT3 part of the race. Formula Racing rejoining for Conrad Lawson. Axel Jeffries was only 11 and a bit seconds away uh, from, or will be, from Lawson as he rejoins. Yeah, let's say at the moment the lead battle is going out. Oli Caldwell is now almost six seconds clear of return on Miata. Marino Sato, though, is beginning to make moves towards that battle. So Sato, 34 seconds back now. That uh, gap has been over 40 seconds recently. David Perel has just taken over the 55 Spirit of Race Ferrari from Matt Griffin, so that car now back into the race. I think he will go to the end from here as well. Yes, yes. Again, you see, it, it, it's about making sure that the minimum drive time for the silver is done. Now, it's only 45 minutes, so taking over with an hour and a half still to go is plenty. As long as he does the rest of this stint, and that's absolutely fine. They could even afford to switch back to Matt Griffin if they wanted to. But speaking to the boys just a couple of days ago now in the paddock, I get the feeling that their, their lap times are so close, it's probably not even worth doing the extra driver change. Just keep David in all the way to the finish as long as he's happy to do 90-plus minutes. I'm not sure, by the way, that was correct that um, Mike Wainwright was back in that car. Because all of a sudden, I don't think I saw that car in pit lane. Ricardo Perra is the GR racing car. And another monitor, I've got a picture of a smiling Mike yes. Wainwright that does not look as if he's been in a race car lit recently. No. Well, I think, he st I think he did all of his time at the start of this race. Yeah, but we've had a Perra stint since then, haven't we? Because he only needed to do an hour and a half. We're now two and a half hours into the yeah. race. So I think Perra took over pretty much at the 90-minute mark. And the car's just pitted again, has it? Not sure it has. I think it's maybe about to pit. OK. Well, the, yeah, the, there was the situation with the safety car, which generated maybe an extra stop, even though it wasn't a full one. We'll keep an eye on that. Meantime, Oli Colwell is edging away. He's basically doing unto Miata what Miata did unto him. And putting tents on. Five and a bit seconds, only going one way for Ollie Caldwell. There is Mike Wainwright, speak Mike of the Wayne devil. Wayne. So he is firmly now back to monitoring the team. It's his team, GR Racing. Yes, indeed. And uh, headphones on, making sure that his guys are doing the best job possible to try and hustle a podium out of this. Well, they're not a million miles away at this stage, running in fourth position. This is a battle between Matteo Capietto and Arthur Leclerc. And that uh, battle is for fifth overall at the moment. Top nine cars are LMP2 class cars, then we've got four LMP2 programs in the overall order, headed still by Greg Massossi, who still has Alessio Rivera right with him, so it's been a cracking run here from Sosi. This is his LMP2 debut. 
turn 12 a couple of moments ago. Was there a clash between these two Ferraris or is this just a move for position? David Perel versus Esteban Masson. And it is Perel going uh, by and, and confirmation, by the way, with a look at that side of the 57 car, they've not changed the other door. No. Neatly done there by the South African. Coach what? Dave, as he's doing in the sim racing world. <laughs> And also, though, the 11 car kind of getting involved. So, now, was this sequence through the t 7 and 8 before Perel eventually got by, or was this a following lap? Because it's, it's still still ongoing. <laughs> and Perel, I can tell you now, is in front of Masson, but it's taken maybe a couple of laps and several corners to finally be decided. Gap, by the way, for the lead in LMGT3 between Conrad Lawson now and the Formula Racing car. He is 34 seconds back from Rahel Fry. Axel Jeffries is a further nine seconds back from the Formula Racing car in his 63 Iron Links Lamborghini. And Ricardo Perra, nine seconds back from Axel Jeffries. I think that was a timing glitch. I don't think Mike was back in that car. So Massio Capietto battling hard in the fifth position, car number nine with Artur Leclerc for Panis Racing and the lights flashing from the car up ahead. That Coldwell then, a full lap, no, it wouldn't be a full lap ahead. 25, not in this, should Coldwell be somewhere is, in second, is sector two. a lap clear of Rennie Binder is the first car off the Indeed. lead lap. So which of the Algarve Pro cars is that then disappearing? It must be the 20, I would think, Richard Bradley, yeah, who's just gone into the final sector now. Whereas Ollie Caldwell, well, should be in that vicinity too, and about to cross the line. So Capietto versus Leclerc, both going by the Aston Martin, now being driven by Lorcan Hannafin for Grid Motorsport by TF. And he has a nine second lead over Casper Stevenson. The two Astons were properly side by side for a, a number of laps earlier on in the piece, but they've become separated now. Rahel Fry still comfortably leading the category by 33 and a bit seconds over Conrad Lawson for Formula Racing. As Axel Jeffries completes the early podium slots, we still have an hour and 26 minutes to go, and here is the second place car within LMP2 and overall for Ritoma Miata and yeah. Cool Racing. Here comes Milton Jakobsen. So this is the final driver change for Cool Racing's 37 car. Good stint from Miata. He'll be frustrated he lost the lead in that, but uh, stuck with the programme. It will be battle rejoined pretty shortly. Holly Caldwell, of course, will jet off here. But at some point, he too will have to make his way down to Pit Road. And that will be for handover to Alex Lynn. Pit stop, meanwhile, for the third place car in GT3 from Iron Links. The 63 Lamborghini is under investigation. Normally, that suggests something's been spotted that uh, is outside of the regulation set. So, sometimes bad news will follow a message like that. They're just checking it at this stage. We'll keep you posted. Third position for that bright green Axel Jeffries driven Iron Links Lambo. And rejoining, or is this the continuation of the fight? No, these two cars have not been in the pits yet. No. Artur Leclerc has got ahead, though, now of Massio Capiato. It looked like Leclerc had just come out of the pits because he was so far over to the right-hand side. Both, in fact, the pit side of the blend line. You are able to cross it if you're already on the racetrack. And the 65 finally makes that move stick on Capietto. Great stuff. In comes Ollie Caldwell from the lead. So it was a 1 minute and 29 seconds stop from... My apologies, no, it wasn't. It was. Where are we? Jacobson up back to 1 minute 16 for the Cool Racing squad. There was the change with Alex Lynn climbing aboard the car. It's two tyres only, it may well be. Quick stop from Cool Racing. Melter Jakobsen out there, and now, of course, closing this gap. They're on their marks, ready to go. The fuel hose is detached, and now this is where the tyre staff 
launch into action. Rackhamton at turn 10. Not brand new Goodyear Eagles going on the left side, but I think it, you know, they're going to do all four, four corners. Well, Jacobson, he's through turn 12 now. And these won't be the best sets of tyres yet, if they're going to do another the second, tyre change. The second or so is delayed there as the other APR yeah. car comes in. 37 is coming through turn, thir uh, turn 14 now. If we get the longer run here, you will see just exactly when this lead battle is going to emerge. I think the answer is that the gap has been closed. Capietto versus now Nico Pino, by the way, for fourth and fifth positions as the Iron Lynx car goes a tad wide, and that might be the opportunity for the Nielsen car to dive down the inside line and put Capietto a further place back for Iron Lynx Proton. I think Cool Racing only changed two tyres on that car. Well, that is two cars wide, 23, and... The Pro-Am Virage LMP2. She's the number 19 of a certain Nelson Piquet Jr., by the way. Car started by Tony Wells. So you think two outside, left-side tyres for the cool car? Uh, the, the answer is they, they pitted 12 seconds quicker than the Algar Pro car. I don't think that's a full four tyre stop. No, but it definitely was for Algar because we watched it happen. Indeed, so. but Milton Jakobsen is ahead of Alex Lynn by yes. about five seconds. But Alex has got new rubber on the right-hand side as well, and chatting to Ben Hanley before we got going today, he did say how important it was to turn those inside tyres, the right-side tyres, on as much as possible because you've got a lot of left-handers through the tricky technical middle sector. Turn five, turn six, turn seven, where you're going to be leaning on that side of the car an awful lot. It'll be left side tyres, at least initially, for the Duquesne car, which has come in in the lower reaches of LMP2. John Jean-Baptiste Simenauer, car number 30, and also in pit road is Richard de Guerres for EDEX Sport in the number 28. Here's the class leader in LMP3, Tim Virage's Bernardo Pinheiro, who was a massive star last year in the Ligier European Series, teammate to George King in their cars, and he's actually done the double step now, the Portuguese, missed the Michelin Le Mans Cup entirely and gone straight into ELMS, which is uh, some doing. Uh, unseen by you on pictures here, but I can tell you that there's a rear clip change for the Duquesne team car, the 30 car, that's had its wars, Jean-Baptiste Seminar. He's been uh, involved in a couple of scuffles, hasn't he, in his stints? But uh, they've changed the rear clip on the 30 car, and it's back out into the race now. Marino Sato leads at the moment from Arteo Leclerc. The gap is about 45 seconds between the United Autosports car and Palace Racing, but they both owe us a stop. This is our leader in LMGT3, Rahel Fry, 33 seconds ahead of Conrad Lawson. Hour and 21 minutes to go. Still waiting to see Michelle Gatting aboard this car for the first time. I think she'll only get about 35 minutes, Michelle. I think you're right. If, if they do the full uh, stint, yes, I think you're absolutely yeah, right. Well, unless, you know, the uh, an intervention into the race, i.e. a full-course yellow or a safety car, sends them away from that more traditional strategy, then surely you're just running out of fuel and then top it up. I mean, there's an argument for pitting slightly earlier than that in case there is a late safety car, and at least you've done your pit stop by the time that caution is called, but it's very difficult to, to work out when exactly that's going to happen. Blistering early pace here from Jakobsen in the 34 nines. I'm looking against that, but Alex Lynn quicker still, 34-2. There's a gap between them and cars between them, the two leading two cars in LMP2 Pro-Am separate the two warring cars that will cycle round to the lead again. But it will be Jakobsen that leads from the Algar Pro Man. This could be quite the finish, Johnny Palmer. We have said that so oh, many times nice. through the, the history of the European Le Mans series, though. I reckon this is my tenth year of calling these races. Really? Happy, yeah. happy anniversary. Thank you. Well, we're not quite there yet. We've got to get to the end of this year to do the full set of uh, a decade. But um, if they never cease to amaze you towards the end. You think a race is starting to settle into a pattern deep into hour three, 
And then the final, well, 45, even sometimes half an hour of a race, just goes completely bonkers. Absolutely right. Alex Lynn, by the way, has made his way past uh, Alessio Rivera, so as the camera opens up there, there is Lynn. And he's a further place up, because he's also gone by Gregoire Saussi, so he's now up to fourth overall. So the gap between he and Jakobsen is Nico Pino between the two and about seven seconds. Marino Sato it is that leads, but that is a car that owes us a pit stop, and this is United World Sports ready for a pit stop. Sorry, that's apologies that for on. Misidentified the rear end of that car. So okay, uh, here we go. The tyre, thankfully, the team didn't misidentify it. They're working on the right one, and it's stickered tyres for certainly the left side there. How many teams can have the luxury of that, of, of tyres that they've not yet touched all weekend? So, see, out of the 29 car, I'm sure the Richard Beale by TDS squad will be very pleased indeed with his efforts. In a battle with Alessio Rivera for much of that stint and was not humbled in any way by it. So drive through penalty, by the way, for car number nine. That is the Iron Links Proton car. A car on its way out the pits now, and that is not the drive through. But no. Caroli just aboard that car. So whether or not it was speeding on the way in or on the way out, we have no idea. But either way, Matteo Caroli will be back in for a rumble down the pit lane. Yeah, it's only just been announced, hasn't it, that penalty, so they wouldn't have been able to react to it, and they desperately needed fuel anyway. So they'll get three laps. You're allowed to cross the line four times before it gets slightly more serious if you haven't reacted to the penalty. Now Kessel Gibson. Racing and Proton are not quite nose to tail, but Cressoni just starting to turn up the wick behind Esteban Masson. Jacobson and Lynn trading lap sums here into the 133s. 133-1 from Jakobson, 133-3 from Lynn. Still with Nico Pino between the two. And uh, Alex Lynn with the Chilean driver. This change comes here for the AF Corsa car. It leads LMP2 Pro-Am. Marino Sato pits now. Plus, by the way, Alessio Rivera, I'm not sure we mentioned this, had the fastest lap of the race which earlier on at 45 with a 130.174. Remember these cars featuring some 40 brake horsepower more and a bit of a weight break as well, too, here this year in the European Le Mans series. Up to 580 brake horsepower from this Gibson V8. So back up to pretty close to where they were at the start of their career. All sorts of changes have come the way of these LMP2 cars. It's uh, quite close to their design weight and power level. It's gone up and down for a variety of reasons, but principally the process of what's called stratification. In other words, keep the classes apart with the hypercars coming aboard. But uh, in the European Le Mans series this year, we'll see them running much more quickly, something over a second quicker in qualifying than last year, which was the only year we've seen them on this format of this track, with the deletion of the chicane, which is up to the outside. The two Aston Martins trading paints. Nice. Don't mind a bit of that. Now and again, side-by-side -side action. They have nothing to do with one another. One team from Switzerland, the other one from the UK. Green Motorsport to just knock down a position. Two young British drivers, though. True. That was, uh, Casper Stevenson, Lorcan Hannafin. Here is the 37 car now back into the lead. And the gap, having cleared that traffic, because Alex Lynn has long go now gone by the Nielsen Racing car, it's pitted, Nico Pino too. It's 9.4 seconds. That's the gap to watch from this point forward, Johnny Palmer. So down into the braking area arrives the race leader, Malta Jakobsen. Car 37 just exiting turn 10 and 11, that hard stop at the end of the long straight next to the giant grandstand, which unfortunately is closed this weekend and uh, pretty much for the next few weeks as the preparations continue for the 2024 Spanish Grand Prix, not held till June this year. That's always a May race for me, but it's actually the weekend after June this year because of reshuffling 
of the Formula One calendar, and they're going to stick a roof on that uh, grandstand and bring it all up to modern spec. So frantic work continues this weekend. But it does mean that a lot of the crowd, therefore, have been given the main stand that overlooks the start-finish straight as one of the only options for a view of the whole track. And it's been absolutely crammed full of fans it has. this People weekend, not around. just today, yeah. but People yesterday too. around for what... Uh, so the, um, few points they can find, but uh, they've gravitated in the heat of the day to that main grandstand, and it's uh, made for quite the spectacle. I said at the start of the broadcast it was great to hear the appreciation being given to the podiums of the Michelin Mon Cup yesterday evening. I've no doubt we're going to get the same again for this race, which has another 64 minutes to go. So yeah. 74 minutes to go. This is a, an awkward moment for the 34 into Europol competition car of match uh, of uh, Luca Giotto, I should say, because wedged in amongst quite a lot of traffic there. And also, following that pattern, is one of the two APR cars. Might be Alex Quinn, actually, if it's got the sky blue number panel, rather than Alex Lynn. Lynn is 8.1 seconds adrift of Malta Jakobsen. To take the second out of Jakobsen since yeah. he cleared Pino. So even more reason why that was not Lynn, because he would have been delayed, if so, through the traffic. That was just a patience game. Through turns 10 and 11 for Alex Quinn. Back into the race goes Will Stevens in the Nielsen Racing 27. And that's uh, the outlap done. He's just ahead of the Richard Mille by TDS racing car of Matthias Bech. And here the two of them are. So 10th and 11th overall. But for Will Stevens, it's ninth in class. Matthias Bech, second in class. And the Swiss is trying to find Mathieu Vaxivier further up the road in the 83 AF Corsa. Penalty coming for the third place car in GT3. It's the Iron Lynx Lamborghini. Five seconds will be added, and that's enough to put them into the clutches of the GR Racing Ferrari. It sits fourth at the moment, only 1.5 seconds back. So that is good news if you're a fan of black and orange Ferraris. Bad news if you're a fan of bright green Lamborghinis. 7.1 seconds now, two seconds clawed back by Alex Lynn. Ben Hanley's on the charge as well. He's now aboard the number 22 United Autosports car. On pole sitter, and he will have been given the instruction to light it up and go hunting. Jan Vanutet, now aboard the 28 car from Edex Sports. Rob, I think I'm right, was his... Um, GT World Challenge debut last weekend at Paul Ricard. And put a car on the podium, might well have been one of the two Aston Martins here because they're both cars that were from the same Comte Racing stable as Job was at last week. It's the brief shot there of Mark Scaife. No, not that one. <laughs> it's the TM, or rather the other one. I'm not quite sure what Mark's title is at uh, Nielsen Racing, but uh, very much a trusted lieutenant on this expanded Nielsen Racing effort with two LMP2 cars this year, of course. Now, Matthew Jakobsen, I think, must be in traffic because that gap has just come down to under five seconds. Remember, it was 9.7 when they cleared the traffic. That's a 135 for Melta. Just trying to pick out there is indeed traffic there for the Young Dane, and that was a touch of the rear between the DKR car and AO by TF. Who, to be blunt, to this point have not featured Johnny. No. No, and uh, the AO car is in fifth, so that's Pretty a little better. Place, it's just come into the pits, yeah. though, so that's part of the reason why it's further up, because it owed us a pit stop compared to some others. Nip and tuck here as well. That's the race leader in LMGT3 looking to clear a bit of traffic. Manu Collard, who will be doing a similar lap speed, I'm sure, to Rahel Fry. Yes, that's that's uh, clearing of lapping ninth. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they've not necessarily had the luck, the 51 crew, earlier on in the piece. Charlie Samani and Uli Depau. I don't think we've seen Depau behind the wheel of that car just yet. 
Uh, he has to be careful not to exceed the maximum drive time as he's a gold That's of an hour, and 15, an hour and 15 minutes. Well, he could yeah. do that from any part time now because we're an hour and 10 minutes. Or under an hour and 10 minutes. So Edgar in in the 14 AO by TF Sport car and that'll be Louis Delatraz that uh, will be taking it over. Oh, big squirm under braking for the 31. 31. That's a racing spirit, Le Mans car. Was there a touch here? Antoine Ducat. Oh, was it just too deep into the braking area? It was yeah. just too deep in. And that could nearly cause a massive Did problem for the Pro-Am leader, Mathieu Vaxavier, who could very easily have gone off into the gravel in sympathy with nowhere to go. Vaxavier had to drive towards an LMP3 car in the hope that it wasn't going to be there by the time he got to the corner. This could be quite the final hour. So, still with us for the beginning of this. Want snacks, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, get it now. Yeah, you've got about eight minutes, I would suggest, to get yourself settled for the final hour. And we'll do a reset, we'll do a quick run back through the highlights of the opening three hours then. Big, a lot of opposite lot required for the 24 car of uh, Albert. Costa there, working his way through the first sequence of corners. Yes, the, the final stint for LMP2s could be as much as 40 minutes out from the chequered flag. LMGT3 is fascinating for me because we've still got this perhaps this chance that Iron Dames will pit with only about 35 minutes to go. On the other hand, they might want to get Rahel Fry out within a, a fuel distance, which should be about 60 minutes. So will they pit the car still with fuel in it, just top it off, and then back time Michelle Gatting stint to the checker? I think it comes down to the trust they've got in Rahel Fry. She's got a sizable lead here, 29 seconds. There is no point in risking that in a strategy to give Michelle more if they don't think Rahel is going to lose that time. Yeah. At the moment, she isn't. Yeah, but so many teams say they prefer to get their pit stop done as early as possible within the pit stop window, just in case there is a, a safety car that will bunch the field up. It's more likely to be a full course yellow, I suppose, at this stage, but it really depends on the nature of the problem on the racetrack. And let's keep our fingers crossed that, uh, if anything, we can stay green to the finish. But if we end up with cars off in the gravel and they are susceptible to being collected by other cars, then race direction may be given a little option but to uh, neutralize the race via a safety car it's fascinating stuff here in this lead battle oh and trouble for the 19 car what was i saying trouble for the 19 car off. off in the gravel now this might force the hand of eduardo freitas and the rest of his team that's nelson pique jr it's the first corner so What's was this a result of, of contact Coming out of the right hand. Oh, so contact with the DKR car. DKR P2 car, that looked Correct. like. Which was being driven by whom? That is Lawrence Hoare. OK, so Lawrence Hoare giving PK Jr. not too much space on the exit. And the that car now in the gravel. Well, this is the time to pit if you suspect it's going to be a full course yellow or even worse, a safety car. He's not going to get the car out from there, Certainly is he? Certainly not. So it's going to have to be towed, and they won't want to do that with traffic at full racing speed. It's just a big question as to whether the gaps are retained or not. It's, it comes down to, <laughs> can that be safely done under a full course yellow? With cars going by at 80 kilometres per hour. Road there. Yeah. But it's 80 k's, 50 miles per hour, which is still shifting, even at tur turns one and two. The other problem is it's a blind turn. Yeah. But that you could say that cars are less likely to end up in that gravel trap. It's sort of a quirky accident that has resulted in that. They're more likely to skate off into turn one gravel rather than turn two. 100 laps done, by the way, by Malta Jakobsen and others in the 37 car. The gap, by the way, 3.8 seconds. It is going to be a full course yellow, and that is going to be coming in just over 30 seconds. We'll hear from Eduardo Francis, I've no doubt, shortly. So that will definitely be the favoured outcome for Cool Racing because at least starting the full course yellow with a 3.9 second gap, that should be kept. If everybody slows down at the same rate of knots and then tootles round at 80 kilometres per hour until 
Piquet Jr.'s car is extracted. Is this is another angle of it. It's so Laurence Hoare in the orange and white and black DKR. There was touch there, and then in he goes, and he was into the wall. You could effectively say he was spun out. We're um, now into full course yellow. So Laurence Hoare may be misjudging precisely where the front of his car was and thinking that he might be able to tuck in behind the Brazilian, but the merest amount of contact. But, of course, the cars are on the ragged edge of adhesion there. It doesn't take much to spin them around like a top and into the gravel, into the wall for Nelson Piquet Jr. And this was slowing down for the full-course yellow. How late do you want to leave it? 77, that was. Proton competition for Bent Viscal. That, by the way, was the 63 and the 86 who are in contention. Axel Jeffries and Ricardo Perra for third place. We know that uh, Axel Jeffries' car will have to serve an extra five seconds. Hopefully this can be quickly recovered to the racing surface. There was debris from that car, so hopefully, and it did hit the wall, it was a side slap, wasn't it? So hopefully no further damage and PK Jr. can rejoin. But we are 63 minutes from the end of the opening race and great to see so many people sticking with us here. It's on the balcony above the press centre. And he has indeed rejoined the race. That's great news. So we're going to be getting back to green flag running very quickly. Well done to the marshalling team here and the intervention teams here. Follows the race director's instructions to take that wide line by the look of things. Well, that's uh, an idea of the scarring down the left-hand side of the car after it went sideways into the barrier. As you say, it was a fairly face-on slap into the barrier rather than one corner going in first. I'm sure you'll feel the differences, though. We'll back to green flag running in 30 seconds, so well done, everybody. Yeah, terrific. And 3.9 seconds should, theoretically, be 3.9 seconds still from Malta Jakobsen back to Alex Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how well they went into the Code 6, and I'm talking in the style of 77, Bent Viscar, like proper on the lop stocks and, uh, and two feet on the braking pedal, and then uh, accelerating out of it can be so crucial as well, because Martin Jakobsen wants a clear line of sight. He's going to struggle to get that because he's tucked right in behind the LMP3 leader of Bernardo Pinheiro. He does have clear road in front of him, though, now. And we'll have to wait until the timing split at the end of sector one to get a true gap between he's, Jakobsen and Lee. He's definitely done well out of that. I think it's around seven seconds. I apologise, 4.8. Yeah, so like not 3 .9 million miles, maybe, a, maybe a second or so, but there are cars between, three cars between the two warring LMP2 cars. Green flag running we go to. The incident uh, we observed there between the 19 and 3 on surprisingly is under investigation and a bit more traffic for the race leader the 37 just the 187 overtakes so far for car number 37 that's not all Malta's doing Ritoma Miata prior to him and a terrific stint from Lorenzo Fluxer to kick things off there goes the LMP2 Pro-Am leader Mathieu Vaxivier in the metallic silver almost mirror effect for AF Corsa's car He's got about five seconds, by the way, of the Richard Mill by TDS car with Matthias Besch now at the wheel. Tom Dillman is between the two of them. But that's not done by any means. Here's the 17 car from second, I think it was. It was indeed second in LMP3. So this will be their final pit stop. Also waiting, Virage. Ricardo Perra got ahead of Axel Jeffries, by the way, there. So the GR Racing Ferrari is now in front of the Lambo. The Lambo ran a little bit wide at Turn 10, I noted, as the A, of course, of Axavier P2 was trying to get by. Final stop for our race leaders in on P3. It will be a driver change. Yeah. And as far as my records would go, this is, and it's looking like, the fast stop now. So they've done their two... 1 minute and 45, they're trying to get this 8 car in and out of the pits as quickly as possible, but they're having to do a driver change as well. Well, not helped by the fact that the P2 car is ahead of them, so they might have to reposition this car if they're doing it quickly. Yeah. So the, the clock is ticking, Adam Ali, as they came in, was a minute and seven seconds behind. Where is the number 11 car? The answer is coming through turn 12 now. Door is closed, they start with the tyres. 
Adam Ali coming down towards turn 14. Literally hurling the used tyres into the garage. Getting the next set on. So Levin goes through and into the lead. Whilst the left side tyres are done. This is the only time theoretically they'd need to do a stop this fast in the in the race. And actually the 19 is going to go in the garage, that's so that's going to provide a perfect exit for Fires it up. probably Pinheiro. No, they were doing a driver change, so Pinheiro must have got out of that car. And Julian Omrion getting on board. Henrion. Yes. So yet the 19 car, I'm afraid, into the garage after that uh, off into the wall. You can see the scarring there. But the plus side is PK Jr. is staying aboard that car. So your international take the lead in LMP3, but do owe us their final stop, I think, Johnny. Yeah. And the long stop as well. Um, no, the last one was a minute and 47. They've done actually three, haven't they? So it took them a while to do the second long one. But they possibly have done it by now, yes. So 4.5 seconds is the gap. We're aboard there briefly with Melty Jakobsen. 4.5 seconds behind is Alex Lynn. Cool racing from Elgar Pro Racing. United Autosports, Ben Hanley. Closing that gap a little. 26 seconds now. The up for Luta, a further 22 seconds back. So behind this pair, the gaps are fairly considerable. Under an hour to go. In LMP2 Pro-Am, seventh overall, Mathieu Vazavier still has Tom Dillman between him and the pursuing Matthias Besch in the 29 Richard Mill by TDS car. The gap in class under five seconds. We've got two cars, by the way, cars 27 and 29 warmed for cockpit temperature. It's a warm day here. But we need to be sure that that doesn't trigger the point where they are called in to sort that out. So that's 27 Nielsen, the Heinemar Hansen Pino Stevens car, and 29, which is the Richard Meal Pro Am car. But many hours ago, three of them, in fact, we got the new season underway for the ELMS with a very good start from Philippe Ugran. A couple of cars on the grass, though, in the background because they reached as many as four abreast right across the racetrack. And what was the ideal line into turn number one? Well, that was the tricky thing. You go tighter on the right-hand side, that rather compromises your exit into turn one, and you may not have the track space anyway, but... Jim McGuire, very happy to view that good start from Philippe Ugran, the young Romanian driver, new signing for United Order Sports for this season. There was an innocuous spin from James Dayson earlier on as a result of a, the merest bit of contact. I still can't work out whether there was a touch there or whether Dayson just caught the kerb a bit too readily, but the net result is the same. First, full course yellow to clear up his car, and then we got out of that with a killer getaway from Lorenzo Fluxa. On Ugran, the Spaniard far more alive to going back to green, and he also had that clear line of sight into the first corner. This was a clumsy moment from Ryan Cullen on Alejandro Garcia, which saw both the Vector Sport and the Cool Racing cars ending up in the gravel at turn seven, and Cullen would subsequently be pinged for that overtake, which didn't quite come off. Ferrari side by side between Formula Racing and GR Racing. And also, terrific battling at the front of LMGT3 as Sarah Bovey was slightly later on the brakes than Takeshi Kimura. Kimura uh, went down from two door mirrors to one to none at all after that latest clash with the number 15 RLR M Sports LMP3 car. One at least has since been replaced. They've stuck a black door on the right hand side of the ca uh, car guy machine and in turn replaced the door mirror in the process. Side-to-side -side contact there between Rahel Fry and the car guy Ferrari. This was an off for Jean-Baptiste Simonaur in the Duquesne car, trying to get up the inside of uh, another fellow P2 machine on the exit of turn 12. This is where the door was rehung on the car guy Ferrari to at least give the racing, the uh, new driver some visibility at the right-hand side. That was Esteban Masson who wanted to at least work out who was alongside him. Plenty of cars have gone a touch wide over the sausage kerb through turns seven and eight, including the then LMP3 race leader, 
and right down the grass for car 65, uh, Artur Leclerc being welcomed with open arms into the European Le Mans series, trying to go three abreast. Lead change here for Oli Caldwell getting ahead of the 37 car, and Stuart Cox very, very happy with that as Ritoma Miata fell down a place. Artur uh, Leclerc was slightly later on the brakes into turn number one. The Aston Martins have been hit and shouldering one another as well. So Grid Motorsport versus Racing Spirit of Le Mans. Lorcan Hannafin and Kasper Stevenson. And it was the Swiss run Aston number 59 that got the advantage there. Also 31, a very squirrely moment under braking in LMP3 for Jean Ludovic Fubert and the 31 racing spirit of Le Mans again in a bit of tri uh, troublesome moments into turn number one. This brought out the latest full course yellow. It was a nerf from Laurence Hoare, which spun Brazilian driver Nelson Piquet Jr. into the gravel at turn number two. But the 85 Iron Dames Porsche, Rahel Fry still leading in LMGT3. This is the current leader in, in LMP3 for Julian Omrion, who's just taken over the Virage car. LMP2 Pro-Am has AF Corsa's Matcha Vaxavier out front by only a couple of cars, mind you, and the overall leader is Malta Jakobsen being caught, though, by Alex Lynn. Because the gap is down to two seconds now between Jakobsen and Alex Lynn. Ben Hanley, superb performance yesterday in qualifying, may be waiting in the wings to benefit if it all goes awry ahead of him. He's third ahead of Jot van Outer and Charmi Lacey. LMP2 Pro-Am, Maccio Vaxavier leads that category, as mentioned, from Matthias Besch, and the gap is only four or five seconds, so Besch really on a tear. Third position in Pro-Am, Albert Costa for Nielsen Racing. LMP3, Henrion from Gael Julien, RLR M Sport in second position, and as mentioned, Iron Dames leading Formula Racing and GR Racing. As we're going to go to the Richard Meal camp next with TDS, and here is Steph. Back in the pit lane, and I am with Artur Leclerc, driver of the number 65 Panis Racing. Uh, first and foremost, welcome to European Le Mans Series. How are you finding your first weekend here? Hi, it's uh, it's great. I mean, it's a bit different than what I used to to do. Uh, there is a lot of traffic uh, in race that is quite hard to manage at first and a lot of my tyre management as you do to stint in the tyres, you pass, you pass one hour and a half on the same st same um, set of tyres, so yeah, it's, uh, it's quite different. And we know you're a bit of an expert in uh, single-seater formula. Uh, how different is the car now and how hard has it been to get used to it? It feels uh, more heavy, it feels uh, less grip of all, more, more tricky to, in the slow speed corners, but as well in high speed corners, there is a lot less downforce. So, yeah, it's a completely other way to drive, which you, you need to adapt, especially in a race run. The car is a bit um, different uh, things, but, uh, but yeah, it's still really enjoyable to drive. Of a new input of talent into the European Le Mans series after Leclerc and all sorts going on here, Johnny. That gap, the lead gap, is nothing. 1.4 seconds now, and maybe this is the point at which, in taking track position, we believe Cool Racing just took left hand tyres uh, on the 37 car. We saw not pristine, but four tyres going on to the 25, and we are pretty deep into this first stint and it's beginning to come back the way of the reigning champions in the 25 car. Yeah. In LMP3, meanwhile, Gideon Orion, you commented, is back into the lead. That's because your international have just pitted. It was a quick pit stop, so they must have burned both of their, Indeed. Yes. Uh, their, their long stops, but that's dropped your international out of the podium positions at the moment. The lead gap for Gideon Orion, by the way, is 19 seconds over Gael Julien in the number 15 on our M Sport car, Manuel Espirito Santo in the Cool Racing third, uh, 17 car, a further eight seconds back in third place. Yeah, I was about to say, before the 11 car came in, we were up basically on an even keel because all of the key players in P3 had already got their long, their mandatory uh, minimum reference time stops out of the way. So uh, you can forget about needing to do pit stops for a prolonged period. You can probably forget about pit stops full stop now in LMP3. They're all been set up to be back time nicely to 3.30 this afternoon because in another 50 minutes or so, 
the chequered flag will be appearing depending on where the overall leader is at that point. It will wait, of course, for the leading car. And is it going to be either one of these two machines? I wonder right down the main straight. How busy do you want it? Malta Jakobsen finding the inside line. And Alex Lynn is able to clear the inter Europol competition car just into the braking area as well. So he's now right with the Danish driver up ahead and trying to force Malta Jakobsen into a mistake. This is where you know, you, you take the time for changing all four tyres early on in the stint for the rewards later on down the line. Well, you know what, uh, Melter has been something we've been talking about a lot over the last two or three years, but this is the standard he's got to meet and beat. Alex Lynn is a current factory driver for Cadillac, and he's showing why he's closed that gap in masterful through the traffic. Uh, that's been a big part of it, whether or not the young Dane has got a tyre disadvantage here is pretty immaterial. He's got to do this on the road now, and this is head-to-head, wheel-to-wheel stuff. Yeah, through nine they go, and the track ahead is certainly not clear. Lights flashing to the DKR LMP2 car. So that's Laurence Hoare, sixth position for LMP2 Pro-Am. And as he clears the way for Malta Jakobsen, Jakobsen then presented with the back of the Lamborghini, which in fairness had to go through the corner at turns 12 and 13 at some point. And now Alex Lynn's caught slightly on the wrong side of the bright green Lambo, being driven by Axel Jeffrey still for Iron Lynx. So this is naturally the yin and yang of chasing another car and trying to hunt it down. On the balance of play and the consistent laps, you need to be able to uh, be catching it. But again, you're going to get a little delay here and there. He's got a delay there too, this time with Lawrence Hur. So how much is that going to affect things? This is great stuff. There's the other Algar Pro car, the number 20 car, which is currently running fourth in the hands of Alex Quinn. Nine seconds back from Albert costa Balboa in the 24 Nielsen racing car. Battle the third in LMP2 Pro Am. So Cox in the front of shot there in the team area at Argo Pro Racing. Now they clear traffic. Looking slightly better for Malta Jakobsen once more. The Alex Lynn car in clear air is quicker, and I think that is down to fresher tyres all around. But if Malta Jakobsen can get by some of these slower cars, at the more crucial points and leave Alex to delay that lappery, and that could be the saving grace. Next traffic for Malta Jakobsen is the other Algar Pro car, it's the 20 car. Alex Quinn in his own battle at the moment, could that be a factor? Let's wait and see what happens in a couple of corners time. They're coming through the final turn, we'll see Alex Quinn ahead of them. And this is the next car, the blue car, just going to the inside in traffic. So as they cross the line, the gap is 0.965 of a second. We've got a pit stop apiece and 46 minutes to go, Johnny, yeah. to savour this. Let's hope this one is a battle to the end because it's been a cracker so far. Well, when do they pit and do they decide to pit on the same lap? It might be a coincidence if they do, but once we get within about 40 minutes of the chequered flag, then they, well, I'm sure, will be in once more to pit as early as possible. And a sort of wry smiles from the various different carriages. And, it, and he's, if he's got fingernails, or if he had fingernails, he hasn't got any more. No. But this is cracking stuff. This is what we want from this LMP2 class, from this European Le Mans series. This is just race one of six, Johnny. I know. Well, it's for 25 points, but it's also for the trophy of the four hours of Barcelona, held annually. For, uh, well, you can actually track it back to the 1,000 kilometre races that were held at Montjuic Park, in fact, where the Grand Prix used to be held. It's much more recent here in Barcelona, since the early 90s. Yeah, the first traffic was actually not the other Algarve Pro car, but it was another cool racing car, and that did hold up Monte Jacobson a little. Not too much. Final pit stop for the Iron Dames, final plan pit stop. Tear off taken and installing Michelle Gatting. Too many antics there from Manuel Espirito Santo to hold up Alex Lynn. He was able to slice his way by 
at turn 14. Well, he's trying to work the gap to Team Virage. That, can, that gap is coming down. It's 25 seconds now. So Manuel Espirito Santo has given up potential for a win in LMP3. We are defending champions there, as are Algar Pro for the overall championship. So lots to be sorted here. And uh, Manuel indicating to me earlier on in the day that he would be held back as called racing's very secret weapon. There's not a huge amount of difference in performance in the 17 cruise drivers, uh, particularly between he and Cedric Ultramar, but he's more used to LMP3 having run for a full season already, whereas Cedric makes the move from the Delicia European Series into ELMS. 37 car, Malta Jakobsen at turn nine. This is lap 114, and Alex Lynn looking to try and clear another LMP3. That's the 88, oh, and there's problems here for the Iron Days oh, Porsche no. from, the, from the lead of the race. And it's as it was coming out of pit road, has not got any further. I don't think he's even reached the racetrack. It's off on the grass just after the timing loop at the end of Pitts Lane. What has happened there? And the Porsche, whether that's a heat soak related issue or something unrelated entirely, but Michelle Gatting, as we suggested, would get a relatively short stint. Well, it's going to be incredibly short by the look of things. Oh, she's got it going. She's got the car going. Well, it, it reset. It's rolling again. But she's, she wasn't confident enough to take to the racetrack, was she? Well, so something is it actually on the starter rather than horribly wrong the here. whole the engine unit powering back into life? It's not stopped on the racetrack, so we might be able to continue. But the, the worst news is that there's cars in the order behind her that are passing her on pit out. This is disaster. Smoke from the rear of the car as well. Not sure where that smoke was coming from. It uh, possibly looked more like um, oil smoke, maybe. Maybe. Oh, that is absolutely terrible luck. Clearly, there's still life initially in the flat six, but the car is dropping steadily down the order. You cannot afford to be sitting at, on the sidelines for this length of period. Well, David Perel was leading. You can see the car just pitting there in the background, but uh, it's not really long before we see the Formula Racing car of Nick Nielsen coming around. I don't think he uses a stop either. I think he's on his out lap. So this is going to be the race leader. What is the gap to Mike Wainwright? has got back in the car for GR Racing. This could be quite the result for them. It could. Well, I had a feeling Mike hadn't done his I, uh, an hour and a half. I don't think that that Porsche is going to be moving, you know. That oh, certainly not. I mean, she's tried to move it. It's inched its way maybe a couple more feet and stopped again. So it's either short of essential fluids or the, my other thought was maybe a wheel hadn't been put on it correctly and it's just spinning away, but we didn't get a good glimpse of the rear right corner, but that looked to be where the, the smoke was coming from. So Spooner Race and the 55 car are in this fight as well. How quickly can they get that car out? Right wing right on his outlap and in the final sector now. Nicholas Nielsen leads LMGT3. That car has also done four stops. Uh, David Perel's about to rejoin in what is show, being shown as second place, make that third though now as Mike Wainwright goes across the line to be the second place car in LMGT3. There's more bronze time to be born to be uh, well, burned though. Just noticed the Marshall's post getting the full course yellow board ready. If it did happen for that, it would be a pretty short one, I think. Yeah. But, uh, the gap, by the way, still a second. Well, you see, it, it's affecting pit out. It's not really affecting the route into turn one on the main racetrack, though. No, it's not. And she's done the sensible thing, Michelle Gatting, to park the car on the grass, quick thinking despite being heartbroken at the same time. And uh, horrible for the Dane to have been watching from the sidelines and thoroughly enjoying the efforts of Sarah Bovey and Rahel Fry and her first action, and the car will, will not restart. Well, the revised order, Sally Caldwell there with Stuart Cox. The revised order in London GT3, Formula Racing's Nick Nielsen leads the race from Mike Wainwright, now back aboard the GR Racing Ferrari. So it's a Ferrari 1 2 with Andrea Caldarelli now aboard the 63 car. Here is our race leader, it was, Matthew Jakobsen. This will be the final 
Routine stop. Is there going to be any change at all for anything? Is it fuel only? It looks like it's to be fuel only for the young Dane. Alex then goes through into the lead. 40 minutes on the clock. David Perel, by the way, has rejoined in fourth place and seven seconds back from the Lamborghini with the 60 Proton Competition Porsche right with him. Full course yellow is coming as well in 30 seconds, and that will be for the recovery of that Porsche. We won't want the risk of that track side. And 20 finish. seconds to go full course yellow. The greater risk, I think, is uh, the Porsche being collected by anyone who doesn't know it's there from the pit. We lane. are going full course yellow in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. So will it be pulled backwards we are into going the pit to lane pull the or car forwards towards the pit entry? To the, the team is road. informed that the car is treated as if the car is stopped on track. No one can approach the car. Yeah, so that is a message to make Cars sure. exiting the pit lane. Please be advised, we have people working on the right-hand side of the pit exit road after the 60-kilometer marker. Effectively a message to Iron Links, who run the car, to say you can't send mechanics up there to uh, pull the car back again and to it's be tended to. Park Fermi for them. Well, yeah. Sarah I mean, can do something about it. Yes. They can't. But, yeah, the rules of Le Mans, the rules of the ACO, the Automobile Club de l'Ouest, is that uh, once the car leaves pit lane over that white line, you're on your own. And uh, even if it is towed back towards the pit lane, into the confines of pit road, it still doesn't make any difference, as far as I know, because it had outside assistance. That is terrible, terrible luck. Not the first time, unfortunately, for the Iron Davis that they've had such terrible luck, but uh, terrible luck nonetheless. Well, this is a new car. They Obviously, that team has run a Porsche before, but not an LMGT3 machine. So is it the quirk of the new equipment, or is it just a, a straight failure that we've seen time and time again through the 100 years or so of motor racing? I mean, that is, it's the test of a car as well as the driver. The car is the only thing that does the whole race, remember. And uh, they do get rather tired, even in the fourth hour of a four-hour race. It's a hot, it's a hot day, yep. and components can start to melt or break. Well, remember, not that long ago, had that message from race control that says they've got concerns about temperature. We will temperature be removing full course yellow at 145300. At 14.53, we remove full course yellow in less than 30 seconds. So, let's have a listen and a watch. Was this aboard the Iron James car? 20 left? seconds to remove full course yellow. All sounding OK so far. Full course yellow will be removed in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3... Two, one, full course yellow has been that removed. That was it, wasn't that it? That's all she wrote. So, perfectly happy on the pit lane speed limiter, but as soon as Michelle depressed that, released that, there was just nothing beneath it. And now a DKR LMP3 car is that's in the, the wall. Yep. So, coming out of turns seven and eight, that's rotated, probably trying to get back up to speed out of the 80 kilometers per hour, and maybe a bit too much right foot. We haven't seen how that car has ended up there. But that is Wyatt Brickercheck in car number four, fifth place in LMP3. And the yellows return to the racetrack. Awkward position for Wyatt to be sitting. Was he nerfed from the rear? Let's keep an eye on the this 21 one. There is the 21 Pro-Am car is immediately behind. And it was, oh. it was, the, it was the Iron Lynx um, Proton car jinking out that sort of from spooked him into it. In comes the 25 car from the lead of this race. Yellow's been removed by the way it turned to, so Brigacek has got that car rolling again. Done well, because he would have had to have driven a little bit of the circuit in the wrong direction. But yes, turn eight is clear again, and we avoid uh, another full course yellow in quick succession. Now here is the question of the Jakobsen now. So having come out of the pits in fourth place, cars in between the two previous race leaders. 
will also have to pit. Where is the 37 now? He's coming through turn 13 now. Fuel still going aboard the Algar Pro Car. Still going aboard. Now turn 14. Now they go. It's going to be close, but not close enough. This is going to be cool racing back into the lead of this race. Yeah. And I think there's an improved lead. Yes, indeed, they have. There is Alex Lynn. So the pit stop times for those two cars. Cool Racing were on pit lane for a minute and three. It was a minute and five for Algar Pro Racing. Don't think that full gosh hello did Algar Pro any favours whatsoever. No, well they were nearing the end of the stint and of course a full course yellow then locks you out of the pit lane and it's not even as if after three laps of an FCY you can then access the pits a full course yellow is just don't pit unless you desperately need fuel and you'll be allowed five seconds of the nozzle being attached I hear what you're saying about the leader of the race changing of course the new leader is Ben Hanley, ben Hanley. but only because yes he'll be due a pit stop somewhere in the next 34 minutes. And this is uh, Jan Pernutia on pit lane for Elex Sports. That car just drops down the order as a result. They, of course, are still leading LMP2 Pro-Am now for the moment, up to fourth place overall. Second place in LMP2 Pro-Am. Take their final pit stop for Matthias Besch. Meantime, in LMP3, as we watch all this unfold, Team Virage, their gap is now 26 seconds. So reasonably comfortable, Gillian Henrion from Manuel Espirito Santo, as Michelle Gatting takes a look at the car. And that was a wheel nut. That it's was my other question. Nut. That was my other worry, was that were all the wheels put on correctly? Has it shed a rear right? That's where the smoke was coming from. And it's almost as if it was fine at pit lane speed limit, but as soon as you released the, the limiter and kicked the car into life, it just died because the wheel nut was not connected correctly. I mean, until we speak to the team, we won't know entirely what the problem was, but oh, very, dear, very dear. weird. That is so, so sad for the old days. There also, though, seemed to be absolutely no power. I didn't hear the, the revs going crazy no, in the engine. It was, so it was just really strange. So maybe that wasn't a wheel nut, maybe that's another component that's come out of the car that looks like one, but even so, it's uh, we get so used to the modern era of endurance racing where the car is just bulletproof. Well, on this occasion for the Iron Dames, uh, yeah, no further than it could be said in that, in that final hour. Paul yeah. Resto in the 23 car on pit lane. This is the whole leader for the time being, 32 minutes to go, but Ben Hanley will owe us their final pit stop, I'm sure of that. Deeper into this session, 26 seconds is the gap to Milton Jakobsen. Yeah. It's 12 seconds now for Alex Lynn. Well, that is a bit odd. Uh, car 60 under investigation, maximum release powertrain power. This is presumably a new thing we've got to get our minds around for the LM GT3 That's category. Correct. And there's Julian Enlauer, it's the fourth place car. In the Proton car. So this is about, and there's a problem oh. there for the 35 Ultimate car. They've not had the greatest of weekends. So it's actually, uh, we're just hearing about the Iron Dane's problem. It's a spare wheel nut that somehow got jammed in between the wheel that was going on and uh, the one they were taking off, or in between it and uh, the brake caliper. I mean, it's horrible luck, and clearly just a kind of... Well, I'm a sure foul we, during the, the pit stop itself. We've heard from Steph. I'm sure she'll get somebody at uh, Iron Dames to talk to us on camera. But uh, that was rotten luck. How did the ultimate car end up in the gravel at turn 12? Uh, sorry, turn 10. Well, didn't quite see that. I don't think I was looking in the right place, frankly. But anyway, the 35 car is stranded now with at least one of its rear wheels in there. This is the race leader in LMP2 Pro-Am. Mathieu Vaxavier bringing the 83. AF Corsa car in for its final stop. It's double yellows at turn 10 to protect the 35 car. And uh, Ben Hanley pits as well. Full course yellow coming, that's a good time for him to take that pit stop. Because he should be able to serve some of this time under full course yellow. We are going full course yellow in 20 seconds. Well, this is... 
potentially a very big win for United Order Sports. The fuel's going Prepare in. Prepare full course yellow in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. We will have a service being done at the exit of T at the middle of T10 drivers right in the runoff. They're we doing tires exposed there. They're doing tires on this car. Would they have done tires ordinarily if there wasn't a full so. course yellow? I think you're effectively getting a free tire stop here they for extra are. performance. It's only the outsides on the 22 that are changed. Yes, the 27 car. They are going to get out and retain a podium position here. Yeah and could be in a position to attack. Massively so. Because now where are their main contenders? The answer is Alex Lynn is just clearing turn two. United are going hunting here. Yeah. No doubt whatsoever about it. And why not? Because they would like... The, 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 the fuel fill would have been great to have actually bled into the full course yellow a little bit more. In fact, the nozzle had been released just as the full course yellow came out, but why not take a little bit of time more whilst everyone's going around at 80 kilometres per hour to get at least outside tyres refitted? I think we're going to hear after the race that Alex had some kind of problem in the first couple of laps out of that uh, pit stop because he lost a chunk of time. Could just have been some nasty traffic, but to me, it looked like he lost seven or eight seconds somewhere. OK. So if that's compromised his tyres, that will make Ben Hanley's task that bit easier. But it's going to be Milton Jakobsen, Alex Lynn, Ben Hanley and Will Stevens, albeit Will is some little way back in the Nielsen racing car. Just want to see how long, or much further back. We'll see that shortly. The 27 car behind the 22. Miguel Cristoval cannot watch this. He's part of the uh, initiative within Cool Racing and LMP3, and his man, Manuel Espirito Santo, is trying to hunt down the race lead. The problem for him, well, it, it's timed under co in, under uh, Focal's yellow, of course, so it'll be yeah. a lot slimmer than 46 seconds. We are removing, we are removing full course yellow and at it's 15, on the on. 0, 2 and 30 task seconds. Task we are removing full course on. yellow in 30 seconds. So we're about to get into it. We usually say it's the last 25 minutes. We are removing full to go. course yellow in 20 seconds. Apologies for being a couple of minutes out, but yeah, uh, you'd, sooner, you'd sooner take it slightly more action to Full the checkered flag than slightly less. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow ended. Full course yellow And the cool ended. racing car of Malta Jakobsen wanted clear line of sight. How about Ben Hanley's route out of the full course yellow? Well, it's not ideal because he's got the 60 Proton Competition Porsche immediately in front of him. Also, battle here for fourth in the LMGT3 class. David Perel and Julian Anlau. Remember, Anlau at the moment with an investigation based on the performance monitoring of LMGT3 underway. Green flags, though. David Perel, meanwhile, and a warning for track limits. So we're in at a sharp end here. That's 20 the 21 seconds. United car coming in. Remember, that was locked out of the pits whilst the, the pit lane entry road was closed because of the full course yellow. We've got 20 seconds between these top three cars with 26 minutes to go. We're going to Ben Hanley to clear a timing sector to confirm that. 122 laps done, plenty of full course yellow and uh, one safety car as well with the full wave by. That happened in the opening hour. But since then, thankfully, we've been able to retain the generally the gaps between those cars. A late pit stop, late ish pit stop for Nielsen Racing and Will Stevens will take him out of fourth position. we will drop him back a couple of three places. It's 30 seconds, the gap between the top three. 10 seconds is the gap between Jakobsen and Lynn. It's a further 20 seconds. So pretty clear the gaps we're going to be monitoring. Back to Ben Hanley for United Autosports. Jumping into it does indeed retake fourth, and I think the Wilton Racing car will drop further back down that order. 
So here, here comes Jakobsen. He now has a rear gunner in the form of Manuel Espirito Santo in the baby prototype from the same team. That's the LMP3 version. 22 seconds. Position. 22 seconds, by the way, is the gap in LMP3. And uh, Espirito Santo trying to attack Gillian Orion. And he's got 25 minutes to try to deal with that. Looking up and down the order here in the classes looks to be to be by far the closest in a current podium position is the race lead overall and that at the moment is going up just a little the gap to Ben Hanley has come down just a little car 85 under investigation for a possible unsafe release that's the Iron Bones well they won't really care about that anymore unless they have to take a penalty at the next meeting I suppose but they tend to be re uh, reserved for free practice sessions rather than affecting the four hours of Le Castellet itself. Nicholas Nielsen is the new LMGT3 leader then for car 50, Formula Racing, out front by 24 seconds over Davide Rigon. So it's uh, a couple of Ferraris and a Lamborghini flipping things around massively from Porsche domination and the Iron Dames. The next best Porsche is Julian Anlauer, who in turn might have potential issues with uh, too much power for that car or certainly not living to the regulations maybe that'll take some investigation the ATF car pitting from seventh it's not been the day they were wishing for we'll be going back doing some head scratching I think this is our race leader in LMGT3 and our overall race leader to get on track Hanley is catching, Alex Lid. Yeah. It's coming down, it's 7.4 seconds now. Sorry, 17.4 seconds now. Yeah, but the last lap around in the 133s, whereas the race leader's doing 134s and Alex Lynn at 135, so that 17 second gap between Lynn and Hanley could really come down in the final 20 odd minutes. Very easily. Fresh sure tires, Hanley's, remember. It's not sure Hanley's got quite enough to catch Jakobsen at this stage, that, but we could well have a change for second. That is an interesting one. I think they're just they're chasing the the, uh, the, the position. We'll take whatever comes to them. Certainly yeah. down to 16.7. It's coming down sector by sector. Ben Hanley has got a good car underneath him. Argar Pro Racing chasing Jakobsen, holding that gap. Mm. Yeah, the Peter Pan of sports car racing, Manu Collard. Is that trouble for the 27 car? On its way out of the pits. Definitely. Not anywhere near up to pace. And the 27 car. Well, that's not an outlap for Will Stevens. He's been around at least once before. But what is that related to? Maybe the pit stop they've just done. Were they able to get fuel into it? Or is it more of a, again, a wheel related problem, which we think is what affected the Iron Dames Porsche? But the 27, nowhere near race pace. Is, has the limiter stuck on? Because that's more like a full-course yellow-type speed, isn't it? Uh, one quick thing I'll just chuck into the mix here is, is it possible, we couldn't hear it, is it possible Michelle was told to stop the car? Yes. Yeah, we weren't hearing radio messages through that, merely what uh, she was hearing in the cockpit, I suppose. I mean, we are totally guessing, and it's probably best that we stop that, because uh, it could be all manner of things. But, namely, absolutely nothing any of the Iron Dames could have done about it. Uh, they played an absolute blind to that point, and unfortunate for Michelle that the first time she gets to do a racing stint in the four hours of Barcelona ends just metres after crossing the line. Uh, we'll say, by the way, um, and with thanks again to Stephen Kilby, GR Racing are racing along here. We've got two Ferrari factory drivers that leave this race because where we thought Mike Wayne Mike was in the car, they've had a drive and ID glitch with David and Recon. OK. What I still haven't got to the bottom of yet is whether Mike Wainwright did all he his did. drive time in his one drive go. That's no, confirmed. no, that's not the issue. Did he do his 90 minutes in one solid block? I believe so. Or did he get out and then back in after Ricardo Perra? No, we think he did it all in one go. Right, so two stints of nearly an hour long each. Yeah. Uh, might have been able to cut it short because of that where that safety car was positioned early on in the opening hour. Hanley still carving into Alex Lynn's time here. There's the 27 car. And crawled around. It's now 13.8 seconds, 12.8 seconds. Alex is going on with 
like this. New steering wheel being readied, so I do think it might be a limited problem. Did he do a did he do a full lap as an out lap at that sort of speed? And that was actually his second lap of being restricted to 80 Ks. I don't know is whether this steering wheel on the side here is the replacement or that's the one they've just taken off, but there's lots of movement around within the cockpit. Will Stevens the helpless party, really. Indeed. We're trying to get the engine restarted. So what's up for grabs here? Well, the wind's still up for grabs. It's 11 seconds, the gap between Milton and Jakobsen. And by the way, Cool Racing have never won in LMP2 in the European Le Mans Series. They've won in Pro-Am, but never in P uh, P2. I think they took a race win early on in their campaign in the F5 World Endurance Championship, but not in the European Le Mans Series. OK. Formula Racing lead in LMGT3 by just under 20 seconds, uh, Nielsen, uh, Nicholas Nielsen from Davide Regon. The last time they won in GT was in 2015, their championship year. So a decade ago, 27, I'm afraid, he's going into the garage. Yeah. And I'm not overly confident that they'll be able to sort the problem in the 19 minutes that they have either. Bit of a squirm there from Ben Handley. That gives you an idea of how hard he's pushing full-on qualifying speed here but it's tricky to do when the road is obviously far busier than the quali session yesterday with LMP3s and LMGT3s to get by he'll go over the line 13 seconds is the gap 13.7 seconds to Alex Lynn Alex Lynn is pushing on as hard as he can he is the, well, the traffic was costly for Ben there he was a second was. slower than Alex Ross is up for grabs here LMP2 Pro-Am Matthias Bersch chasing a near 20-second gap to race leader Mathieu Vazavier, AF Corsa from Richard Mille by TDS from the other Nielsen Racing car, by the way. Alex Quinn, fourth at the moment for Argo Pro Racing in Pro-Am. It's at the moment about the pace of these three leading cars. There is Melty Jakobsen. The other distraction that he really doesn't need at the moment is Charles Milacy trying to get the lap back on him. So uh, the 65 Panis car was trying to squeeze up the inside in the braking area for turn 10. That's the 47 car of Paul Luc Chatin, who's looking to try and stay with James Allen for 11th position. Allen has switched teams over the winter period, now with Duquesne, so in the black and the green of the French team. Indeed. And very close indeed here is the 47. It might only be for 10th place, but later on the brakes in a very different route into the first corner. The 47 will gain the spot. Does, does it meet entirely? It's Paul Luc Chatin there then to get ahead of Duquesne's car for 11th in LMP2, in fact, and 16th overall. And still places and therefore points to be gained here. Problem right rear of the... 27 car, we can see on one of our monitors here, the Nielsen car that is still in the garage, 17 minutes to go. This is a battle for podium position in LMGT3, and it is Andrea Calvarelli trying to fend off Julian Andlauer. Also got David Perel in this fight just a couple of seconds back as the export car looks to try to get by both these cars, interrupts the battle for a moment. But uh, Julian Andlauer not keen to have that interrupted, stuck right to the rear of the Oric as it came through. He's got another one to deal with now, but he'll take that corner and try to pile on the pressure for the Lamborghini man. Calderelli over the line, Andlauer pressurising as much as possible. We've not heard any more about the potential issue for car 60, but they may still be studying data as far as that's concerned. Chatting briefly on Thursday with Thierry Bouvet, who looks after matters of balance of performance and also how much energy per stint each of these cars can have. And yes, that is a thing, not just a hypercar thing in the WEC, oh, yeah. but energy per, per stint is a new LMGT3 uh, regulation as well that you have to be careful not to breach. The key to this, balance of performance, controversial subjects in motorsport but what it's given us is full grids and very grids One of the issues that have been long as it's real notice tell stuff now for this third place and i'm now looking for a way by one of the things that uh, has come up 
time and again in this debate is how can you trust the system? Well, one of the ways that they've decided they can trust the system is the live monitoring of what the car is doing. When it says it's producing more power, that means that what they're seeing on the systems that are available, looks up the inside there, there's no way through there, Julien, is that it is outside the parameters that the balanced performance offers them the opportunity to try to achieve. And that, Johnny Palmer, is the key thing. Yeah. Balance of performance, you can view it in two ways. Are they putting a glass ceiling on performance? Yes, they are, but they're tough to get to. The knack, the skill, the excellence is getting as close as possible to those parameters, as long as possible as you possibly can. Yeah, and the, that, that's where some creativity has to be left in the system for the teams to extract it. You've got to give the, the playing field for the teams to work out how to win these races rather than just stick them all on rails and you'd probably still end up with the same car winning every month as is the case with this championship so present a puzzle and uh, make it solvable and ideally in lots of different ways now that is a section of bodywork from the rear of an LMP3 car if I'm unless I'm very much mistaken you're an amazing spotter of these things hey and it's that one I'm there it is yes it's that one it's the WTM car which is now missing its rear right cheese wedge or Bullet. Well, as that had a drama in that uh, being lost, has been an incident that's involved that uh, car. The first, I'm afraid, for them. They've not had the cleanest of races, and it's not always been their fault. So the yellow flags at turn 12, the yellow's removed at turn 12, but where was the debris? Because that was in the middle of the racetrack. It was indeed. And uh, it could very easily be collected. It's on the straight it between is. turns 9 and 10, in fact. Don't want to be collecting that. There is the Jakobsen going through. Gap has come down for both second and third. Gap to second down to 9.4 seconds. Gap to third, 13.2, but they're not going down quickly enough at this stage. Completely different lines being used on the exit of Turn 10 if you're in a GT car compared to uh, a prototype mainly. The LMP2s are going really wide uh, to then be delivered into the apex at Turn 12, whereas the GT cars are basically straight lining that link road. Position and the size of that debris, I would be surprised if we didn't see an intervention for Yeah, that. well... Obviously, those that make these decisions want to stay green they do. for as long as possible. It's 12 and a half minutes, and we are going to prepare ourselves for a full course yellow. So there's your answer in less than 30 seconds. And let's hope that actually retrieving that is relatively simple. I don't know where the nearest marshal post is. 20 seconds to full course yellow. So, a couple of minutes maybe, if that. Prepare for full course yellow in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow, full course yellow. 9.1 seconds the distance between Malta Jakobsen and Alex Lynn. It's 13 and a bit seconds. Lynn to Ben Hanley, a very brave marshal, out to the middle of the road to collect the WTM bullet and uh, it's taken literally seconds He's to do. got a fantastic new door wedge for his shed. Perfect. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. Prop it open for those tomatoes. Absolutely. Uh, meantime, watch that, uh, watching here. Well, that was right after the clearance of the debris. Still, the pressure being applied by Julian Anlauer on Andrea Caldarelli, although there's now an LMP2 car sitting between them. No overtaking permitted, obviously, during a full course yellow, but also 80 kilometres per hour as the maximum speed. 11 minutes to go. So we had a gap, first to second of nine seconds, and, well, it's showing 13.3 under full course yellow, so it's going to be tighter it's, than that, so isn't it? I don't think he's, he's cleared the second sector yet under full course yellow, uh, that's maybe, why. Maybe Hanley has not. No, I think you're right. There you go, that's, that's just cleared at 22.7. So it's added nearly 10 seconds to it. So it's going to be pretty quickly back to green flag running, unless there's another matter that needs to be sorted. Mathieu Vaxavier to Matthias Besch. Now together on the screen. We are removing full course yellow at 15.20 in 40 seconds. 
Together on the screen is the first and second place cars in Pro-Am, but they'll have 15 or so seconds between them. 30 seconds to remove full course yellow. And in LMP3, Gillian Henrion has been controlling the pace to remove full very course nicely yellow. indeed. Again, it's about 15, maybe 20 seconds that separate Henrion from Espirito Santo. We will Santo. be removing full course yellow in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow removed, full course yellow removed. Nine minutes, 40 seconds to go of this year's four hours of Barcelona. And we'll go back to the splits that we saw roughly earlier before, as now LMP2s will try and go both both sides of the 60 Proton competition Porsche of Julian Anlauer. That is chasing Alex Ling, by the way, making his way through quite a lot of traffic. That's not going to help him, but Ben Hanley is closing here. That is Ben at the back of this group, and he's half that gap. It's 6.7 seconds. He's done well out of this. And Alex Lynn has not. He's got a rear gunner in the shape of the team's Pro-Am car. That car currently in the hands of Alex Quinn. But uh, Ben Hanley is on an absolute charge here. Yeah, 6.7 seconds, great exit out it's of the full course that. yellow. It's going to be less than that, he's made further time here, I think. Waiting for his split second. 5.9. 5.9, a further virtually second then taken away by the Mancunian. So Alex Lynn won't be feeling the pressure necessarily, and it depends how much Algarve Pro Racing want to actually tell him about how close that car's getting. He'll have his teammate car immediately behind, which is the Pro-Am entry. It's the technical flag, the black and orange meatball flag for car 12, with the missing bodywork at the rear. We saw being recovered, so that car will have to pit. Oscar Tunio driving for Wockenspiegel, Team Monschau. That's probably because the car's not due to pit again, and normally the rule is if you're missing one of those rear wedges, get it replaced or refitted during the next pit stop. But if there isn't one, it needs to be solved before the chequered flag is shown. Max Lynn not closing the gap to Melty Jakobsen. Under eight minutes to go, it's 10.8 seconds, but the gap behind to Ben Hanley in the battle for second place that's certainly a risk, it's 5.5 seconds now. Get the other class positions. Matthias Besch has closed that gap, you know, to, Mat uh, to Mathieu Vazavier. It's a 12-second gap now for LMP2 Pro-Am and sixth place overall in LMP3. 17 seconds, that gap again has come down. It's coming down sharply in LMP3, getting an Henri on. On something a run, I'll explain that in a moment. Nick Nielsen, meanwhile, is being closed but not quickly enough by David Rigon. In the battle for third, Andrea Calderelli still holds off Julian Anzlauer and David Perel, who are both in line astern behind him. Gillian Henry, and we're looking at him now, by the way. Not only is he on a run this year of potentially three different steps on the ladder in this package, the Valencia Endurance Series two years ago comes here as the reigning champion in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. He won his debut races in both of those series and could make it three in a row here. Yeah. So start start a championship campaign off with a race win. All the signs are pretty good for Julian Henrion at this stage with Team Virage being uh, the team that he has done all his winning with as well. Over the line will go the Frenchman and with an advantage of nearly 17 seconds over Manuel Espirito Santo. Adam Alley's performed well, together with Matthew Richard Bell for Euro International, car number 11. Uh, but uh, they have just slightly faded in this closing stint. They left uh, their last stop later than everybody else, by quirk of just how the safety car fell, I think. But that was a quick one for car number 11, and it ended up rejoining in third spot. It's going to be a late pit stop for Nelson Piquet Jr. Remember, that car was in the wall at turn two and required a full-course yellow to be removed. And here's Nicholas Nielsen for Formula Racing. Uh, not 
a small advantage at all over Davide Rigon's GR Racing car because the car immediately behind in the black and white is laps down. That's the 51 of Ulysses de Pau. Indeed. I should say, by the way, the 27 Nielsen Racing car has rejoined the race. We saw that car in the garage after Will Stevens was forced to have a, a slow lap. Julian Anlau's not giving this up. David Perel's not giving this up. There's still a podium up to up for grabs in LMGT3. Another LMP2 car gets involved in this. Must be very frustrating for LMP, LMGT3 drivers with so many uh, P2 cars to contend with here. You get a run and all of a sudden, there's another. There's yeah. another. There's another. But yeah. Julian... Um, well, racing here in LMGT3, races, raced in the Asia Le Mans series in an LMP2 car, races in a hypercar in the FI World Endurance Championship. There's Ben Hanley, and it's just, what, three cars behind now? It's three seconds is the gap. So it's three seconds and three cars, the gap between... Between the two Alexes, indeed, and uh, it's Alex Lynn who's just ahead of Alex Quinn, his teammate on the road. Now, have APR said to Alex Quinn, even though you might be slightly faster in this phase of the race, stay there, stay in the wheel tracks of Alex Lynn, because if we've got two cars that Ben Hanley needs to overtake, that's even more difficult well, to do. Alex Quinn is in a battle of his own because he could be on the podium. He's only 1.5 seconds back from Albert Costa Balboa in the 24 Nielsen car. Yeah. So that's another battle very much under, underway. Full course yellow, we are told under the investigation, that's not unusual. So looking out for the Nielsen car it's just of, ahead. Ale, of Albert Costa. It's, it's two cars ahead of this train. You can see it there, the red car going to the inside. So with three and a half minutes to go, there is the Nielsen car just coming out of shots. This is tricky. Switch. Lynn's going to switch. Lynn's going to allow Quinn been, through. I think he has. But that's cost Lynn a bit of time. And you're looking out for the red roof, the red visor. There it is of the number 22 United Order Sports car of Ben Hanley, who can more or less touch both oh. of the, Oh, and with one car going very wide now. Is that Lynn or is that Quinn? It's the Quinn, it's car. Quinn car. So Quinn, having been allowed by Alex Lynn, makes a slight error coming out of turn three. And Ben Hanley's right with Alex Quinn now and surely will try and deposit that car as quickly as possible. It's this is his moment to pounce, two minutes and 40 seconds to go. This is this lap and one more, I think, Johnny. Side by side between the 20, uh, that, uh, that, that is Hanley through. Malta Jakobsen managing this to the end here. He is coming through turn 12 to start what I believe will be his... Will it be his final lap? It won't be, I don't think. I think it's this plus two more. Yeah. Well, that could be very, very important if you're in the seat of Ben Hanley, who got really close to both of the APR cars a moment or two ago. Then Alex, Lynn made, as Alex Quinn made a slight mistake coming out of turn three. It's two more. It's two minutes to go as he crossed the line, so it's two more laps plus this one that these gentlemen are on at the moment. So Melton Jakobsen... Looking comfortable at the moment. Alex Lynn looking anything but. And he's got in between the two the Vector Sport car, Felipe Drugovic. That car and its problems earlier on. Trouble for the 31 car for Racing Spirit for Le Mans. That might decide it. Antoine Ducat off the road. Rear wheel still, though, on the asphalt. So if he can find a forward gear and might, he might be able to get out of that situation on his own, but it's happened at Turn 4, which is exactly where the cars are going through now for second and third positions. But it is way out, away from the racing line. That's now separated by just one car length, it seemed, at Turn 5. Alex Lynn versus Ben Hanley for second and third. Well, there's a gap now that should allow the races for the one car to rejoin, should it be able to do so. All of a sudden, the bite seems to have gone from Ben Hanley's attack here. He's not managed to pass the Vector Sport car. And he's got traffic. Meantime, Melty Jakobsen coming through turn 13 to finish his penultimate lap. Still Ben Hanley looking for a way through. 
The problem is that the Vector Sport now car is also it. trying to get through traffic. I'm not sure, all, well, he's stuck on the outside line. How much is Drogovic going to pressurise Hanley? He's realising he's lapsed down. There's the GT3, the Yanam GT3 race leader, Nicholas Nielsen, next to get by. And this is called as the final lap for Malta Jakobsen, who, unbeknownst to him, uh, he be, must be wondering where on earth everybody else has disappeared to, because <laughs> they're 15 seconds behind him now. But all this has kicked off for second place between Alex Lynn and Ben Hanley. And now, finally, Ben has got clear line of sight. The distance may just be a little too great, though. G23, and GT3, podium still not confirmed yet, still tense. 31 car, by the way, has got away at turn four, so the yellows have gone, so it will be a full green lap to finish this race. Mathieu Vaxavier back to Matthias Besch, first and second in Pro-Am. That's about 18 seconds. It was looking a bit lively between Albert Costa and Alex Quinn not too long ago, but Quinn, with his error, with a couple of laps to go, has kind of decided the bottom step of the podium in LMP2 Pro-Am. Only going to be eight seconds between LMP3 first and second, so that's come significantly down. I think he's managed that. Maybe. Right. Chilean Henri on. Yeah. A lot of traffic to deal with, and also the quicker cars wanting to get by. But here are cool racing. They've taken victory in LMP2 Pro Am before, but never as an outright LMP2 victory. And it's certainly thanks to the closing driver, who is Malta Jakobsen. We've known this kid is a star for so many years already. And Cool Racing take the opening win of the season for the European Le Mans series for Malta Jakobsen, Ritoma Miata and Lorenzo Fluxa. Very close for second and third, but it will in the end go the way of Algarve Pro Racing as Alex Lynn hangs on. Also home was the winning car there, of course, of rising the world tracks of Malta Jakobsen. Mathieu Vazavier brings it home. Alessio Rivera and Francois Perodo. Richard Mille by TDS on the podium on their return to the European Le Mans Series. Matthias Besch brings home the 29 car, and that podium will be completed by Nielsen Racing. Albert Costa Balboa will bring the 24 car home, waiting for LMP3 to race to be completed. It is Formula Racing that take the win, though. Father and son. Uh, Conrad and Johnny Larson, the other way round rather, and Nicholas Nielsen, the head of the Jar Racing squad, Ricardo Perra, Mike Wainwright, David Regon brings it home, but who is going to be the final podium setter? It's right to the end of this race, Johnny. It's the Virage car ahead of the, the battle for the final podium position on GT3. Yeah, so, so close, but as they go across the line, Julian Henri will take the win away from Manuel Espirito Santo, Adam Ali and uh, Gael Julien will complete the podium, but a terrific drive from Julien Omrion. I was slightly concerned that something like a 15, 16 second gap had been sliced to 50% of that, but yes, you'll shout that Julien Omrion had been given the indication that he could just rein things back a little bit. And car number eight takes victory to really put Virage on the board in the early stages of 2024. Well done to Bernardo Pinheiro, who's done the double step in the winter period. There is Bernardo, big grin on his face, moving up from the Ligier European Series to the big show. And Julien Gerby, who won the title in Michelin Le Mans Cup with Henri on last year, was the initial driver in that car. That's our LMP2 Pro-Am winners. There is Francois Perogo celebrating that win. And there are LMGT3 winners, the first winners in LMGT3 in the European Le Mans Series Formula Racing and a team back to the top step of the podium for the first time since 2015, a year when they took the overall championship in GTE. And Nicholas Nielsen will be correctly delighted with that. And that was in a Ferrari 458 in 2015, so a fair bit of time. Um, Ten seasons on, Formula Racing become winners again in the new LM GT3 category. And the celebrations can now begin down at Team Virage. I get the feeling that might have been the eight, number eight engineer. I think so. Great stuff from them. called the strategy throughout. It's, it's a team that's just grown in ability and confidence over the last few seasons, Johnny, and they're winning at will now. Excellent effort, and all about the timing of the mandatory stops, those one hour and uh, one minute and 45 second stops that must be done, two of them. Now, the 37 car 
crossing the line again, under instruction presumably to do that. And think, parking yeah. up... Are they parking up on the main straight? No, they're going to go to the end of the pit lane and then down pit road in the wrong direction. An extra chance for Malta Jakobsen to pick up, pick up even more dirt and grime to make sure he passes the ride height check. And he'll need a couple of marshals to push him backwards so that he gets the full turning circle yeah, into pit stuff, lane. Cracking stuff. A great way to win their first LMS overall win. Completes the set with LMP2 Pro Am wins and a WC win in the first season. Francois Perodo high fiving his AF Corsa mechanics and engineers after that car with the silver mirrored effect took victory in LMP2 Pro Am. It was a fairly close run thing, only an 18 second winning margin in the end after four hours of stern competition. And the reshed meal by TDS Racing Car was hunting it down with Matthias Besch at the wheel, but there wasn't a great deal between Macho Baxavier and Besch, the chaser. Great to see the grandstand still very full, and I'm sure they're going to enjoy the podium ceremonies as they did yesterday for the Michelin Le Mans Cup. But this is our race winning car, the 37 from Cool Racing. Great stuff. So it's Jakobsen and the Cool Racing crew, together with Lorenzo Flutza and Malta and uh, Ritoma Miata, who become the first winners this year in the European Le Mans series. They'll be joined very shortly by the 83 car. There's the Formula Racing Ferrari. Um, to give you the full line-up there, Johnny and Conrad Lawson with Nicholas Nielsen closing things out. That's just something. That's, uh, two of these three young men in this car, already with a foot in the hypercar. Ladder. Miata with Toyota Gazoo Racing, Milton Jakobsen with Peugeot. Milton Fluxer undoubtedly would like to follow them. And the same in LMP2 Pro Am. Messi Rivera, a Ferrari factory driver, Mathieu Vazavier, a factory driver for Alpine, and he's the man that makes it all happen. Francois Perodo. So many titles now in P2 and in GT cars. And so many titles to Johnny Palmer for Team Virage. Mm. Could this be the first step towards yet another? Give him on real that is. And he'll be correctly delighted with that. Well, they have a strong lineup in LMP2 Pro Am this year too. I was very impressed with Tony Wells' qualifying effort yesterday. He do well. Unfortunately, they don't quite have the race results. In fact, that car retiring in the end after Nelson Piquet Jr.'s spin, or he was nerfed into a spin more accurately down at turn two. But they'll come back fighting with their bigger prototype, the 19, at the next race. The eight is definitely a challenger and, in LMP3. And the eight doing it the way that this is intended to happen. It's a, it's stepping up that ladder all three of those drivers have driven at the other levels of the LMS ladder yeah we can all can hear the appreciation from the grandstand great to hear that so Johnny Lewis in there the silver hair the back David Regon fellow Danes as well saying congratulations to Malta Jakobsen so very happy indeed that uh, another Danish driver can win as long as they're not in the, your class. And that's uh, precisely what's happened. LMGT3 versus late, LMP2. Late night tonight, the press room from our friend and colleague, Jens Jensen. Well, that's why about. he makes, he travels the distance and makes he the does. effort. I think he had a feeling that uh, Denmark would do rather well this weekend. They were victorious. High class racing took the victory yesterday in the Michelin Le Mans Cup with Jens Moller. And uh, this time, even more Danish national anthems we will be hearing. Well, not necessarily for cool racing, they're uh, Swiss, but uh, you know, there is a Danish flag represented on the belt buckle of Malta Jakobsen, and we will hear it for Formula Racing. Most certainly. So, standing ovation in the main grandstand opposite the pit lane, which is receiving quite a lot of work, the tower, 
that uh, is what four stories high that's been stripped entirely back and is being readied for the Grand Prix later on in the year lots of structures emerging including this new uh, home for the press room 139 laps completed then at the first race of the season for cool racing who are winners from Algarve Pro Racing by 16 seconds it's the combination of Matthias Kaiser Ollie Caldwell and Alex Lynn who just miss out on the race win from the number 22 United Autosports car Edex Sport finished fourth ahead of Panis Racing an LMP2 Pro-Am won by AF Corsa Matcha Vaxavier in the 83 car along with Alessio Rivera and with Francois Perodo. LMGT3 won by Formula Racing, but we need to hear from our winners today, now chatting to Steph. And I am here with the winners of the four hours of Barcelona, the drivers of the number 37 Cool Racing. Huge congratulations. I know, Lorenzo, we've already spoken to you. Uh, Ritomo, we'll talk to you first. Um, how was your stint? Uh, how was the car feeling underneath you? Um, actually, my stint's really tough, but um, I, I managed the uh, car, tire, freeway, and uh, also the strategy really good and yeah th this race the first race in europe for me and yeah debut race winning race really thank you so much team and it's good teammates thank you and martha let's move on to you because uh, that was a very difficult stint for you as well to close out the race um, but that is cool racing's very first win in the lmp2 category and you were the one who brought it home yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much. And thanks to my two fantastic teammates, Rituma and Lorenzo. Uh, first race together and first win. Um, but yeah, it's definitely true. It was super tricky out there. And as everybody knows, the tire deck here in Barcelona is unbelievable. Um, but it's what makes it difficult as a driver as well and challenging. And then it's even more fun when it pays off. But yeah, the team did an amazing job as well with the strategy. And then obviously the start from Lorenzo as well, jumping from P5 to P2, definitely kicked off the race. And then we just have to finish it off. So thank you very much, everybody. All right, enjoy the celebrations. Thanks, guys. Thank you. He really he not only drives fast, he? he can just talk so fluently as well. Mata Jakobsen's pretty much got it all, it seems. And he sealed that win for Cool. We got underway just after 11.30 this morning then for the fifth. Uh, four hours of Barcelona in the history of the European Le Mans series and a very good getaway initially from the number 22 United Autosports car in the dark blue and red colours for Philippe Ugrant. Despite the best efforts from those around him on the grid, Paul Lafargue in the 28, Matthias Kaiser, who did, was able to gain a position for Algarve Pro Racing. Alejandro Garcia wasn't far away either as Jim Maguire watched on, but he was very happy with his man's initial getaway. But then, unfortunately, further back down the order, there was a spin for James Dacent. Maybe the merest of glances coming through the left-hander at turn two but either way it left the Canadian on the curbing and needing to rejoin we had a full course yellow and coming out of that a cracking getaway from Lorenzo Fluxer who is a, an entertaining and very talented young man from Mallorca and he got the better of Philip Ugran at the restart slithering his way down the inside and into the first corner. Superb racing, as we always expect from the various GT categories through the years. GTE replaced by LMGT3, but uh, no end to the fireworks, thankfully. The Iron Dames Porsche starting well, the car guy Ferrari losing not one but two of its door mirrors. And a hip and shoulder barge there from the 85 to retake the race lead. Jean-Baptiste Simonau spinning and revving like crazy to get the Duquesne car back into the motor race after a slight misjudgment at turn 12. There was also superb fighting in amongst the LMP3 field, including with the number four DKR engineering car. Right over the kerbs there went Euro International's example, number 11, although brilliantly driven by Matthew Richard Bell from eighth place up to the class lead at one point. Stuart Cox very happy indeed with an overtake there from his man Ollie Caldwell charging his way up the order fresh from a pit stop and taking the car over. Also side by side here for the number 31 car that would briefly lose it on the brakes but just about gathered the moment up. And Manuel Espirito Santo watching on, he would be getting on board the number 17 car at a later point. This was a clumsy moment for, between Laurence Hoare and Nelson Piquet Jr. that would leave the former Formula One star in the gravel and the barrier for Team Virage and the number 19 car would need to be towed out of there under another full course yellow. 
And then the chase between the 37 Cool Racing Car and the Algarve Pro Racing number 25 of Malte Jakobsen and Alex Lynn. This was a heartbreaking moment for the Iron Dames, who had been absolutely in charge of that race up until that point. And Michelle Gatting trying to work out precisely which component had broken on the 85 car. But that was her first moment to take the car over, literally getting metres the other side of the white line at the end of pit road. The win, though, for the first time in the top class in LMP2 would go to Cool Racing. This is what it meant to the team. Lorenzo Flux are there together with teammates, of course, Malta Jakobsen and Ritoma Miata. And at the first time in something like 10 years, Formula Racing win again in the European Le Mans series with their new Ferrari 296. It's victory in LMP2 Pro-Am for AF Corsa and in LMP3 for Team Virage as Bernardo Pinheiro and Gillian Henrion's stamp on the ACA Rules Racing continues at pace. So here's the podium, first of all, overall to the third step for United Autosports in the 22 car. Philip Ugran, Marino Sato and Ben Hanley. Second place to car number 25 from Matthias Kaiser, Oli Caldwell and Alex Lynn. But the win for the first time overall for Cool Racing goes to Malta Jakobsen, who completed the race with a couple of excellent stints, Rotoma Miata and Lorenzo Fluxer, who began things four hours ago. Yeah, three or four teams were in for the win at various points there, Johnny, but at the end it was a control run by the Cool Racing squad and Malta Jakobsen that brought it home. Great run towards them from Alex Lynn. Great uh, run towards him from Alex Lynn, nearly paid off, and then Ben Hanley at the end also in with a chance of getting second place. So we've got the reigning champions on the left-hand side, previous champions to that on the far right-hand side. And could we have some future champions uh, on the top step of this podium? Certainly teams with terrific form in the past, and the trophies now presented. It's uh, Team USA from the America's Cup. Takes place down the road in Barcelona. American Magic team. Well, initial trophies being presented to an, uh, an American Anglo outfit, of course, in United Autosports. And on the entry list for this event, flagged as British, but on occasion we do see them with the USA flag as well. New York Yachting Club. American magic effort for the America's Cl uh, Cup. The team representative. A bit of crossing of sporting codes. Yeah. One of the uh, champagne bottles went off early there. But great to hear the response from the stands. And now a chance to properly crack open the champagne. The uh, bottles remained away from the podium for yesterday's Michelin Le Mans Cup race in honour and to remember the life of uh, a gentleman we sadly lost earlier on in the week, uh, Gerhard Freundorfer of Huber Motorsport in an accident in the paddock. And uh, ever since then, the paddock has been certainly very much in sombre mood, offering uh, a moment of reflection and perspective, but uh, nice after a very warm day. This is what he would, would have wanted, of course, for us to go motor racing on Sunday and for the champagne to spray as usual. 25 points going the way of Cool Racing to kick things off then from Algarve Pro Racing with their 25 car on 18 and 16 points. That's the reason why they had extra point for the pole position uh, for United Autosports, number 22. So an extra point for Ben Hanley, Philip Ugran and Marino Sato. But uh, so many more points on offer for Lorenzo Flukza, Malta Jakobsen and Rima Mattia as we move to another class now. Now I am joined by the winners of LMP2 Pro. I'm the number 83 AF Corsa. Reigning champions. Francois, let's start with you. Uh, fantastic start and a good, a good 
kick off to your defending championship campaign? Yeah, it couldn't have been better. It was a, it was a tough week, the, especially for me. The, the prologue was not so easy, but uh, I managed to stay with the, the top cars at the start and then I uh, got a drive through. But uh, yeah, these things happen. So I think this one is definitely credit to the two boys, particularly Alessio, who had an incredible middle stint. Very happy. And Matt, how was uh, your stint there? How, uh, how difficult was it, especially in the heat? You know, it's really difficult here in Barcelona with the high tide deck. Um, yeah, I was just spectator, spectator of the race, watching the race, easy. The boys give me like uh, the car in front. Uh, I would like really to thank the team as well because I think during all the winter and uh, all this long week, uh, we work pretty well in the car. And uh, in the pit stop, we, we win so much time and we overtook cars. So, and the car was just a, a dream to drive. So yeah, we really enjoy and uh, massive thanks uh, to these two boys as well. I just need to deliver at the end. So yeah, it was an easy race for me, I would say. And Alessio, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, how are you finding the car to drive, you know, with the extra power? Is it different to last year? And uh, any final thoughts to add to what your teammates have said? Yeah, it's a lot of fun to drive, especially when the car is, uh, is working like this. Uh, we did a lot of work during the winter uh, to find the right setup. And I think uh, today we showed because uh, the pace was really nice. And uh, we hope to, to be the same for the car. All right, enjoy the celebration. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Very happy with their afternoon's work and uh, Mathieu Vaxavier actually saying, well, I had the easy job, just took the car over because the other boys had done all the heavy lifting for me. It's the um, GT3 teams coming to the podium first. It's 63 car from Iron Links. Coming to the podium is uh, Roshi Hamaguchi, Axel Jeffries and Andrea Calderelli. A very happy Mike Wainwright will take his number 86 GR racing for our recruit. Mike Wainwright with Ricardo Perra and David Rigon. We finished that race, but it's going to be a win for Formula Racing from Denmark. The all Danish crew as well, Nicholas Nielsen, the factory driver, father Johnny Larson and son Conrad Larson in the number 50 car, the, uh, the burgundy coloured car, I think we'd call that, uh, that particular shade. And as those three gentlemen in very smart Formula Racing racing overalls together with their engineer head to the top step it will be the national anthem of Denmark that we hear for the first time for Formula Racing at least for the best part of 10 years but just shows different Ferraris from different eras but they've got managed to get the 296 to victory And without the difficulties, major problems for Iron Dames, it was going to be interesting to see precisely who might have been able to take the race to them because oh, yeah. at every point they seem to be just that extra yard ahead of all their competition. Well, about to say, I mean, we, we can't leave this podium without mentioning that they were runaway leaders and the dramas as Michelle Gatting tried to rejoin the race rather robbed them of that result, but that takes nothing away from the nine drivers the three teams that did make this podium and, uh, two ferraris and lamborghini eventually make it there it's uh, porsche right in there in fourth just tenths of seconds behind wilson will be back racing next weekend and here's ferrari 499p for the factory ferrari team Ferrari's these two different races, there's been a chance he might come away to the team's home race with a win. I to think so, I'm sure. So yet more Danish success in sports car racing. Great to see. And as the fireworks are unleashed from the Barcelona podium, big grins from all three drivers and their engineer as well but useful points being stacked up by GR Racing who are not a familiar name in the European Le Mans series making the move 
uh, into this type of European-based racing as well. With a new car, of course, similar paint scheme that we've seen for many seasons in the World Endurance Championship, but they could be a strong entity too. Well, they didn't have a place available for them to stay in the WC. That's what Mike Rainwright would have liked to have seen. This is the point situation, Formula Racing from Denmark with 25-18 to GR Racing, 15 for Iron Lynx, their 63 car and the 60 Porsche from Proton with 12s. And the three Danes with 25 points, Davide Regan, Mike Wainwright, Ricardo Perra, uh, second in the points. So we're going down now to have a chat oh, yeah. with one of the winning drivers from the number 50 car, Conrad Larsen. I'm joined by Conrad Larsen, winner in LMGT3, driver of the number 50 oh, yeah. Formula Racing. Huge congratulations. This is Formula Racing's first victory since 2015. How excited are you that you could bring it home for them? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, it was a great experience. So uh, we had a lot of close calls uh, to a win last year, uh, but we never made it happen. So it's uh, very nice to make it happen now. And what are your expectations going into the rest of the season? You think you can keep this up? I hope so. Uh, if, if we have a good car, uh, very, very quick um, bronze and uh, gold, and I, you know, high hang in. Um, so yeah, I, I believe we have a chance. Perfect. Enjoy the celebration for the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think they've got slightly more than that, actually, because uh, if they can work the strategy and uh, utilize their driving lineup, which is very strong throughout, and they can certainly threaten the Iron Dames and others that would start it as the pre-season favorites. As we wait for the other podiums here, Johnny, worth reflecting, uh, Steph quite right, of course, defending champions in MP2 Pearl Am, uh, AF Corsa, but they beat the co-racing guys to that title by effectively 0.6 of a second and look at what we've got now that team stepping up these are the points for the gt3 drivers trophy as i say it was the uh, the, the the crew for the 50 car and here is the pro-am drivers trophy points 83 oreca trio rivera perodo fazivier out of gregoire sosi what a great start he's had to his lmp2 career matthias besh rodrigo salas alberto costa balboa colin noble and Tony Wells uh, finishing the podium there. And so AF Corsa from Richard Mill by TDS, Nielsen Racing, then the 20 mile guard pro, Proton Competition, DKR, and United Auto Sports number 21 car. And in fact, there are Albert Costa, Colin Noble, and John Falb ready to be called onto the podium as the third step and the uh, third place finishes in LMP2 Pro Am. Did I say Tony Wells? I did, didn't I? I do apologise. That's a hangover from last time. That really is. That's uh, that's that's muscle memory from, uh, from the name of Colin, uh, Colin Noble. But uh, great stuff from them. They make the third step of the podium. They'll be delighted with that. Colin had told me earlier on in the week that he, he keeps calling John Fowl Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not you, is it? Yeah, I'm joking. Uh, here we go here in the Nielsen top three then. John Fowl from somewhere in America. I think you're right that he lives in Las Vegas these days. And so he is joined by Scotsman Colin Noble and very much Spaniard Albert Costa. So at his home race, he's managed a third place finish. Second position for Richard Mille by TDS. Matthias Besch bringing the number 29 car home on second position. Rodrigo Salas and Regoire Sose of Switzerland. Uh, it's another goal to join uh, fellow Swiss Matthias Besch there. And it is a win. And could this spark yet another championship charge for AF Corsa, for Francois Perodo, Alessia Rivera, and Mathieu Vaxivier? We heard from all three drivers a moment or two ago with Steph Wentworth and it's high fives all round for the 83 crew then of AF Corsa. The guy in the red is their engineer or certainly a representative from the prototype arm of AF Corsa this weekend and we'll hear the national anthem of France. Absolutely killing himself next to me. 
the French tricolour that sits beneath the chin of Francois Perodo and of Matteo Vaxavier was rather influencing me there because they, of course, have always been Italian, uh, but they have a strong French uh, influence, shall we say. Um, but from Goodyear, but uh, who's that? Sorry, that's Mike McGregor. Thank you. I didn't hear. I didn't hear his name, and uh, nor did everybody else watching. So I just wanted to make sure that the name check had been clearly mentioned. So it was indeed the Italian national anthem. Yes. Heard there, Johnny. And, um, Where are they, of course, from again? They're from Italy, Johnny. Where do we go next in the championship? France. No, oh, that doesn't fit. But next weekend you'll be going to Italy for the World Endurance Championship, where a lot of Italian A, of course, cars will be. They will indeed. Delight there from the, of course, team. They start their defence, title defence in fine form. Delight from uh, the. Almost always smiling, Alessio Rivera, Francois Perodo, yeah, Matteo Vazavier. The champagne will begin. This uh, bodes well for quite a cracking championship in all the B2 for our as well. Dial out a couple of teams that had early problems, not always of their own making. We've got quite a season to come here. 19 of the 22 LMP2 starters finished in the top 19 positions here. All the ones that didn't get pretty major troubles. So, uh, great way to start, but I don't think they're going to get it all their own way somehow. Here are the GT3 team's trophy points, and as we know, by seven, Formula Racing lead it over GR Racing with Iron Lynx's Lamborghini in third. Conrad Lawson, Johnny Lawson, Nick Nielsen will leave Barcelona with a seven-point advantage over Davide Rigon, Mike Wainwright and Ricardo Perra. Mike Wainwright with a French tricolour next to his name, I notice, on that Might graphic as well. well be his licence. Well, also, um, the other thing I noticed was Alessio Rivera had a French flag underneath his race suit, so that's just the influence of the other two drivers, I think, in the AF Corsa car. He probably just wanted to hear the anthem. I did, and uh, my request was denied firmly. Here's Team Virage winning at the moment the championship, but by a narrower margin because of Cool Racing's pole position yesterday. So they finish second, they get an extra point from the pole, and therefore trail by only six to the Polish outfit Team Virage. Cool Racing having taken the title last year. Bernardo Pinheiro, Julien Omrion, Julien Gerby will be the championship leaders heading for Le Castellet in three weeks' time over Cedric Ultramar, Manuel Espirito Santo and Miguel Cristival, the Swiss-Portuguese driving combination. And important points for Adam Alley and Matthew Richard Bell, I feel, in third position. They had a strong car this weekend from Euro International. So we've caught up with virtually all of the classes, but one remain, LMP3. Let's go to Steph. I am joined by Gillian Henrion, winner in LMP3 for Team Virage, and he is also alongside the Michelin man. Uh, a huge congratulations to you, and let me tell you, you've won in your debut in the uh, Ligier European Series, you won on your debut in Michelin Le Mans Cup, and now on your debut in ELMS. It must feel good. Thank you, first of all. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can see now the best school is Ligier European Series to debut. I mean, we are winning the Ligier European Series, we are winning the Le Mans Cup, and today we are winning the first race of uh, ELMS. So, yeah, uh, I am super proud. We, we work a lot with the team, so, yeah, I am super happy. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Still only 21 years old from Nancy in France and uh, could be en route to a triple champion in three separate years. Started in the right possible vein, anyway. A tribute, isn't it, to the manager that Nietzsche in particular put in place here. And he's going to be the your international team to come to the podium first. And the 11 crew, just two drivers strong. It is Adam Ali from Canada and uh, Matthew Richard Bell from United Kingdom. And then we'll see the cool racing trio from the number 17. This is the defending championship winning team from last year, Miguel Cristava, Cedric Ocramar, and uh, Manuel Espirito Santo. But it will be this trio that take the top step, Johnny, and the cracking race they had, Julian Gerby, Bernardo Pinheiro, and we heard earlier from.
uh, uh, fascinating sort of history uh, led by Julien Gerbi of Spain and Algeria. The cars, I think, belong in Valencia, but uh, they are a Polish team by the entry list. Let's hear the national anthem of definitely Poland. Could this be the start of something very special indeed for Team Virage? With their three victorious drivers on the top step of the podium. Michelin caps for the LMP3 category. And the trophy presentation about to take place. Back on Bads, by the way, in respect of our best colleague, in the accident Johnny was describing earlier. Week in the paddock, in respect of that, but uh, this is an altogether happier event. What racing is about competing and winning. Champagne ready to be sprayed in just a moment, but uh, with thanks to Michelin, these trophies now, the final few of them being presented expertly well and it's still in front of a big crowd opposite in that giant grand strand and the evening or early evening sun beating down a much deserved slur of champers about to be cracked open because some of those more lengthy stints will have been very warm work indeed in fact we had a couple of messages on the screen to suggest that cockpit temperature was rather too high on uh, one or two of the lmp2 cars so tough work you have to be a real athlete often that question mark is uh, asked by those outside of motor racing is it proper sport well, of course it is after you've been at the uh, command of one of these cars for well over an hour in these ambient temperatures so that is just about it for the first round of the four hours of barcelona we've got five more races to look forward to later on in the year and with thanks to Steph Wentworth in Pit Road for all her efforts over the last two and a bit days with the Michelin Le Mans Cup and of course two cracking races from the Ligier European Series as well. Uh, that is hopefully a mere taster of what is to come. And we've talked about the massive amounts of LMP2 cars, 22 of them across two different categories. But LMP3 is also going to be phenomenally strong. And the LMGT3s, we have welcomed time in the European Championship to the ELMS and it's going to be a big guess as to which will